Introduction of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen O'Neill. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. Introduction. The history of Lucy, Emily, and Henry Fairchild was begun in 1818, nearly a century ago. The two little misses and their brother played and did lessons, were naughty and good, happy and sorrowful, when George the Third was still on the throne, when gentlemen wore blue coats with brass buttons, knee breeches, and woollen stockings, and ladies were attired in short waists, low necks, and long ringlets. The Battle of Waterloo was quite a recent event, and the terror of Bowley was still used by nursery maids to frighten their charges into good behaviour. Perhaps some of those who take up this book and glance at its title page are saying to themselves, We have plenty of stories about the children of today, the children of the twentieth century, not of the early nineteenth. How should it interest us to read of these little ones at the time of our great grandparents, whose lives were so dull and ideas so old fashioned, who never played cricket or tennis or went to London or to the seaside? or rode bicycles, or did any of the things we do. To anyone who is debating whether or no you will read the Fairchild family, I would say, try a chapter or two before you make up your mind. It is not what people do, but what they are that makes them interesting. True enough, Lucy, Emily, and Henry led what we should call nowadays very dull lives, but they were by no means dull little people for all that. We shall find them very living and real when we make acquaintance with them. They tore their clothes, and lost their pets, and wanted the best things, and slapped each other when they disagreed. They had their good times and their bad times, their fun and frolic and their scrapes and naughtiness, just as children had long before they were born and are having now, long, long after they are dead. In fact, as we get to know them, and I hope to love them, we shall realise, perhaps with wonder, how very like they are to the children of today. If they took us by the hand and led us to their playroom, or into Henry's arbour under the great trees, we should make friends with them in five minutes, even though they wear long straight skirts down to their ankles and straw bonnets burying their little faces, and Henry is attired in a frock and pinafore, albeit he is eight years old. We should have glorious games with them, following the fleet Lucy running like a hare. We should kiss them when we went away and reckon them ever after among our friends. And so, as we follow the history of the Fairchild family, we shall understand, better than we have yet done, how children are children everywhere, and very much the same from generation to generation. Knowing Lucy and Emily and Henry will help us to feel more sympathy with other children of bygone days, the children of our history books, with pretty Princess Amelia and the little Dauphin in the Bastille, with sweet Elizabeth Stuart, the rosebud born in snow of Carisbrook Castle, and a host of others. They were real children, too, who had real treats and real punishments, real happy days and sad ones. They felt and thought and liked and disliked much the same things as we do now, we stretch out our hands to them across the misty centuries and hail them our companions and playmates few people nowadays even among those who know the fairchild family know anything of its writer mrs sherwood yet her life as told by herself is as amusing as a story and as full of incidents as a life could well be when she was a very old woman she wrote her autobiography helped by her daughter and from this book which has long been out of print i will put together a short sketch which will give you some idea of what an interesting and attractive person she was the father of mrs sherwood or to give her her maiden name mary butt was a clergyman he had a beautiful country living called stanford in worcestershire not far from malvern where mary was born on may the sixth seventeen seventy five she had one brother a year older than herself and a sister several years younger whose name was lucy Mary Butt's childhood, in her beautiful country home, was very happy. She was extremely tall for her age, strong and vigorous, with glowing cheeks and dark eyes, and very long hair of a bright auburn, which she tells us her mother had great pleasure in arranging. She and her brother Martin were both beautiful children, but no one thought Mary at all clever, or fancied what a mark she would make in the world by her writings. Mary was a dreamy, thoughtful child, full of fancies and imaginings. She loved to sit on the stairs, listening to her mother's voice singing sweetly in her dressing room to her guitar. She had wonderful fancies about an echo which the children discovered in the hilly grounds round the rectory. Echo, she believed, to be a beautiful winged boy, and I longed to see him, though I knew it was in vain to attempt to pursue him to his haunts. Neither was Echo the only unseen being who filled my imagination. Her mother used to tell her and Martin stories in the dusk of winter evenings. One of those stories she tells again for other children in the Fairchild family. It is the tale of the old lady who was so fond of inviting children to spend a day with her. 
the first grand event of mary's life was a journey taken to lichfield to stay with her grandfather old dr butt at his house called pipe grange she was then not quite four years old dr butt had been a friend in former days of maria edgeworth who wrote the parents assistant and other delightful stories of mr day author of sandford and merton and other clever people then living at lichfield he knew the great actor david garrick too who used to come there to see his brother and the famous dr samuel johnson who had been born and brought up at lichfield but to little mary scarcely more than a baby these things were not of much interest what she recollected of her grandfather was his present to her on her fourth birthday of a doll with a paper hoop and wig of real flax and her memories of pipe grange were of walks with her brother and nurse in green lanes of lovely commons and old farmhouses with walls covered with ivy and yew trees cut in grotesque forms of feeding some little birds in a hedge and coming one day and finding the nest and birds gone which was a great grief to me soon afterwards the nursery party at stamford was increased by two little cousins henry and margaret sherwood they had lost their mother and were sent to be for a time under the care of their aunt mrs butt they joined in the romps of martin and mary and very lively romps they seemed to have been mary describes how her brother used to put her in a drawer and kick it down the nursery stairs how he heaped chairs and tables one on the other set her at the top of them and then threw them all down how he put a bridle round her neck and drove her about with a whip but she says being a very hardy child and not easily hurt i suppose i have myself to blame for some of his excesses for with all this he was the kindest of brothers to me and i loved him very very much when mary was six years old she began to make stories but she tells us she had not the least recollection of what they were about she was not yet able to write so whenever she had thought out a story she had to follow her mother about with a slate and pencil and get her to write at her dictation the talk mary and martin heard while sitting at meals with their parents was clever and interesting many visitors came to the house and after a while there were several young men living there pupils of mr butt so that there was often a large party the two little children were never allowed to interrupt but had to sit and listen whether willing or not and in this way the shrewd and observant mary picked up endless scraps of knowledge while still very young she tells us a good deal about her education in these early days it was the fashion then for children to wear iron collars around the neck with a blackboard strapped over the shoulders to one of these i was subjected from my sixth to my thirteenth year it was put on in the morning and seldom taken off till late in the evening and i generally did all my lessons standing in stocks with this stiff collar round my neck at the same time i had the plainest possible food such as dry bread and cold milk i never sat on a chair in my mother's presence yet i was a very happy child and when relieved from my collar i not unseldom manifested my delight by starting from our hall door and taking a run for at least half a mile through the woods which adjoined our pleasure grounds martin meanwhile was having a much less strict and severe time of it mr butt was an easy-going man who liked everything about him to be comfortable and pretty and was not inclined to take much trouble either with himself or others while mary was with her mother in her dressing-room working away at her books martin was supposed to be learning latin in his father's study but as mr butt had no idea of authority martin made no progress whatever and the end of it was that good mrs butt had to teach herself latin in order to become her boy's tutor and mary was made to take it up as well in order to incite him to learn the children were great readers though their books were few robinson crusoe two sets of fairy tales the little female academy and aesop's fables made up their whole library robinson crusoe was martin's favourite book his wont when a reading fit was on was to place himself on the bottom step of the stairs and to mount one step every time he turned over a page mary of course copied him exactly another funny costume with the pair was on the first day of every month to take two sticks with certain notches cut in them and hide them in a hollow tree in the woods there was a grand mystery about this though mary does not tell us in what it consisted no person she says was to see us do this and no one was to know we did it in the summer that mary was eight years old a quaint visitor came to stanford rectory this was a distant relative who had married a frenchman and lived at paris through the gay and wicked period which ushered in the french revolution mary's description of this lady and her coming to the rectory is very amusing never shall i forget the arrival of madame de peleve at stanford she arrived in a post-chaise with a maid a lapdog a canary bird an organ and boxes heaped upon boxes till it was impossible to see the persons within i was of course at the door to watch her alight she was a large woman elaborately dressed highly rouged carrying an umbrella the first i had seen she was dark i remember and had most brilliant eyes the style of dress at that period was perhaps more preposterous and troublesome than any which has prevailed within the memory of those now living this style had been introduced by the ill-fated marie antoinette and madame de peleve had come straight from the very fountain-head of these absurdities the hair was worn crisped or violently frizzed about the face in the shape of a horseshoe long stiff curls fastened with pins hung on the neck and the whole was well pomatumed and powdered with different coloured powders 
a high cushion was fastened at the top of the hair and over that either a cap adorned with artificial flowers and feathers to such a height as sometimes rendered it somewhat difficult to preserve its equilibrium or a balloon hat a fabric of wire and tiffany of immense circumference the hat would require to be fixed on the head with long pins and standing trencher-wise quite flat and unbending in its full proportions the crown was low and like the cap richly set off with feathers and flowers the lower part of the dress consisted of a full petticoat generally flounced short sleeves and a very long train but instead of a hoop there was a vast pad at the bottom of the waist behind and a frame of wire in front to throw out the neckerchief so as much as possible to resemble the craw of a pigeon such were the leading articles of this style of dress and so arranged was the figure which stepped forth from the chaise at the door of the lovely and simple parsonage of stanford my father was ready to hand her out my mother to welcome her the bandboxes were all conveyed into our best bedroom while madame had her place allotted to her in our drawing-room where she sat like a queen and really by the multitudes of anecdotes she had to tell rendered herself very agreeable while she was with us she never had concluded her toilet before one or two in the day and she always appeared either in new dresses or new adjustments i have often wished that i could recall some of the anecdotes she used to tell of the court of versailles but one only can i remember it referred to the then popular song of marlbrook which she used to sing when the dauphin she said was born a nurse was procured for him from the country and there was no song with which she could soothe the babe but marlbrook an old ballad sung till then only in the provinces the poor queen heard the air admired and brought it forward making it the fashion this is the only one of madame de pelevé's stories which i remember although i was very greatly amused by them and could have listened to her for hours together my admiration was also strongly excited by the splendour and varieties of her dresses her superb trimmings her sleeves tied with knots of coloured ribbon her trains of silk her beautiful hats and i could not understand the purpose for which she took so much pains to array herself i think when we read of miss crosby's arrival at mr fairchild's and the time she kept them all waiting for supper while she changed her gown we shall be reminded of these early recollections of mrs sherwood's a year or two later this quaint madame came again on a visit to stanford and on this occasion as mary tells us she put it into the little girl's head for the first time to wonder whether she were pretty or no no sooner was dinner over she says than i ran upstairs to a large mirror to make the important inquiry and at this mirror i stood a long time turning round and examining myself with no small interest madame de pelevé further encouraged her vanity by making her a present of a gauze cap of a very gay description it must have looked odd and out of place perched on the top of the little girl's very long hair and very rosy cheeks another of madame de pelevé's not very judicious presents was a shepherdess hat of pale blue silver tiffany but as this hat had to be fastened on with large long corking pins it proved a terrible evil to its wearer which perhaps was just as well by this time dear brother martin had been sent away to school at reading but little lucy was growing old enough to be something of a playmate and margaret the motherless cousin had been brought again to stanford on a long visit we can fancy what a delightful companion to these two small ones mary must have been she had left off for the time writing stories but she was never tired of telling them in company she was in those days very silent and shy and much at a loss for words but they never failed her when telling her stories to her little companions her head she says was full of fairies wizards enchanters and all the imagery of heathen gods and goddesses which i could get out of any book in my father's study and with these she wove the most wonderful tales one story often going on at every possible interval for months together her lively imagination filled every region of the wild woods at stanford with imaginary people wherever i saw a few ashes in a glade left by those who burnt sticks to sell the ashes to assist in the coarse washings in farmhouses i fixed a horde of gypsies and made long stories if i could discern fairy rings which abounded in those woods they gave me another set of images and i had imaginary hermits in every hollow of the rocky sides of the dingle and imaginary castles on every height whilst the church and churchyard supplied me with more ghosts and apparitions than i dared tell of mary and her stories must have been better worth having than a whole library of fairy books one source from which mary drew her tales was a collection of old volumes which her father had bought at a sale and to which her mother had given up a room over the pantry and storeroom mr butt made mary his librarian and she revelled in old romances such as sir philip sidney's arcadia and in illustrated books of travel spending many hours on a high stool in the book-room among moths dust and black calfskin studying these treasures one more glimpse must be given of those happy child days and we will have it in mary's own words i grew so rapidly in my childhood that at thirteen i had obtained my full height which is considered above the usual standard of women i stooped very much when thus growing as my mother always dressed me like a child in a pinafore i must certainly have been a very extraordinary sort of personage and every one cried out on seeing me as one that was to be a giantess 
as my own little friend of about my own age was small and delicate i was very often thoroughly abashed at my appearance and therefore never was i so happy as when i was out of sight of visitors in my own beloved woods of stamford in those sweet woods i had many little embowered corners which no one knew but myself and there when my daily tasks were done i used to fly with a book and enjoy myself in places where i could hear the cooing of doves the note of the blackbird and the rush of two waterfalls coming from two sides of the valley and meeting within the range where i might stroll undisturbed by any one it must be noticed that i never made these excursions without carrying a huge wooden doll with me which i generally slung with a string round my waist under my pinafore as i was thought by the neighbours too big to like a doll my sister as a child had not good health and therefore she could bear neither the exposure nor fatigue i did hence the reason wherefore i was so much alone from this cause too she was never submitted to the same discipline that i was she was never made so familiar with the stocks and iron collar nor the heavy tasks for after my brother was gone to school i still was carried on in my latin studies and even before i was twelve i was obliged to translate fifty lines of virgil every morning standing in these same stocks with the iron collar pressing on my throat when mary was between twelve and thirteen a great change came in her life her father was presented to the vicarage of kidderminster in staffordshire where the carpets are made it was then a very rich living it was settled that they should go to kidderminster to live while a curate was to do duty at stanford and occupy the rectory in those days clergymen often held two or even three livings at once in different parts of the country taking the stipends themselves and putting a curate in charge of whichever parishes they did not choose to reside in mary was pleased at the idea of a change as children generally are and so was her father who loved society and the noise and bustle of a town but to poor mrs butt who was a very shy timid retiring person the idea of exchanging the glorious groves of stanford for a residence in a town where nothing is seen but dusty houses and dyed worsted hanging to dry on huge frames in every open space was terrible mary could well remember how during that summer her mother walked in the woods crying bitterly and fretting over the coming change till her health suffered life in the big manufacturing town was much less wild and free than it had been in the worcestershire parsonage but the two little girls managed to be very happy in their own way for one thing they had a bedroom looking into the street and a street was a new thing to them and they spent every idle moment in staring out of the windows they had a cupboard in which they kept their treasures a doll's house which they had brought from stanford and all the books they had hoarded up from childhood these with two white cats which we had also brought from stanford happily afforded us much amusement mary's rage for dolls was moreover at its height though she more than ever took pains to hide her darlings under her pinafore from the eyes of kidderminster most of all however they amused themselves when alone by talking together in characters keeping to the same year after year till at length the play was played out we were both queens mary tells us and we were sisters and were supposed to live near each other and we pretended we had a great many children in our narratives we allowed the introduction of fairies and i used to tell long stories of things and places and adventures which i feigned i had met with in this my character of queen the moment we two set out to walk we always began to converse in these characters my sister used generally to begin with well sister how do you do to-day how are the children where have you been and before we were a yard from the house we were deep in talk oh what wonderful tales was i wont to tell of things which i pretended i had seen and how many many happy hours have i and my sister spent in this way i being the chief speaker not long after their coming to kidderminster mary's father took her with him on a visit to a large country house in shropshire they drove all the way in a gig a man-servant riding behind on horseback they reached the house just in time to dress for dinner at which there was to be a large party mary had to put on her very best dress which she tells us was a blue silk slip with a muslin frock over it a blue sash and oh sad to say my silver tiffany hat i did not dare but wear it as it had been sent with me a maid had been told off to dress mary and great was the pains which she took to fix my shepherdess hat on one side as it was intended to be worn and to arrange my hair which was long and hanging in curls but what would i not have given to have got rid of the rustling tiffany mary describes her consternation when she reached the drawing-room in this array and found a number of great people there but no other child to consort with when everybody went to walk in the shrubberies after dinner and a gentleman offered her his arm as was the wont in those days she was so panic-stricken that she darted up a bank threw the shrubs and away and showed herself no more that evening the next thing that happened was that the other little cousin before mentioned henry sherwood came to live with the butts and go to a day-school in the town mary recalls him as she saw him on arriving a very small fair-haired boy dressed in a full suit of what used to be called pepper and salt cloth he soon settled down in his new home a very quiet little personage very good-tempered and very much in awe of his aunt with the fame among his cousins for his talent for making paper boxes one within another his bed was in an attic next door to his big cousin martin's room martin had a shelf full of books which henry used to carry off to his own domain and read over and over again from these books he first dated an intense love of reading which was destined to be his chief standby in old age 
we shall not wonder that mary loved to recall her early remembrances of this little schoolboy when we know that several years later he became her husband with whom she spent a long and happy married life mary has other amusing recollections of this time of her early girlhood and tells them in her own charming way we must pass on to her school life which is bound to interest her readers of to-day so many of whom go to school it was the summer of seventeen ninety mr butt had been taking his turn of duty at the chapel royal st james being by this time one of the chaplains to the king on his way home he stopped at reading to visit his friend dr valpy in whose school martin had for a time been educated during this visit dr valpy took him to see a sort of exhibition got up by the young ladies of monsieur and madame de st quentin's school this famous school which was afterwards removed to london was held then in the old abbey at reading this thought mr butt is the very place for mary and to the abbey school it was decided that she should go martin was now at westminster school when the time came for him to return after the holidays mary had a seat in the chaise and drove with him and her father as far as reading you will be amused by her description of her school and schoolmistresses and of her first introduction to them the house or rather the abbey itself was exceedingly interesting and though i know not its exact history yet i knew every hole and corner of what remained of the ancient building which consisted of a gateway with rooms above and on each side of it a vast staircase of which the balustrades had originally been gilt then too there were many little nooks and round closets and many larger and smaller rooms and passages which appeared to be rather more modern whilst the gateway itself stood without the garden walls upon the forbury or open green which belonged to the town and where dr valpy's boys played after school hours the best part of the house was encompassed by a beautiful old-fashioned garden where the young ladies were allowed to wander under tall trees in hot summer evenings when mary arrived at the abbey the holidays were not quite over and she was the first of the sixty pupils to present herself the school was kept by madame de st quentin and a mrs latournelle who were partners madame as the girls always called her was an englishwoman by birth but had married a french refugee whom circumstances had obliged to become french teacher in the school madame was a handsome woman with bright eyes and a very dignified presence mary tells us that she danced remarkably well played and sang and did fine needlework and spoke well and agreeably in english and in french without fear mrs latournelle was a funny old-fashioned body whose chief concern was with the housekeeping tea-making and other domestic duties she had a cork leg and her dress had never been known to change its fashion her white muslin handkerchief was always pinned with the same number of pins her muslin apron always hung in the same form she always wore the same short sleeves cuffs and ruffles with a breast-bow to answer the bow on her cap both being flat with two notched ends mrs latournelle received mary in a wainscoted parlour hung round with miniatures and pieces of framed needlework done in chenille representing tombs and weeping willows mary was to be what in those days was known as a parlour boarder which meant that she was treated in part as a grown-up young lady had more liberty and privileges than the other girls and in fact was allowed to do very much as she liked she thought herself gloriously happy on coming down to breakfast next day in the twilight of a winter's morning to be allowed to eat hot buttered toast and to draw as near as she liked to the fire neither of which things was it lawful to do at home mary was vastly amused during the first few days at seeing her future schoolfellows arrive one after another the two first to come were a pair of twin sisters named martha and mary lee so exactly alike that they could only be distinguished by a mark which one had on her forehead underneath the hair there were many other big girls but none besides herself who were parlour boarders during that quarter mary soon chose out three to be her special friends a miss poultenham amelia renagle daughter of an artist who in that day was rather celebrated and mary brown niece of mrs latournelle monsieur and madame de st quentin presently returned and mary tells us how shy she felt when monsieur summoned her to undergo a sort of examination full well i remember the morning when he called me into his study to feel the pulse of my intellect as he said in order that he might know in what, what class to place me all the girls whom he particularly instructed were standing by all of them being superior to me in the knowledge of those things usually taught in schools behold me then in imagination tall as i am now standing before my master and blushing till my blushes made me ashamed to look up eh bien mademoiselle he said have you much knowledge of french no sir i answered are you much acquainted with history and he went on from one thing to another asking me questions and always receiving a negative at length smiling he said tell me mademoiselle then what do you know i stammered latin virgil and finished off with a regular flood of tears at this he laughed outright and immediately set me down in his class and gave me lessons for every day the discipline of the abbey seems to have been very slack especially for the big girls this is how mary describes it the liberty which the first class had was so great that if we attended our tutor in his study for an hour or two every morning no human being ever took the trouble to inquire where we spent the rest of the day between our meals thus whether we gossiped in one turret or another whether we lounged about the garden or out of the window above the gateway no one so much as said where have you been mademoiselle 
Mary Butt spent a year at Reading, where she learnt a good deal of French, and not, it would seem, much of anything else. She left it the following Christmas with many tears, thinking that her school days were over, but a few months later her parents decided to send her back to the Abbey for another year, and that her sister Lucy should go too. That was in the autumn of 1792, when the French Revolution was just beginning. On January the 21st, 1793, terrible news came of the murder of the unhappy king, Louis the Sixteenth. All Europe, and England especially, were horrified at the cruel deed, and at the Abbey, where there was a strong French royalist element, feeling round particularly high. Monsieur and Madame went into deep mourning, as did also many of the elder girls. Multitudes of the French nobility came thronging into Reading, gathering about the Abbey, and some of them half living within its walls. Our friend Mary, as a half-fledged young lady, saw a great deal of these poor refugees, who had lost everything but their lives. They seem, however, to have shown the true French courage and gaiety under evil circumstances. There was much singing and playing under the trees, and they helped the schoolgirls to get up some little French plays to act at their breaking-up party. Mary took a part in the character of a French abbess, but she tells us that assuredly her talents never lay in the acting line, and very honestly adds, I could never sufficiently have forgotten myself as to have acted well. Soon after Mary's finally leaving school, her parents decided to put a curate in charge of the Kidderminster living, and to return to lovely Stanford. This was a great relief to poor, shy Mrs. Butt, who had been like a caged bird in Kidderminster, but the young people were not quite sure if they liked the change. They had made many friends in the town and its neighbourhood, and now that Mary was, as we say nowadays, come out, she had been taken to various balls and other diversions. They soon, however, settled down again in the old home, and as there was a large, delightful, and very friendly family at Stanford Court hard by, they found plenty of variety and amusement even in the depths of the country. The young butts went across very often to dine at the court, and on these occasions their hostess, Lady Whittington, got up little impromptu dances which they greatly enjoyed. Often, Mary writes, when we dined at the court she would send for the miller, who played the violin and set us all to dance. My brother was always the partner of the eldest Miss Whittington, and as neither of them could tell one tune from another or dance a single step, we generally marvelled how they got on at all. The steward also, a great big, and in our opinion most supremely ugly man, generally fell to my sister's lot. Thus we did very well, and enjoyed ourselves in our own way. Sometimes the old Welsh harper came, and then we had a more set dance, and some of the ladies' maids, and one or two of the upper men's servants, and the miller himself, and Mr. Taylor of the fall, and the miller's brother Tommy, were asked, and then things were carried on in a superior style. We went into a larger room, and there was more change of partners, but as nothing could have induced the son and heir to ask a stranger, I always had him, whilst Miss Winnington and my sister sometimes fell to the share of the miller and his brother, the miller being himself musical and footing it to the tune better than his partners. The miller's brother seemed to wheel along rather than dance, throwing himself back and looking in his white waistcoat which was kept for these grand occasions, not unlike a sack of meal set upright on trucks and so pushed about the room. I am ready to laugh to this hour when I think of these balls, and I certainly obtained very high celebrity then and there for being something very superior in the dancing line. The happy life at Stanford was not destined to last long, for Mr. Butt's health began to fail, and in the autumn of 1795 he died. Mrs. Butt took a house at Bridgenorth and settled there with her two daughters. Mary had now begun to write in good earnest, and while living at Bridgenorth two of her tales were published, one called Margarita and the other Susan Gray. Probably very few people now living have ever seen or read these stories, and if we did come across them it is to be feared we should think them very dull and long-winded. But when new they were much admired, particularly Susan Gray, which was one of the earliest tales written to interest rich and educated people in the poor and ignorant. It was widely read and reprinted many and many times. In spite of the pleasure and excitement of authorship, life in the little house in the sleepy town of Bridgenorth was very dull and cramped to the two young girls, and they were made much happier, because they were much busier, when the clergyman of one of the town churches asked them to undertake the management of his Sunday school. This is what Sunday school teaching meant at the end of the eighteenth century. We attended the school so diligently on the Sunday that the parents brought the children in crowds, and we were obliged to stop short when each of us had about thirty-five girls and the old schoolmaster as many boys. We made bonnets and tippets for our girls, we walked with them to church, we looked them up in the weekdays, we were vastly busy, we were first amused and next deeply interested. Sunday schools, she goes on to say, then were comparatively new things, so that our attentions were more valued then than they would be nowadays. The next important event in Mary's life was her marriage with her cousin Henry, by which she became the Mrs. Sherwood whose name has been a household word to generations of children. Henry Sherwood had had a curious history, and had endured many hardships and adventures in his youthful days. As a boy of about thirteen he had made a voyage on a rotten old French coasting vessel, which was very nearly wrecked, was run into in the night by an unknown ship, and all but founded in the Bay of Biscay. The French Revolution had just begun, and when the brig touched at Marseilles, this young lad saw terrible sights of men hung from lamp-posts, heard the grisly cry, A la lanterne! A la lanterne! and was even himself seized by some of the mob, though he happily contrived, in, in the confusion, to slip away. 
in marseilles too he first saw the guillotine it was carried about in the streets in procession whilst the populace yelled out the marseillaise hymn later on in the revolution he was seized as an englishman and imprisoned with a number of others at abbeville but escaping from there he made a wonderful journey through france switzerland and germany with his father stepmother and their five young children being driven by the state of affairs from town to town and wandering further and further afield in the effort to reach england at length after difficulties and hardships innumerable they landed at hull and henry made his way to some of his relations who took care of him and set him on his legs again henry sherwood soon afterwards entered the army joining the regiment then known as the fifty-third foot and about the same time he began to come to bridgenorth where his pretty young cousin mary butt was growing more and more attractive after a while he wrote her a letter asking if she would be his wife and on june the thirtieth eighteen o three they were married at bridgenorth mary's marriage made a great change to her life she had married into what used to be called a marching regiment which was constantly on the move from one station to another after being transferred from place to place several times within a year with long wearisome journeys both by sea and land following the regiment as it marched the news came that the fifty third was ordered on foreign service which meant a longer journey still it was presently known that the regiment's destination was the east indies or as we should now call it india this was a great blow to poor mrs sherwood for by this time she was the mother of a baby girl whom she must leave behind in england the regiment embarked at portsmouth captain and mrs sherwood had a miserable little cabin rigged up on deck made only of canvas and with a huge gun filling more than half the space the vessel in which they sailed was called the devonshire it was quite a fleet that set sail for besides the vessels needed to convey the troops there had to be several armed cruisers in attendance the war with france was going on and there was continual danger of an attack by the enemy when they had been more than three months at sea three strange vessels were sighted two of which soon ran up the french colours and began to fire without the slightest warning upon the english vessels in a moment all was bustle on board the devonshire clearing the decks for action the women and children were set down into the hold where they had to sit for hours in the dark some way below water-mark while the shots whistled through the rigging overhead the guns roared the ladders had been taken away and none of them could learn a word of what was going forward on deck where their husbands and fathers were helping to man the guns the fighting continued till late at night but no serious damage befell the devonshire at length the women and children were hoisted up out of the hold and enjoyed some negus and biscuits from that time they saw no more of the french at last the voyage with its anxieties and discomforts was over the devonshire sailed into the hooghly and anchored in diamond harbour expecting boats to come down from calcutta to carry the regiment up there it would take too long to tell the story of the sherwood's life in india though mrs sherwood's account of it is very good reading two or three scenes will give you some notion of how she spent her time a certain number of the soldiers of the regiment were allowed to bring their wives and children out with them there were no government schools then for the regimental children so that these little people idled away their time round the barracks and were as ignorant as the day they were born it came into mrs sherwood's head to start a school for them and this school she herself taught for four hours every morning except in the very hottest weather and the only help she had was from a sergeant of the regiment a kind good man some of the officers also were very thankful to send their children to school so that mrs sherwood soon had as many as fifty boys and girls coming daily to her bungalow very hard work it was teaching them to read and write and to be gentle truthful and obedient she found the officers children generally more troublesome than the soldiers because they were more spoilt or as she puts it pampered and indulged for these children she wrote many of her books especially her stories on the church catechism which can still be bought and which give a very interesting picture of the life of a soldier's child in india some eighty years ago besides her day school mrs sherwood collected in her house several little orphans the children of poor soldiers wives who quickly died in the trying climate of india she found some of these children being dreadfully neglected and half starved so took them home to her and brought them up with her own children she gives an amusing description of her home life in india during the hot season so terribly trying to europeans the mode of existence of an english family during the hot winds in india is so very unlike anything in europe that i must not omit to describe it every outer door of the house and every window is closed all the interior doors and venetians are however open whilst most of the private apartments are shut in by drop curtains or screens of grass looking like fine wire-work partially covered with green silk the hall which never has any other than borrowed lights in any bungalow is always in the centre of the house and ours at cawnpore had a large room on each side of it with baths and sleeping rooms in the hot winds i always sat in the hall at cawnpore though i was that year without a baby of my own i had my orphan my little annie always by me quietly occupying herself and not actually receiving instruction from me i had given her a good-sized box painted green with a lock and key she had a little chair and table she was the neatest of all neat little people somewhat faddy in particular perchance she was the child of all others to live with an ancient grandmother 
annie's treasures were few but they were all contained in her green box she never wanted occupation she was either dressing her doll or finding pretty verses in her bible marking the places with an infinitude of minute pieces of paper it was a great delight to me to have this little quiet one by my side in another part of this hall sat mr sherwood during most part of the morning either engaged with his accounts his journal or his books he of course did not like the confinement so well as i did and often contrived to get out to a neighbour's bungalow in his palanquin during some part of the long morning in one of the side rooms sat sergeant clark with his books and accounts this worthy and most methodical personage used to fill up his time in copying my manuscripts in a very neat hand and in giving lessons in reading and spelling etc to annie in the other room was the orphan sally with her toys beside her sat her attendant chewing her pawn footnote described to little henry and his bearer as an intoxicating mixture of opium and sugar End footnote, and enjoying a state of perfect apathy thus did our mornings pass whilst we sat in what the lovers of broad daylight would call almost darkness during these mornings we heard no sounds but the monotonous click click of the punker footnote the huge fan hanging from the ceiling by which the air of houses in india is kept moving End footnote, or the melancholy moaning of the burning blast without with the splash and dripping of the water thrown over the tatties footnote the tata is a blind or screen woven of sweet-smelling grass which is kept constantly wet by the water carriers End footnote. at one o'clock or perhaps somewhat later the tiffin answering to our luncheon was always served a hot dinner in fact consisting always of curry and a variety of vegetables we often dined at this hour the children at a little table in the room after which we all lay down the adults on sofas and the children on the floor under the punkah in the hall at four or later perhaps we had coffee brought we then bathed and dressed and at six or thereabouts the wind generally falling the tatties were removed the doors and windows of the house were opened and we either took an airing in carriages or sat in the veranda but the evenings and nights of the hot winds brought no refreshment the days spent in that strange hot twilight must have seemed very long to children even to those who had forgotten or never known the freedom of life in england but mrs sherwood had plenty of ways of filling her long quiet hours she wrote a number of little stories about life in india which were very much liked in their day and went through many editions one of these was called the ayah and lady and told about a native servant her ignorant notions and strange ways and how her mistress tried to do her good another was lucy and her die the history of a little english girl and her dark-skinned nurse who was so devoted to her that she nearly broke her heart when lucy went home to england and she was left behind but the best of them all was little henry and his bearer which is one of the most famous stories ever written for children the history of little henry the neglected orphan child whom nobody loved save his poor faithful heathen bearer or native servant is exceedingly pretty and touching mrs sherwood was always thinking about children and trying to find out ways of helping them to be happy and good a page from her diary will show how often she must have been grieved and distressed at the spoilt boys and girls she saw in the houses of the english merchants and civil servants at calcutta and elsewhere i must now proceed she writes to some description of miss louisa the eldest daughter then in india of our friends who at that time might have been about six or seven she was tall of her age very brown and very pale she had been entirely reared in india and was accustomed from her earliest infancy to be attended by a multitude of servants whom she despised thoroughly as being black although no doubt she preferred their society to her own country people as they ministered with much flattery and civility to her wants wherever she had moved during these first years of her life she had been followed by her ayah and probably by one or two bearers and she was perfectly aware that if she got into any mischief they would be blamed and not herself in the meantime except in the article of food every desire and every caprice and every want had been indulged to satiety no one who has not seen it can imagine the profusion of toys which are scattered about an indian house wherever the babalogue children people are permitted to range there may be seen fine polished and painted toys from benares in which all the household utensils of the country the fruit and even the animals are represented the last most ludicrously incorrect toys in painted clay from Moshedabad and calcutta representing figures of gods and goddesses with horses camels elephants peacocks and parrots and now and then a tope waller or hat wearer as they call the english in full regimentals and cocked hat seated on a clumsy ill-formed thing meant for a horse then add to these english french and dutch toys which generally lie pell-mell in every corner where the listless toy satiated child may have thrown or kicked them the quantity of inner and outer garments worn by a little girl in england would render it extremely fatiguing to change the dress so often as our little ladies are required to do in india miss louise's attire consisted of a single garment a frock body without sleeves attached to a pair of trousers with rather a short full skirt gathered into the body with the trousers so as to form one whole the whole being ruffled with the finest gindelli a cloth which is not unlike cambric every ruffle being plaited in the most delicate manner 
These ruffles are doubled and trebled on the top of the arm, forming there a substitute for a sleeve, and the same is done round the ankle, answering the purpose almost of a stocking, or at least concealing its absence. Fine coloured kid shoes ought to have completed this attire, but it most often happened that these were kicked away among the rejected toys. How many times in a day the dress of Miss Louisa was renewed, who shall say? It, however, depended much upon the accidents which might happen to it, but four times was the usual arrangement, which was once before breakfast, once after, once again before tiffin, and once again for the evening airing. The child, being now nearly seven years old, was permitted to move about the house independently of her ayah. Thus she was sometimes in the hall, sometimes in the veranda, sometimes in one room, sometimes in another. In an Indian house in the hot season no inner door is ever shut, and curtains only are hung in the doorways, so that this little wild one was in and out and everywhere just as it hit her fancy. She had never been taught even to know her letters, she had never been kept to any task, she was a complete slave of idleness, restlessness, and ennui. It is time for Louisa to go to England, was quietly remarked by the parents, and no one present controverted the point. Children like this must have made the good Mrs. Sherwood very unhappy, her own little ones, of whom she had three who lived to come home to England, were very differently brought up. She had also a lovely little boy named Henry, and a little fair-haired Lucy, who both died in India before they were two years old. It would be impossible to end even this short sketch of Mrs. Sherwood's Indian life without mentioning her friendship with Henry Martin, that saintly soul and famous missionary in India and Persia. When the Sherwoods knew him, he was government chaplain, at Dinapur, a great military station, at which the 53rd foot then was. Mrs. Sherwood nursed him through a bad illness, and she and her husband afterwards paid him a visit in his quarters at Cawnpore, to which place he had been transferred. He had a school at Cawnpore for little native children, and worked hard at preaching to the heathen, while all the time doing his utmost for the soldiers of the various regiments stationed in the barracks. The Sherwoods heard his wonderful farewell sermon before starting for Persia, and the news of his death in that far land reached them not long before they quitted India for England. After being about twelve years in the east, the 53rd Regiment was ordered home, and very thankful Captain and Mrs. Sherwood were to bring the children they still had living safely back to a more healthy climate. Two of the orphans came with them, so they were quite a party of little people on board the ship, and when they landed at Liverpool they must have been a very quaint-looking group, for we had not a bonnet in the party, we all wore caps trimmed with lace, white dresses and Indian shawls. Can we wonder if, as Mrs. Sherwood goes on to say, we were followed wherever we went by hundreds of the residents of Liverpool? The rest of Mrs. Sherwood's long life was spent in England, save for an occasional visit to France and Switzerland. She and her husband settled in the West, where she had been born and bred, and of which she was so fond. She had more children, most of whom died young, and she lived a very busy, active, useful life, working hard at writing stories and tracts, visiting the prison at Worcester, and doing whatever good and useful work lay within her power. The first part of the Fairchild family was published in 1818. It was so popular that, more than twenty years afterwards, she wrote a second part, which, as you will see, begins at page 150. As we read, we shall notice little points of difference between it and the first part, but our friends Lucy, Emily, and Henry are just as nice and as naughty, as good and as silly as they were in the opening chapters of the book. A few years later, when a very old woman, Mrs. Sherwood wrote a third part of the Fairchild family, in which she was helped by her daughter, Mrs. Kelly, but this third part is less entertaining and interesting than the two which went before it, and is also not entirely Mrs. Sherwood's own work, so you will not find it printed here. In 1851, Mrs. Sherwood died at Twickenham, where she had gone to live a few years previously. In the course of her long life, she had seen many trials and sorrows, but she had had a great deal of happiness. She had made the very most of all the gifts given her by God. Countless children have been the happier and the better for what she wrote for them, and by means of this new edition of a dear old book, with its pleasant type and charming illustrations, I hope a new generation will spring up of lovers and admirers of Mrs. Sherwood. Mary E. Palgrave End of Introduction Recording by Ellen O'Neill from Cambridge, England. Section One of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. Part One. Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild lived very far from any town. Their house stood in the midst of a garden, which in the summer time was full of fruit and sweet flowers. Mr. Fairchild kept only two servants, Betty and John. Betty's business was to clean the house, cook the dinner, and milk the cow. And John waited at table, worked in the garden, fed the pig, and took care of the meadow in which the cow grazed. Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild had three children. Lucy, who was about nine years old when these stories began, Emily, who was next in age, 
and Henry, who was between six and seven. These little children did not go to school. Mrs. Fairchild taught Lucy and Emily, and Mr. Fairchild taught little Henry. Lucy and Emily learned to read, and to do various kinds of needlework. Lucy had begun to write, and took great pains with her writing. Their mother also taught them to sing psalms and hymns, and they could sing several very sweetly. Little Henry, too, had great notion of singing. Besides working and reading, the little girls could do many useful things. They made their beds, rubbed the chairs and tables in their rooms, fed the fowls, and when John was busy they laid the cloth for dinner, and were ready to fetch anything which their parents might want. Mr. Fairchild taught Henry everything that was proper for little boys in his station to learn, and when he had finished his lessons in a morning, his papa used to take him very often to work in the garden, for Mr. Fairchild had great pleasure in helping John to keep the garden clean. Henry had a little basket, and he used to carry the weeds and rubbish in his basket out of the garden, and do many such other little things as he was set to do. I must not forget to say that Mr. Fairchild had a school for poor boys in the next village, and Mrs. Fairchild one for girls. I do not mean that they taught the children entirely themselves, but they paid a master and mistress to teach them, and they used to take a walk two or three times a week to see the children, and to give rewards to those who had behaved well. When Lucy and Emily and Henry were obedient, their parents were so kind as to let them go with them to see the schools, and then they always contrived to have some little thing ready to carry with them as presents to the good children. The Birthday Walk It is Lucy's birthday, said Mr. Fairchild, as he came into the parlour one fine morning in May. We will go to see John Truman and take some cake to his little children, and afterwards we will go on to visit Nurse and carry her some tea and sugar. Nurse was a pious old woman who had taken care of Lucy when she was a baby, and now lived with her son and his wife Joan in a little cottage, not far distant, called Brookside Cottage, because a clear stream of water ran just before the door. "'And shall we stay at Nurse's all day, Papa?' said the children. "'Ask your mamma, my dears,' said Mr. Fairchild. "'With all my heart,' said Mrs. Fairchild, "'and we will take Betty with us to carry our dinner.' So when the children had breakfasted, and Betty was ready, they all set out. At first they went down the lane toward John Truman's cottage. There is not a pleasanter lane near any village in England. The hedge on each side is of hawthorn, which was then in blossom, and the grass was soft under the feet as a velvet cushion. On the bank under the hedge were all manner of sweet flowers, violets and primroses, and the blue vervain. Lucy and Emily and Henry ran gaily along before Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild, and Betty came after with the basket. Before they came up to the gate of John Truman's cottage, the children stopped to take the cake out of Betty's basket, and to cut shares of it for John's little ones. While they were doing this, their father and mother had reached the cottage, and were sitting down at the door when they came up. John Truman's cottage was a neat little place, standing in a garden adorned with pinks and rosemary and southernwood. John himself was gone out to his daily work when Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild came to his house, but his wife Mary was at home, and was just giving a crust of bread and a bit of cheese to a very poor woman who had stopped at the gate with a baby in her arms. "'Why, Mary,' said Mrs. Fairchild, "'I hope it is a sign that you are getting rich, as you have bread and cheese to spare.' "'Sir,' she answered, "'this poor woman is in want, and my children will never miss what I have given her.' "'You are very right,' answered Mrs. Fairchild, and at the same time she slipped a shilling into the poor woman's hand. John and Mary Truman had six children. The eldest, Thomas, was working in the garden, and little Billy, his youngest brother, who was but three years old, was carrying out the weeds as his brother plucked them up. Mary, the eldest daughter, was taking care of the baby, and Kitty, the second, sat sewing, whilst her brother Charles, a little boy of seven years of age, read the Bible aloud to her. They were all neat and clean, though dressed in very coarse clothes. When Lucy and Emily and Henry divided the cake amongst the poor children, they looked very much pleased, but they said that they would not eat any of it till their father came in at night. "'If that is the case,' said Mrs. Fairchild, "'you shall have a little tea and sugar to give your father with your cake.' So she gave them some out of the basket. As Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild and their children passed through the village, they stopped at the schools and found everything as they could wish, the children all neat, clean, cheerful and busy, and the master and mistress very attentive. They were much pleased to see everything in such good order in the schools, and having passed this part of the village, they turned aside into a large meadow, through which was the path to Nurse's cottage. 
Many sheep with their lambs were feeding in this meadow, and here also were abundance of primroses, cowslips, daisies, and buttercups, and the songs of the birds which were in the hedgerows were exceedingly delightful. As soon as the children came in sight of Nurse's little cottage, they ran on before to kiss Nurse, and to tell her that they were come to spend the day with her. The poor woman was very glad, because she loved Mr. Fairchild's children very dearly. She therefore kissed them, and took them to see her little grandson Tommy, who was asleep in the cradle. By this time Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild and Betty were come up, and while Betty prepared the dinner, Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild sat talking with Nurse at the door of the cottage. Betty and Joan laid the cloth upon the fresh grass before the cottage door, and when Joan had boiled some potatoes, Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild sat down to dinner with the children, after which the children went to play in the meadow by the brookside till it was time for them to be going home. "'What a happy day we have had,' said Lucy, as she walked home between her father and mother. "'Everything has gone well with us since we set out, and every one we have seen has been kind and good to us, and the weather has been so fine, and everything looks so pretty all around us.'" End of section 1 Section 2 of The Fairchild Family This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Seek Wisdom. www.morethantheancients.com The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. Chapter 2. Mrs. Fairchild's Story. The next morning, when Lucy and Emily were sitting at work with Mrs. Fairchild, Henry came in from his father's study. I have finished all my lessons, Mama, he said. I have made all the haste I could because Papa said that you would tell us a story today, and now I am come to hear it. So Henry placed himself before his mother, and Lucy and Emily hearkened whilst Mrs. Fairchild told her story. My mother died, said Mrs. Fairchild, many years ago when I was a very little child, so little that I remember nothing more of her than being taken to kiss her when she lay sick in bed. Soon afterwards I can recollect seeing her funeral procession go out of the garden gate as I stood in the nursery window, and I also remember some days afterwards being taken to strow flowers upon her grave in the village churchyard. After my mother's death, my father sent me to live with my aunts, Mrs. Grace and Mrs. Penelope, two old ladies, who, having never been married, had no families to take up their attention, and were so kind as to undertake to bring me up. These old ladies lived near the pleasant town of Reading. I fancy I can see the house now, although it is many years since I left it. It was a handsome old mansion, for my aunts were people of good fortune, and the front of it was a shrubbery neatly laid out with gravel walks, and behind it was a little rising ground where was an arbor in which my aunts used to drink tea on a fine afternoon, and where I often went to play with my doll. My aunts' house and garden were very neat. There was not a weed to be seen in the gravel walks or among the shrubs, nor anything out of its place in the house. My aunts themselves were nice and orderly, and went on from day to day in the same manner, and as far as they knew, they were good women, but they knew very little about religion, and what people do not understand they cannot practice. I was but a very little girl when I came to live with my aunts, and they kept me under their care till I was married. As far as they knew what was right, they took great pains with me. Mrs. Grace taught me to sew, and Mrs. Penelope taught me to read. I had a writing and music master, who came from reading to teach me twice a week, and I was taught all kinds of household work by my aunt's maid. We spent one day exactly like another. I was made to rise early, and to dress myself very neatly, to breakfast with my aunts. At breakfast I was not allowed to speak one word. After breakfast I worked two hours with my aunt Grace, and read an hour with my aunt Penelope. We then, if it was fine weather, took a walk, or if not, an airing in the coach. I and my aunts, and little Shock, my lapdog, together. At dinner I was not allowed to speak, and after dinner I attended my masters or learned my tasks. The only time I had to play was while my aunts were dressing to go out, for they went out every evening to play at cards. When they went out my supper was given to me, and I was put to bed in a closet in my aunt's room. Now, although my aunts took so much pains with me in their way, I was a very naughty girl. I had no good principles. What do you mean by good principles? asked Lucy. A person of good principles, my dear, said Mrs. Fairchild, is one who does not do well for fear of the people he lives with, but from the fear of God. A child who has good principles will behave just the same when his mamma is out of the room as when she is looking at him. At least he will wish to do so. And if he is by his own wicked heart at any time tempted to sin, he will be grieved, although no person knows his sin. But when I lived with my aunt, if I could escape punishment, I did not care what naughty things I did. My Aunt Grace was very fond of shock. She used to give me skim milk at breakfast, but she gave shock cream, and she often made me carry him when I went out a walking. For this reason I hated him, and when we were out of my aunt's hearing, I used to pull his tail and his ears and make the poor little thing howl sadly. 
My Aunt Penelope had a large tabby cat, which I also hated and used ill. I remember once being sent out of the dining room to carry Shock his dinner, Shock being ill, and laid up on a cushion in my aunt's bedroom. As I was going upstairs, I was so unfortunate as to break the plate, which was fine blue china. I gathered up the pieces and, running up into the room, set them before Shock, after which I fetched the cat and shut her up in the room with Shock. When my aunts came up after dinner and found the broken plate, they were much surprised, and Mrs. Bridget, the favorite maid, was called to beat the cat for breaking the plate. I was in my closet and heard all that was said, and instead of being sorry, I was glad that Puss was beaten instead of me. Besides those things which I have told you, I did many other naughty things. Whenever I was sent into the storeroom where the sugar and the sweetmeats were kept, I always stole some. I used very often at night when my aunts were gone out, and Mrs. Bridget also, for Mrs. Bridget generally went out when her mistress did to see some of her acquaintances in the town, to get up and go into the kitchen, where I used to sit upon the housemaid's knee and eat toasted cheese and bread sopped in beer. Whenever my aunts found out any of my naughty tricks, they used to talk to me of my wickedness, and to tell me that if I went on in this manner, I certainly should make God very angry. When I heard them talk of God's anger, I used to be frightened and resolved to do better, but I seldom kept any of my good resolutions. From day to day, I went on in the same way, getting worse, I think, instead of better, until I was 12 years of age. One Saturday morning in the middle of summer, my aunts called me to them and said, My dear, we are going from home and shall not return till Monday morning. We cannot take you with us as we could wish because you have not been invited. Bridget will go with us, therefore there will be no person to keep you in order. But we hope, as you are not now a little child, that you may be trusted a few days by yourself. Then they talked to me of the commandments of God, and explained them to me, and spoke of the very great sin and danger of breaking them. And they talked to me till I really felt frightened and determined that I would be good all the while they were from home. When the coach was ready, my aunt set out, and I took my books and went to sit in the arbor with Shock, who was left under my care. I stayed in the arbor till evening, when one of the maidservants brought me my supper. I gave part of it to Shock, and when I had eaten the rest, went to bed. As I lay in my bed, I felt very glad that I had gone through that evening without doing anything I thought naughty and was sure I should do as well the next day. The next morning, I was awakened by the bells ringing for church. I got up, ate my breakfast, and when I was dressed, went with the maid to church. When we came home, my dinner was given me. All this while, I had kept my aunt's words pretty well in my memory, but they now began to wear a little from my mind. When I had done my dinner, I went to play in the garden. Behind the garden on the hill was a little field full of cherry trees. Cherries were now quite ripe. My aunts had given me leave every day to pick up a few cherries if there were any fallen from the trees, but I was not allowed to gather any. Accordingly, I went to look if there were any cherries fallen. I found a few and was eating them when I heard somebody call me, Miss, Miss, and looking up saw a little girl who was employed about the house and weeding the garden and running errands. My aunts had often forbid me to play or hold any discourse with this little girl, which was certainly very proper, as the education of the child was very different from that which had been given me. I was heedless of this command, and answered her by saying, "'What are you doing here, Nanny?' "'There is a ladder, miss,' she replied, against a tree at the upper end of the orchard. "'If you please, I will get up into it and throw you down some cherries.' At first I said no, and then I said yes. So Nanny and I repaired to the tree in question, and Nanny mounted into the tree." Oh, Miss Miss, said she as soon as she had reached the top of the ladder. I can see from where I am all the town and both the churches, and here is such plenty of cherries. Do come up. Only just step on the ladder, and then you can sit on this bough and eat as many cherries as you please. And did you get into the tree, Mama? said Lucy. Yes, my dear, I did, said Mrs. Fairchild, and sat down on one of the branches to eat cherries and look about me. Oh, Mama, said Emily, suppose your aunts had come home then. You shall hear, my dear, continued Mrs. Fairchild. My aunts, as I thought, and as they expected, were not to come home till the Monday morning, but something happened whilst they were out, I forget what, which obliged them to return sooner than they had expected, and they got home just at the time when I was in the cherry orchard. They called for me, but not finding me immediately, they sent the servants different ways to look for me. The person who happened to come to look for me in the cherry orchard was Mrs. Bridget, who was the only one of the servants who would have told of me. She soon spied me with Nanny in the cherry tree. She made us both come down and dragged us by the arms into the presence of my aunts, who were exceedingly angry. I think I never saw them so angry. Nanny was given up to her mother to be punished, and I was shut up in a dark room where I was kept several days upon bread and water. At the end of three days, my aunt sent for me and talked to me for a long time. Is it not very strange at your age, niece, said Mrs. Penelope, that you cannot be trusted for one day? After all the pains we have taken with you, after all we have taught you? 
And, said my Aunt Grace, think of the shame and disgrace of climbing trees in such low company after all the care and pains we have taken with you and the delicate manner in which we have reared you. In this way they talked to me whilst I cried very much. Indeed, indeed, Aunt Grace and Aunt Penelope, I said, I did mean to behave well when you went out. I made many resolutions, but I broke them all. I wished to be good, but I could not be good. When my aunts had talked to me a long time, they forgave me, and I was allowed to go about as usual, but I was not happy. I felt that I was naughty and did not know how to make myself good. One afternoon, soon after all this had happened, while my aunts and I were drinking tea in the parlor with the window open towards the garden, an old gentleman came in at the front gate, whom I had never seen before. He was dressed in plain black clothes, exceedingly clean. His gray hair curled about his neck, and in his hand he had a strong walking stick. I was the first who saw him as I was nearest the window, and I called to my aunts to look at him. "'Why, it is my cousin Thomas,' cried my Aunt Penelope. "'Who would have expected to have seen him here?' With that, both my aunts ran out to meet him and bring him in. The old gentleman was a clergyman and a near relation of our family, and had lived many years upon his living in the north without seeing any of his relations. "'I have often promised to come and see you, cousins,' he said as soon as he was seated, "'but have never been able to bring the matter about till now.' My aunts told him how glad they were to see him and presented me to him. He received me very kindly and told me that he remembered my mother. The more I saw of this gentleman, the more pleased I was with him. He had many entertaining stories to tell, and he spoke of everybody in the kindest way possible. He often used to take me out with him a walking and show me the flowers and teach me their names. One day he went out into the town and bought a beautiful little Bible for me, and when he gave it to me, he said, Read this, dear child, and pray to God to send his Holy Spirit to help you to understand it, and it shall be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. I know that verse, Mama, said Lucy. It is in the Psalms. The old gentleman stayed with my aunts two months, and every day he used to take me with him to walk in the fields, the woods, and in the pleasant meadows on the banks of the Thames. His kind words to me at those times I shall never forget. He, with God's blessing, brought me to the knowledge of my dear Savior and showed me the wickedness of my own heart and made me understand that I could never do any good but through the help of God. When the good old gentleman was gone, did you behave better than you did before he came, Mama? said Lucy. After he left us, my dear, I was very different from what I was before, said Mrs. Fairchild. I had learned to know the weakness of my heart and to ask God to help me to be good. And when I had done wrong, I knew whose forgiveness to ask, and I do not think that I ever fell into those great sins which I had been guilty of before, such as lying, stealing, and deceiving my aunts. End of section two. Section three of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Seek Wisdom. www.morethantheancients.com the Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood Chapter 3 On Envy Who can go with me to the village this morning, said Mr. Fairchild one winter's day, to carry this basket of little books to the school? Lucy cannot go, said Mrs. Fairchild, because her feet are sore with chillblains, and Henry has a bad cold, but Emily can go. Make haste, Emily, said Mr. Fairchild, and put on your thick shoes and warm coat, for it is very cold. As soon as Emily was ready, she set off with her father. It was a very cold day, and the ground was quite hard with the frost. Mr. Fairchild walked first, and Emily came after him with the little basket. They gave the basket to the schoolmaster and returned. As they were coming back, Emily saw something bright upon the ground, and when she stooped to pick it up, she saw that it was a ring set about with little white shining stones. Oh, Papa, Papa, she said, see what I have found? What a beautiful ring! When Mr. Fairchild looked at it, he was quite surprised. Why, my dear, said he, I think that this is Lady Noble's diamond ring. How came it to be lying in this place? Whilst they were looking at the ring, they heard the sound of a carriage. It was Sir Charles Noble's, and Lady Noble was in it. Oh, Mr. Fairchild, she called out of the window of the carriage. I'm in great trouble. I've lost my diamond ring, and it is of very great value. I went to the village this morning in the carriage, and as I came back, pulled off my glove to get sixpence out of my purse to give to a poor man somewhere in this lane, and I suppose that my ring dropped off at the time. I don't know what I shall do. Sir Charles will be sadly vexed. Make yourself quite happy, madam, said Mr. Fairchild. Here is your ring. Emily just this moment picked it up. Lady Noble was exceedingly glad when she received back her ring. She thanked Emily twenty times and said, I think I have something in the carriage which you will like very much, Miss Emily. It has just come from London and was intended for my daughter Augusta, but I will send for another for her. 
So saying, she presented Emily with a new doll packed up in paper, and with it a little trunk with a lock and key full of clothes for the doll. Emily was so delighted that she almost forgot to thank Lady Noble, but Mr. Fairchild, who was not quite so much overjoyed as his daughter, remembered to return thanks for this pretty present. So Lady Noble put the ring on her finger and ordered the coachman to drive home. Oh, Papa, Papa, said Emily, how beautiful this doll is. I have just torn the paper a bit and I can see its face. It has blue eyes and red lips and hair like Henry's. Oh, how beautiful. Please, Papa, to carry the box for me. I cannot carry both the box and the doll. Oh, this beautiful doll, this lovely doll. So she went on talking till they reached home. Then she ran before her papa to her mama and sister and brother, and taking the paper off the doll, cried out, How beautiful! Oh, what pretty hands, what nice feet, what blue eyes! How lovely, how beautiful! Her mother asked her several times where she had got this pretty doll, but Emily was too busy to answer her. When Mr. Fairchild came in with the trunk of clothes, he told all the story how that Lady Noble had given Emily the doll for finding her diamond ring. When Emily had unpacked the doll, she opened the box, which was full of as pretty doll's things as ever you saw. Whilst Emily was examining all these things, Henry stood by admiring them and turning them about. But Lucy, after having once looked at the doll without touching it, went to a corner of the room and sat down in her little chair without speaking a word. Come, Lucy, said Emily, help me to dress my doll. Can't you dress it yourself, answered Lucy, taking up a little book and pretending to read. Come, Lucy, said Henry, you never saw so beautiful a doll before. Don't tease me, Henry, said Lucy. Don't you see I'm reading? Put up your book now, Lucy, said Emily, and come and help me to dress this sweet little doll. I will be its mamma, and you shall be its nurse, and it shall sleep between us in our bed. I don't want dolls in my bed, said Lucy. Don't tease me, Emily. Then Henry shall be its nurse, said Emily. Come, Henry, we will go into our playroom and put this pretty doll to sleep. Will not you come, Lucy? Pray do come. We want you very much. Do let me alone, answered Lucy. I want to read. So Henry and Lucy went to play, and Lucy sat still in the corner of the parlor. After a few minutes, her mamma, who was at work by the fire, looked at her and saw that she was crying. The tears ran down her cheeks and fell upon her book. Then Mrs. Fairchild called Lucy to her and said, My dear child, you are crying. Can you tell me what makes you unhappy? Nothing, mamma, answered Lucy. I am not unhappy. People do not cry when they are pleased and happy, my dear, said Mrs. Fairchild. Lucy stood silent. I am your mother, my dear, said Mrs. Fairchild, and I love you very much. If anything vexes you, whom should you tell it to but to your own mother? Then Mrs. Fairchild kissed her and put her arms round her. Lucy began to cry more. Oh, mamma, mamma, dear mamma, she said, I don't know what vexes me or why I have been crying. Are you speaking the truth, said Mrs. Fairchild? Do not hide anything from me. Is there anything in your heart, my dear child, do you think, which makes you unhappy? Indeed, mamma, said Lucy, I think there is. I am sorry that Emily has got that pretty doll. Pray do not hate me for it, Mamma. I know it is a wicked thing in me to be sorry that Emily is happy, but I feel that I cannot help it. My dear child, said Mrs. Fairchild, I am glad you have confessed the truth to me. Now I will tell you why you feel so unhappy, and I will tell you where to seek a cure. The naughty passion you now feel, my dear, is what is called envy. Envy makes persons unhappy when they see others happier or better than themselves. Envy is in every man's heart by nature. Some people can hide it more than others, and others have been enabled by God's grace to overcome it in a great degree. But, as I said before, it is in the natural heart of all mankind. Little children feel envious about dolls and playthings, and men and women feel envious about greater things. Do you ever feel envious, Mama? said Lucy. I never saw you unhappy because other people had better things than you had. My heart, my dear child, answered Mrs. Fairchild, is no better than yours. There was a time when I was very envious. When I was first married and I had no children for seven or eight years, I wished very much to have a baby, as you wished just now for Emily's doll. And whenever I saw a woman with a pretty baby in her arms, I was ready to cry for vexation. Do you ever feel any envy now, Mama? said Lucy. I cannot say that I never feel it, my dear, but I bless God that this wicked passion has not the power over me which it used to have. Oh, Mama, Mama, said Lucy, how unhappy wickedness makes us. I have been very miserable this morning, and what for? Only because of the naughtiness of my heart, for I have had nothing else to make me miserable. Then Mrs. Fairchild took Lucy by the hand and went into her closet, where they prayed that the Holy Spirit would take the wicked passion of envy out of Lucy's heart. And as they prayed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who died upon the cross to deliver us from the power of sin, they did not doubt but that God would hear their prayer. And indeed he did, for from that day Lucy never felt envious of Emily's doll, but helped Emily to take care of it and make its clothes, and was happy to have it laid on her bed betwixt herself and her sister. End of chapter 3
Section 4 of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua M. C. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. The Story of the Apples. Just opposite Mr. Fairchild's parlor window was a young apple tree, which had never yet brought forth any fruit. At length, it produced two blossoms, from which came two apples. As these apples grew, they became very beautiful and promised to be very fine fruit. I desire, said Mr. Fairchild one morning to his children, that none of you touch the apples on that young tree, for I wish to see what kind of fruit they will be when they are quite ripe. That same evening, as Henry and his sisters were playing in the parlor window, Henry said, Those are beautiful apples indeed that are upon the tree. Do not look upon them, Henry, said Lucy. Why not, Lucy? asked Henry. Because Papa has forbidden us to meddle with them. Well, I am not going to meddle with them. I am only looking at them. Oh, but if you look at them, you will begin to wish for them, and may be tempted to take them at last. How can you think of any such thing, Lucy? Do you take me for a thief? The next evening, the children were playing again in the parlor window. Henry said to his sister, I dare say that those beautiful apples will taste very good when Papa gathers them. They are now, Henry, said Lucy. I told you that the next thing would be wishing for those apples. Why do you look at them? Well, and if I do wish for them, is there any harm in that, answered Henry, if I do not touch them? Oh, but now you have set your heart upon them. The devil may tempt you to take one of them, as he tempted Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. You should not have looked at them, Henry. Oh, I shan't touch the apples. Don't be afraid. Now Henry did not mean to steal the apples, it is true. But when people give way to sinful desires, their passions get so much power over them that they cannot say, I will sin so far and no further. That night, whenever Henry awoke, he thought of the beautiful apples. He got up before his parents or his sisters and went down into the garden. There was nobody up but John, who was in the stable. Henry went and stood under the apple tree. He looked at the apples. There was one which he could just reach as he stood on his tiptoe. He stretched out his hand and plucked it from the tree and ran away with it, as he thought out of sight behind the stable. Having eaten it in haste, he returned to the house. When Mr. Fairchild got up, he went into the garden and looked at the apple tree and saw that one of the apples was missing. He looked round the tree to see if it had fallen down, and he perceived the mark of a child's foot under the tree. He came into the house in great haste, and looking angrily, Which of you young ones, said he, has gathered the apple from the young apple tree? Last night there were two upon the tree, and now there is only one. The children made no answer. If you have any of you taken the apple and will tell me the truth, I will forgive you, said Mr. Fairchild. I did not take it indeed, Papa, said Lucy, and I did not take it, said Emily. I did not. Indeed I did not, said Henry, but Henry looked very red when he spoke. Well, said Mr. Fairchild, I must call in John and ask him if he can tell who took the apple. But before John is called in, I tell you once more, my dear children, that if any of you took the apple and will confess to it, even now I will freely forgive you. Henry now wished to tell his father the truth, but he was ashamed to own his wickedness, and he hoped that it would never be found out that he was the thief. When John came in, Mr. Fairchild said, John, there is one of the apples taken from the young apple tree opposite the parlor window. Sir, said John, I did not take it, but I think I can guess which way it went. Then John looked very hard at Henry, and Henry trembled and shook all over. I saw Master Henry this morning run behind the stable with a large apple in his hand, and he stayed there until he had eaten it, and then he came out. Henry, said Mr. Fairchild, is this true? Are you a thief and a liar too? 
and Mr. Fairchild's voice was very terrible when he spoke. Then Henry fell down upon his knees and confessed his wickedness. Go from my sight, bad boy, said Mr. Fairchild. If you had told me the truth at first, I should have forgiven you. But now I will not forgive you. Then Mr. Fairchild ordered John to take Henry and lock him up in the little room at the top of the house where he could not speak to any person. Poor Henry cried sadly, and Lucy and Emily cried too, but Mr. Fairchild would not excuse Henry. It is better, he said, that he should be punished in this world whilst he is a little boy than grow up to be a liar and a thief. So poor Henry was locked up by himself in a little room at the very top of the house. He sat down on a small box and cried sadly. He hoped that his mother and father would have sent him some breakfast, but they did not. At twelve o'clock, he looked out of the window and saw his mother and sisters walking in the meadow at a little distance, and he saw his father come and fetch them in to dinner, as he supposed. And then he hoped that he should have some dinner sent to him, but no dinner came. Sometime after he saw Betty go down into the meadow to milk the cow, then he knew that it was five o'clock, and that it would soon be night. Then he began to cry again. Oh, I am afraid, he said, that Papa will make me stay here all night, and I shall be alone, for God will not take care of me because of my wickedness. Soon after, Henry saw the sun go down behind the hills, and he heard the rooks as they were going to rest in their nests at the top of some tall trees near the house. Soon afterwards, it became dusk, then quite dark. Oh, dear, dear, said Henry when he found himself sitting alone in the dark. What a wicked boy I have been today. I stole an apple and told two or three lies about it. I have made my papa and mamma unhappy and my poor sisters too. How could I do such things? And now I must spend all this night in this dismal place. And God will not take care of me because I am so naughty. Then Henry cried very sadly indeed. After which he knelt down and prayed that God would forgive him till he found himself getting more happy in his mind. When he got up from his prayer, he heard the step of someone coming upstairs. He thought it was his mother, and his heart was very glad indeed. Henry was right. It was indeed his mother come to see her poor little boy. He soon heard her unlock the door, and in a moment he ran into her arms. Is Henry sorry for his naughtiness, said Mrs. Fairchild, as she sat down and took him upon her lap. Are you sorry, my dear child, for your very great naughtiness? Oh, indeed I am, said Henry, sobbing and crying. I am very sorry. Pray forgive me. I have asked God to forgive me, and I think that he has heard my prayer, for I feel happier than I did. But have you thought, Henry, of the great wrong which you have done? Yes, Mamma, I have been thinking of it a great deal. I know that what I did this morning was a very great sin. Why do you say this morning, said Mrs. Fairchild? The sin that you committed was the work of several days. How, Mamma? said Henry. I was not two minutes stealing the apple, and Papa found it before breakfast. Still, my dear, said Mrs. Fairchild, and that sin was the work of many days. Henry listened to his mother, and she went on speaking. Do you remember those little chickens which came out of the eggs in the hen's nest last Monday morning? Yes, Mamma, said Henry. Do you think, said Mrs. Fairchild, that they were made the moment before they came out? No, Mamma, said Henry. Papa said they were growing in the eggshell a long time before they came out alive. In the same manner, the great sin you committed this morning was growing in your heart some days before it came out. How, Mamma? said Henry. I do not understand. All wrong things which we do are first formed in our hearts, and sometimes our sins are very long before they come to their full growth. The great sin you committed this morning began to be formed in your heart three days ago. Do you remember? that the very day in which your father forbade you to touch the apples, you stood in the parlor window and looked at them, and you admired their beautiful appearance? This was the beginning of your sin. Your sister Lucy told you at the time not to look at them, and she did well, for by looking at forbidden things we are led to desire them, and when we desire them very much we proceed to take them. 
Your father forbade you to touch these apples. Therefore, my dear child, you ought not to have allowed yourself to think of them for one moment. When you first thought about them, you did not suppose that this thought would end in so very great a sin as you have now been guilty of. Oh, mamma, said Henry, I will try to remember what you have said to me all my life. Mrs. Fairchild kissed little Henry then and said, God bless you, my child, and give you a holy heart, which may never think or design any evil. Mrs. Fairchild then led Henry down into the parlor, where Mr. Fairchild and Lucy and Emily were waiting for them to go to tea. Mr. Fairchild kissed his little boy, and Lucy and Emily smiled to see him. Henry, said Mr. Fairchild, you have had a sad day of it, but I did not punish you, my child, because I do not love you, but because I do. Then Mr. Fairchild cut a large piece of bread and butter for Henry, which he was very glad of, for he was very hungry. End of section four. Section five of the Fairchild family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. The Fairchild family by Mary Martha Sherwood. Story of an unhappy day. It happened that Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild had had nothing for a long time to interrupt them in the care and management of their children, so that they had had it in their power to teach them and guard them from all evil influences. I will tell you exactly how they lived and spent their time. Emily and Lucy slept together in a little closet on one side of their mother and father's room, and Henry had a little room on the other side where he slept. As soon as the children got up, they used to go into their father and mother's room to prayers, after which Henry went with Mr. Fairchild into the garden, whilst Lucy and Emily made their beds and rubbed the furniture. Afterwards they all met at breakfast, dressed neatly but very plain. At breakfast the children ate what their mother gave them, and seldom spoke till they were spoken to. After breakfast, Betty and John were called in, and all went to prayers. Then Henry went into his father's study to his lessons, and Lucy and Emily stayed with their mother, working and reading till twelve o'clock, when they used to go out to take a walk all together. Sometimes they went to the schools, and sometimes they went to see a poor person. When they came in, dinner was ready. After dinner, the little girls and Mrs. Fairchild worked, whilst Henry read to them till tea-time. And after tea, Lucy and Emily played with their doll and worked for it, and Henry busied himself in making some little things of wood, which his father showed him how to do. And so they spent their time, till Betty and John came in to evening prayers. Then the children had each of them a baked apple, and went to bed. Now all this time the little ones were in the presence of their father and mother, and kept carefully from doing openly naughty things, by the watchful eyes of their dear parents. One day it happened— when they had been living a long time in this happy way, that Lucy said to Mrs. Fairchild, Mamma, I think that Emily and Henry and I are much better children than we used to be. We have not been punished for a very long time. My dear, said Mrs. Fairchild, do not boast or think well of yourself. It is always a bad sign when people boast of themselves. If you have not done any very naughty thing lately, it is not because there is any goodness or wisdom in you, but because your papa and I have been always with you, carefully watching and guiding you from morning till night. That same evening a letter came for Mr. Fairchild, from an old lady who lived about four miles off, begging that he and Mrs. Fairchild would come over, if it was convenient, to see her the next day, to settle some business of consequence. This old lady's name was Mrs. Goodrich, and she lived in a very neat little house just under a hill, with Suki her maid. It was the very house in which Mrs. Howard lived about fifty years ago, as we shall hear later on. When Mr. Fairchild got the letter, he ordered John to get the horse ready by daybreak next morning, and to put the pillion on it for Mrs. Fairchild. So Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild got up very early, and when they had kissed their children, who were still asleep, they set off. Now it happened, very unluckily, 
that mrs fairchild at this time had given betty leave to go for two or three days to see her father and she was not yet returned so there was nobody left in the house to take care of the children but john and now i will tell you how these children spent the day whilst their father and mother were out when lucy and emily awoke they began playing in their beds emily made babies of the pillows and lucy pulled off the sheets and tied them round her in imitation of lady noble's long trained gown and thus they spent their time till henry came to the door to tell them that breakfast was ready and i have persuaded john said henry to make us toast and butter and it looks so nice make haste and come down do sisters do and he continued to drum upon the door with a stick until his sisters were dressed emily and lucy put on their clothes as quickly as they could and went downstairs with their brother without praying washing themselves combing their hair making their bed or doing any one thing they ought to have done john had indeed made a large quantity of toast and butter but the children were not satisfied with what john had made for when they had eaten all that he had provided yet they would toast more themselves and put butter on it before the fire as they had seen betty do so the hearth was covered with crumbs and grease and they wasted almost as much as they ate after breakfast they took out their books to learn their lessons but they had eaten so much that they could not learn with any pleasure and lucy who thought she would be very clever began to scold henry and emily for their idleness and henry and emily in their turn found fault with her so that they began to dispute and would soon i fear have proceeded to something worse if henry had not spied a little pig in the garden oh sisters said he there is a pig in the garden in the flower bed look look and what mischief it will do papa will be very angry come sisters let us hunt it out so saying down went henry's book and away he ran into the garden followed by emily and lucy running as fast as they could they soon drove the pig out of the garden and it would have been well if they had stopped there but instead of that they followed it down into the lane now there was a place where a spring ran across the lane over which was a narrow bridge for the use of people that way now the pig did not stand to look for the bridge but went splash splash through the midst of the water and after him went henry lucy and emily though they were up to their knees in mud and dirt in this dirty condition they ran on till they came close to a house where a farmer and his wife lived whose name was freeman these people were not such as lived in the fear of god neither did they bring up their children well on which account mr fairchild had often forbidden lucy and emily and henry to go to their house however when the children were opposite this house mrs freeman saw them through the kitchen window and seeing they were covered with mud she came out and brought them in and dried their clothes by the fire which was so far very kind of her only the children should not have gone into the house as they had been so often forbidden by their parents mrs freeman would have had them stay all day and play with their children and henry and his sisters would have been very glad to have accepted her invitation but they were afraid so mrs freeman let them go but before they went she gave them each a large piece of cake and something sweet to drink which she said would do them good now this sweet stuff was cider and as they never were used to drink anything but water it made them quite giddy for a little while so that when they got back into the lane first one tumbled down and then another and their faces became flushed and their heads began to ache so that they were forced to sit down for a time under a tree on the side of the lane and there they were when john came to find them for john who was in the stable when they ran out of the garden was much frightened when he returned to the house and could not find them there oh you naughty children said he when he found them you have almost frightened me out of my life where have you been we have been in the lane said lucy blushing this was not all the truth but one fault always leads to another so john brought them home and locked them up in their playroom whilst he got their dinner ready when the children found themselves shut up in their playroom and could not get out they sat themselves down and began to think how naughty they had been they were silent for a few minutes at last lucy spoke oh henry oh emily how naughty we have been and yet i thought i would be so good when papa and mamma went out so very good and what shall we say when papa and mamma come home 
then all the children began to cry at length henry said i'll tell you what we will do lucy we will be good all the evening we will not do one naughty thing so we will henry said emily when john lets us out how good we will be and then we can tell the truth that we were naughty in the morning but we were good all the evening john made some nice apple dumplings for the children and when they were ready and he had put some butter and sugar upon them for john was a good-natured man he fetched the children down and after they had each ate as much apple dumpling as he thought proper he told them they might play in the barn bidding them not to stir out of it till supper time henry and lucy and emily were delighted with this permission and as lucy ran along to the barn with her brother and sister she said now let us be very good we are not to do anything naughty all this evening we will be very good indeed answered emily better than we ever were in all our lives added henry so they all went into the barn and when john fastened them in he said to himself sure they will be safe now till i have looked to the pigs and milked the cow for there is nothing in the barn but straw and hay and they cannot hurt themselves with that sure but john was mistaken as soon as he was gone henry spied a swing which mr fairchild had made in the barn for the children but which he never allowed them to use when he was not with them because swings are very dangerous things unless there are very careful persons to use them the seat of the swing was tied up to the side of the barn above the children's reach as mr fairchild thought oh lucy said henry there is the swing there can be no harm in our swinging a little if papa was here i am sure he would let us swing if you and emily will help to lift me up i will untie it and let it down and then we will swing so nicely so emily and lucy lifted henry up and he untied the swing and let it down into its right place but as he was getting down his coat caught upon a bit of wood on the side of the barn and was much torn however the children did not trouble themselves very much about this accident first emily got into the swing then henry then lucy and then emily would get in again now lucy she said swing me high and i will shut my eyes you can't think how pleasant it is to swing with one's eyes shut swing me higher swing me higher so she went on calling to lucy and lucy trying to swing her higher and higher till at last the swing turned and down came emily to the floor there happened providentially to be some straw on the floor or she would have been killed as it was however she was sadly hurt she lay for some minutes without speaking and her mouth and nose poured out blood henry and lucy thought she was dead and oh how frightened they were they screamed so violently that john came running to see what was the matter and poor man he was sadly frightened when he saw emily lying on the floor covered with blood he lifted her up and brought her into the house he saw she was not dead but he did not know how much she might be hurt when he had washed her face from the blood and given her a little water to drink she recovered a little but her nose and one eye and her lip were terribly swelled and two of her teeth were out when emily was a little recovered john placed her in a little chair by the kitchen fire and he took his blue pocket handkerchief and tied lucy and henry to the kitchen table saying you unlucky rogues you have given me trouble enough to-day that you have i will not let you go out of my sight again till master and mistress come home thank god you have not killed your sister who would have thought of you loosing the swing in this manner henry and lucy and emily remained till it was nearly dark and then they heard the sound of the horse's feet coming up to the kitchen door for mr and mrs fairchild were come john hastened to untie the children who trembled from head to foot oh john john what shall we do what shall we say said lucy the truth the truth and all the truth said john it is the best thing you can do now when mr and mrs fairchild came in they thought their children would have run to meet them but they were so conscious of their naughtiness that they all crept behind john and emily hid her face emily lucy henry cried mrs fairchild you keep back what is the matter oh mamma mamma papa papa said lucy coming forward we have been very wicked children to-day we are not fit to come near you 
what have you done lucy said mrs fairchild tell us the whole truth then lucy told her parents everything which she and her brother and sister had done she did not hide anything from them you may be sure that mr and mrs fairchild were very much shocked when they heard all that lucy had to tell them and saw emily's face they looked very grave indeed i am glad you have told the truth my children said mr fairchild but the faults that you have committed are very serious ones you have disobeyed your parents and in consequence of your disobedience emily might have lost her life if god had not been very merciful to you and now go all of you to your beds the children did as their father bade them and went silently up to their beds where they cried sadly thinking upon their naughtiness the next morning they all three came into their mother's room and begged her to kiss them and forgive them i cannot refuse to pardon you my children said mrs fairchild but indeed you made me and your father very unhappy last night then the children looked at their mother's eyes and they were full of tears and they felt more and more sorry to think how greatly they had grieved their kind mother and when mrs fairchild kissed them and put her arms round their necks they cried more than ever End of section 5section six of the fairchild family this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by seek wisdom www.morethantheancients.com the fairchild family by mary martha sherwood story of ambition or the wish to be great twice every year sir charles and lady noble used to invite mr and mrs fairchild and their children to spend a day with them at their house mr and mrs fairchild did not much like to go because sir charles and his lady were very proud and their children were not brought up in the fear of god yet as the visit only happened twice a year mr fairchild thought it better to go than to have a quarrel with his neighbour mrs fairchild always had two plain muslin frocks with white mittens and neat black shoes for lucy and emily to wear when they went to see lady noble as mr fairchild's house was as much as two miles distance from sir charles noble's sir charles always used to send his carriage for them and to bring them back again at night one morning just at breakfast time mr fairchild came into the parlor saying to mrs fairchild here my dear is a note from sir charles noble inviting us to spend the day tomorrow in the children well my dear said mrs fairchild as sir charles nobles has been so kind as to ask us we must not offend him by refusing to go the next morning mr fairchild desired his wife and children to be ready at twelve o'clock which was the time fixed for the coach to be at mr fairchild's door accordingly soon after eleven mrs fairchild dressed lucy and emily and made them sit quietly down till the carriage came as lucy and emily sat in the corner of the room lucy looked at emily and said sister how pretty you look and how nice you look lucy said emily these frocks are very pretty and make us look very well my dear little girl said mrs fairchild who ever heard what they said to each other do not be conceited because you've got your best frocks on you now think well of yourselves because you fancy you are well dressed by and by when you get to lady noble's you will find miss augusta much finer dressed than yourselves then you will be out of humour with yourselves for as little reason as you now are pleased at this moment henry came in his sunday coat to tell his mother that sir charles noble's carriage was come mrs fairchild was quite ready and lucy and emily were in such a hurry that emily had nearly tumbled downstairs over her sister and lucy was upon the point of slipping down on the step of the hall door however they all got into the coach without any accident and the coachman drove away and that so rapidly that they soon came in sight of sir charles noble's house as it is not very likely that you ever saw sir charles noble's house i will give you some account of it it is a very large house built of smooth white stone it stands in a fine park or green lawn scattered over with tall trees and shrubs but there were no leaves on the trees at the time that i am speaking of because it was winter when the carriage drove up to the hall door a smart footman came out opened the carriage door and showed mr and mrs fairchild through a great many rooms into a grand parlour where lady noble was sitting upon a sofa by a large fire with several other ladies all of whom were handsomely dressed now as i told you before lady noble was a proud woman so she did not take much notice of mrs fairchild when she came in although she ordered the servants to set a chair for her miss augusta noble was seated on the sofa by her mamma playing with a very beautiful wax doll and her two brothers william and edward were standing by her but they never came forward to mrs fairchild's children to say that they were glad to see them or to show them any kind of civility if children knew how disagreeable they make themselves when they are rude and ill-behaved surely they would never be so but would strive to be civil and courteous to everyone 
Soon after Mrs. Fairchild was seated, a servant came to say that Miss Noble's and Master William's and Master Edward's dinners were ready. "'Go, Augustus,' said Lady Noble, "'to your dinner, and take Master and Mrs. Fairchild with you, "'and after you have dined, show them your playthings in your baby house.' "'Miss Augusta got up, and as she passed by Emily and Lucy, "'she said in a very haughty way, "'Mama says you must come with me.' "'So Emily and Lucy followed Miss Augusta, "'and the little boys came after them. "'She went up a pair of grand stairs "'and along a very long gallery full of pictures "'till they came to a large room "'where Miss Augusta's governess was sitting at work "'and the children's dinner set out in great order. "'In one corner of the room was the baby house. "'Besides the baby house, there was a number of other toys, "'a large rocking horse, a cradle with a big wooden doll lying in it, "'and tops and carts and coaches and whips and trumpets in abundance.' "'Here Mrs. Fairchild's children come to dine with me, ma'am,' said Miss Augusta as she opened the door. "'This is Lucy, and this is Emily, and that is Henry.' The governess did not take much notice of Mrs. Fairchild's children, but said, "'Miss Augusta, I wish you would shut the door after you, for it is very cold.' I do not know whether Miss Augusta heard her governess, but she never offered to go back to shut the door. The governess, whose name was Beaumont, then called to Master Edward, who was just coming in to shut the door after him. "'You may shut it yourself if you want it shut,' answered the rude boy." When Lucy heard this, she immediately ran and shut the door, upon which Miss Beaumont looked more civilly at her than she had done before and thanked her for her attention. Whilst Lucy was shutting the door, Miss Augusta began to stir the fire. "'Miss Augusta,' said the lady, "'has not your mamma often forbidden you to touch the fire? Some day you'll set your frock on fire.' Miss Augusta did not heed what her governess said this time any more than the last, but went on raking the fire, till at length Miss Beaumont, fearing some mischief, forced the poker out of her hands.' Miss Augusta looked very much displeased and was going to make a pert answer when her mother and the other ladies came into the room to see the children dine. The young ones immediately seated themselves quietly at the table to eat their dinner. "'Are my children well behaved?' said Lady Noble, speaking to the governess. "'I thought I heard you finding fault with Augusta when I came in.' "'Oh, no, ma'am,' said the governess. "'Miss Augusta is a good young lady. I seldom have reason to find fault with her.' Lucy and Emily looked at Miss Beaumont and wondered to hear her say that Miss Augusta was good, but they were silent. "'I am happy to say,' said Lady Noble, speaking to Mrs. Fairchild, "'that mine are promising children. Augusta has a good heart.' Just at that moment a servant came in and set a plate of apples on the table. "'Miss Beaumont,' said Lady Noble, "'take care that Augusta does not eat above one apple. You know that she was unwell yesterday from eating too many.' Miss Beaumont assured Lady Noble that she would attend to her wishes, and the ladies left the room. When they were gone, the governess gave two apples to each of the children, excepting Augusta, to whom she only gave one. The rest of the apples she took out of the plate and put in her work bag for her own eating. When everyone had done dinner and the tablecloth was taken away, Lady Noble's children got up and left the table, and Henry and Emily were following, but Lucy whispered to them to say grace. Accordingly, they stood still by the table, and putting their hands together, they said the grace which they had been used to say after dinner at home. "'What are you doing?' said Augusta. "'We are saying grace,' answered Lucy. "'Oh, I forgot,' said Augusta. "'Your mamma is religious and makes you do all these things. "'How tiresome it must be! "'And where's the use of it? "'It will be time enough to be religious, you know, "'when we get old and expect to die.' "'Oh, but,' said little Henry, "'perhaps we may never live to be old. "'Many children die younger than we are.' Whilst Henry was speaking, William and Edward stood listening to him with their mouths wide open, and when he had finished his speech, they broke out into a fit of laughter. "'When our parson dies, you shall be parson, Henry,' said Edward, "'but I'll never go to church when you preach.' "'No, he shan't be parson. He shall be clerk,' said William. "'Then he will have all the graves to dig.' "'I'll tell you what,' said Henry. "'Your mamma was never worse out in her life than when she said hers were good children.' "'Take that for your sauciness, you little beggar,' said Master William, giving Henry a blow on the side of the head, and he would have given him several more had not Lucy and Emily ran in between. "'If you fight in this room, boys, I shall tell my mamma,' said Miss Augusta. "'Come, go downstairs. We don't want you here. Go and feed your dogs.' William and Edward accordingly went off and left the little girls and Henry to play quietly." Lucy and Emily were very much pleased with the baby house and the dolls, and Henry got upon the rocking horse, and so they amused themselves for a while. At length Miss Beaumont, who had been sitting at work, went to fetch a book from an adjoining room. As soon as she was out of sight, Miss Augusta, going up softly to the table, took two apples out of her work bag. "'Oh, Miss Augusta, what are you doing?' said Emily. "'She's stealing,' said Henry." "'Stealing!' said Miss Augusta, coming back into the corner of the room where the baby house was. "'What a vulgar boy you are! What words you use!' "'You don't like to be called a thief,' said Henry, "'though you're not ashamed to steal, I see.' "'Do, Miss Augusta, put the apples back,' said Emily. "'Your mamma said you must have but one, you know, today, and you, you've had one already.' 
hush, hush, said Miss Augusta. There's my, here's my governess coming back. Don't say a word. So saying, she slipped the apples into the bosom of her frock and ran out of the room. Where are you going, Miss Augusta? exclaimed Miss Beaumont. Mama has sent for me, answered Augusta. I shall be back immediately. When Miss Augusta had eaten the apples, she came back quietly and sat down to play with Lucy and Emily as if nothing had happened. Soon after, the governess looked into her work bag and found that two of the apples were gone. Miss Augusta, she said, you have taken two apples. There are two gone. I've not touched them, said Miss Augusta. Some of you have, said Miss Beaumont, looking at the other children. I can't tell who has, said Miss Augusta, but I know it was not me. Lucy and Emily felt very angry, but they did not speak. But Henry would have spoken if his sister Lucy had not put her hand over his mouth. I see, said Miss Beaumont, that some of you have taken the apples, and I desire that you, Miss Emily, and you, Miss Lucy, and you, Master Henry, will come and sit down quietly by me, for I don't know what mischief you may do next. Now the governess did not really suppose that Miss Fairchild's children had taken the apples, but she chose to scold them because she was not afraid of offending their parents, but she was very much afraid of offending Miss Augusta and her mamma. So she made Lucy and Emily and Henry sit quietly down by her side before the fire. It was now getting dark, and a maid servant came in with a candle, and setting it upon the table, said, Miss Augusta, it is time for you to be dressed to go down to tea with the ladies. Well, said Miss Augusta, bring me my clothes, and I will be dressed by the fireside. The servant then went into the closet I before spoke of, and soon returned with a beautiful muslin frock, wrought with flowers, a rose-colored sash and shoes, and a pearl necklace. Emily and Lucy had never seen such fine clothes before. And when they saw Miss Augusta dressed in them, they could not help looking at their own plain frocks and black shoes and feeling quite ashamed of them, though there was no more reason to be ashamed of their clothes at that time than there was of their being proud of them when they first, when they were first put on. When Miss Augusta was dressed, she said to the maidservant, Take the candle and light me down to the hall. Then turning to Emily and Lucy, she added, Will you come with me? I suppose you have not brought any clean frocks to put on. Well, never mind. When we get into the drawing room, you must keep behind your mamma's chair, and nobody will take any notice of you. So Miss Augusta walked first with the maidservant, and Henry and Lucy and Emily followed. They went along the great gallery and down the stairs and through several fine rooms, all lighted up with many lamps and candles, till they came to the door where Sir Charles and Lady Noble and Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild and a great many ladies and gentlemen were sitting in a circle around a fire. Lucy and Emily and Henry went and stood behind their mother's chair, and nobody took any notice of them. But Miss Augusta went in among the company, curtsying to one, giving her hand to another, and nodding and smiling at another. "'What a charming girl Miss Augusta has grown,' said one of the ladies. "'Your daughter, Lady Noble, will be quite a beauty,' said another. "'What an elegant frock Miss Augusta has on,' said a third lady. That rose-colored sash makes her sweet complexion more lovely than ever, said one of the gentlemen, and so they went on flattering her till she grew more conceited and more full of herself than ever, and during all the rest of the evening she took no more notice of Mrs. Fairchild's children than if they had not been in the room. After the company had all drank tea, several tables were set out, and the ladies and gentlemen began to make parties for playing at cards. And Mr. As Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild never played at cards, they asked for the coach, and when it was ready, wished Sir Charles and Lady Noble a good night and came away. Well, said little Henry, Sir Charles Noble's may be a very fine house, and everything may be very fine in it, but I like my own little home and garden, and John, and the meadow, and the apple trees, and the round hill, and the lane, better than all the fine things at Sir Charles. Now all this while, Emily and Lucy did not speak a word, and what do you think was the reason? It was this, that the sight of Miss Augusta's fine clothes and playthings and beautiful rooms in which she lived, with the number of people she had to attend her, had made them both out of humor with their own humble way of living in small house and plain clothes. Their hearts were full of the desire of being great like Miss Augusta and having things like her, but they did not dare to tell their thoughts to their mother. When they got home, Mrs. Fairchild gave a baked apple to each of the children and some warm milk and water to drink, and after they had prayed, she sent them to bed. When Emily and Lucy had got into bed and Betty had taken away the candle, Lucy said, Oh, Emily, I wish our papa and mamma were like Sir Charles and Lady Noble. What a beautiful frock that was Miss, that Miss Augusta had on, and I dare say that she has a great many more like it, and that sash I never saw so fine a color. Emily, and then the ladies and gentlemen said she was so pretty, and even her governess did not dare to find fault with her. Lucy, but Betty finds fault with us, and John too, and Papa and Mama make us work so hard, and we have such coarse clothes. Even our best frocks are not so good as those Miss Augusta wears every morning. 
In this manner they went on talking till Mrs. Fairchild came upstairs and into their room. As they had thick curtains round their bed, it being very cold weather, they did not see their mamma come into the room, and so she heard a great deal of what they were talking about without their knowing it. She came up to the side of their bed and sat down in a chair which stood near it, and putting the curtains aside a little, she said, "'My dear little girls, as I came into the room, I heard some part of what you were saying without intending it, and I'm glad I heard it, because I can put you in a way of getting rid of these foolish thoughts and desires which you were speaking of to each other.' "'Do not be ashamed, my dears. I am your own mamma and love you dearly. "'Do you remember, Lucy, when Emily got that beautiful doll from Lady Noble "'that you said you felt something in your heart which made you feel very miserable?' "'Lucy. Yes, mamma, I remember it very well. You told me it was envy. "'But I do not feel envy now. I do not wish to take Miss Augusta's things from her or to hurt her. "'Emily and I only wish to be like her and to have the same things she does.' "'What you now feel, my dears,' said Mrs. Fairchild, "'is not exactly envy, though it is very like it. "'It is what is called ambition. "'Ambition is the desire to be greater than we are. "'Ambition makes people unhappy and discontented "'with what they are and what they have.' "'I do not understand, Mama," said Emily, "'what ambition makes people do.' "'Well, my dear,' said Mrs. Fairchild, "'suppose that Betty was ambitious. "'She would be discontented at being a servant "'and would want to be as high as her mistress.' And if I were ambitious, I should strive to be equal to Lady Noble. And Lady Noble would want to be as great as the Duchess, who lives at the, that beautiful house which we passed by when we went to see your grandmamma. The Duchess, if she were ambitious, would wish to be like the Queen. Emily. But the Queen could be no higher, so she could not be ambitious. Mrs. Fairchild. My dear, you are much mistaken. When you are old enough to read history, you will find that when kings and queens are ambitious, it does more harm even than when little people are so. When kings are ambitious, they desire to be greater than other kings, and then they fight with them and cause many cruel wars and dreadful miseries. So, my dear children, you see that there is no end to the mischief which ambition does, and whenever this desire to be great comes, it makes us unhappy and in the end ruins us. Then Mrs. Fairchild showed to her children how much God loves people who are lowly and humble, and she knelt by the bedside and prayed that God would take all desire to be great out of her little girl's heart. End of section 6《Section 7 of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kimberly Collins. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. The All Seeing God. I must tell you of a sad temptation into which Emily fell about this time. It is a sad story, but you shall hear it. There was a room in Mrs. Fairchild's house, which was not often used. In this room was a closet full of shelves, where Mrs. Fairchild used to keep her sugar and tea, and sweetmeats, and pickles, and many other things. Now, as Benny was very honest, and John too, Mrs. Fairchild would often leave this closet unlocked for weeks together, and never missed anything out of it. One day, at the time that damsons were ripe, Mrs. Fairchild and Betty boiled up a great many damsons in sugar to use in the winter, and when they had put them in jars and tied them down, they put them in the closet I before spoke of. Emily and Lucy saw their mother boil the damsons, and helped Betty to cover them and carry them to the closet. As Emily was carrying one of the jars, she perceived that it was tied down so loosely that she could put in her finger and get at the fruit. Accordingly, she took out one of the damsons and ate it. It was so nice that she was tempted to take another, and was going even to take a third, when she heard Betty coming up. She covered the jar in haste and came away. Some months after this, one evening, just about the time it was getting dark, she was passing by the room where these sweetmeats were kept, and she observed that the door was open. She looked around to see if anyone was near, but there was no one. Her parents and her brother and sister were in the parlor, and Betty was in the kitchen, and John in the garden. No eye was looking at her but the eye of God, who sees everything we do, and knows even the secret thoughts of the heart. But at that moment, the fear of God was not in the heart of Emily. Accordingly, she passed through the open door and went up to the closet. There she stood still again and looked round, but saw no one. She then opened the closet door and took two or three damsons, which she ate in great haste. She then went to her own room and washed her hands and her mouth, and went down into the parlor, where Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild were just going to tea. Although her parents never suspected any naughty thing Emily had been doing, and behaved just as usual to her, yet Emily felt frightened and uneasy before them, and every time they spoke to her, though it was only to ask the commonest questions, she stared and looked frightened. I am sorry to say that the next day, when it was beginning to get dark, 
Emily went again to the closet and took some more damsons, and so she did for several days, though she knew she was doing wrong. On the Sunday following, it happened to be so rainy that no one could go to church, in consequence of which Mr. Fairchild called all the family into the parlor and read the morning service and a sermon. Some sermons are hard and difficult for children to understand, but this was a very plain, easy sermon. Even Henry could tell Mama a great deal about it. The text was from Psalm 139, 7th to 12th verses. The meaning of these verses were explained in the sermon. It was first shown that the Lord is in spirit, and secondly, that there is no place where he is not, that if a person could go up into heaven, he would find God there. If he were to go down to hell, there also would he find God, that God is in every part of the earth, and of the sea, and of the sky, and that, being always present in every place, he knows everything we do, and everything we say, and even every thought of our heart, however secret we may think it. Then the sermon went on to show how foolish and mad it is for people to do wicked things in secret and dark places, trusting that God will not know of it. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me, for no night is dark unto God. While Mr. Fairchild was reading, Emily felt frightened and unhappy, thinking of the wickedness she was guilty of every day and she even thought that she would never be guilty again of the same sin but when the evening came all her good resolutions left her for she confided in her own strength and she went again to the room where the damsons were kept however when she came to the door of the closet she thought of the sermon which her father had read in the morning and stood still a few moments to consider what she should do there is no one in this room she said and no one sees me it is true but god is in this room he sees me his eye is upon me. I will not take any more damsons. I will go back, I think. But yet, as I am come so far, and am just got to a closet, I will just take one damson. It shall be the last. I will never come here again without Mamma's leave. So she opened the closet door, and took one damson, and then another, and then two more. While she was taking the last, she heard the cat mew. She did not know that the cat had followed her into the room, and she was so frightened that she spilled some of the red juice upon her frock, but she did not perceive it at the time. She then left the closet and went, as usual, to wash her hand and mouth, and went down into the parlor. When Emily got into the parlor, she immediately saw the red stain on her frock. She did not stay until it was observed, but ran out again instantly, and went upstairs and washed her frock. As the stain had not dried in, it came out with very little trouble, but not till Emily had wetted all the bosom of her frock and sleeves, and that so much that all her inner clothes were thoroughly wet, even to the skin. To hide this, she put her pinafore on to go down to tea. When she came down, Where have you been, Emily? said Mrs. Fairchild. We have almost done tea. I have been playing with the cat upstairs, Mamma, said Emily. But when she told this sad untruth, she felt very unhappy, and her complexion changed once or twice from red to pale. It was a very cold evening, and Emily kept as much away from the fire and candle as she could, lest any spots should be left in her frock, and her mother should see them. She had no opportunity, therefore, of drying or warming herself, and she soon began to feel quite chilled and trembling. Soon after, a burning heat came into the palms of her hand, and a soreness about her throat. However, she did not dare to complain, but sat till bedtime, getting every minute more and more uncomfortable. It was some time after she was in bed, and even after her parents came to bed, before she could sleep. At last she fell asleep, and her sleep was disturbed by dreadful dreams, such as she had never experienced before. It was her troubled conscience, together with an uneasy body, which gave her these dreadful dreams, and so horrible were they that at length she woke, screaming violently. Her parents heard her cry and came running in to her, bringing a light, but she was in such a terror that at first she did not know them. Oh, my dear, said Mrs. Fairchild, this child is in a burning fever. Only feel her hands. It was true indeed, and when Mr. Fairchild felt her, he was so much frightened that he resolved to watch by her all night, and in the morning, as soon as it was light, to send John for the doctor. But what do you suppose Emily felt all this time, knowing, as she did, how she had brought on this illness, and how she had deceived for many days this dear father and mother, who now gave up their own rest to attend to her? Emily continued to get worse during the night. Neither was the doctor able, when he came, to stop the fever which followed the severe chill she had taken, though he did his uttermost. It would have grieved you to have seen poor Lucy and Henry. They could neither hear nor play. They missed their dear sister so much, they continually said to each other, Oh, Emily, dear Emily, there is no pleasure without our dear Emily. The next day, when the doctor came, Emily was so very ill that he thought it right that Lucy and Henry should be sent out of the house. Accordingly, John got the horse ready and took them to Mr. Goodrich's. Poor Lucy and Henry, how bitterly they cried when they went out of the gate, thinking that perhaps they might never see their dear Emily any more. It was a terrible trial to poor Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild. They had no comfort but in praying and watching by poor Emily's bed. 
and all this grief Emily had brought upon her friends by her own naughtiness. Emily was exceedingly ill for nine days, and everyone feared that if the fever continued a few days longer, she must die, when, by the mercy of God, it suddenly left her, and she fell asleep and continued sleeping for many hours. When she awoke, she was very weak, but her fever was gone. She kissed her parents and wanted to tell them of the naughty things she had done, which had been the cause of the illness, but they would not allow her to speak. From that day, she got better, and at the end of another week was so well that she was able to sit up and tell Mrs. Fairchild all the history of her stealing the damsons, and of the sad way in which she had got the fever. Oh, mamma, said Emily, what a naughty girl I have been. What trouble have I given you, and to papa, and to the doctor, and to Betty? I thought that God would take no notice of my sin. I thought he did not see when I was stealing in the dark, but I was much mistaken. His eye was upon me all the time, and yet how good, how very good he has been to me. When I was ill, I might have died. And oh, mamma, mamma, how unhappy you would have been then. End of section 7. Section 8 of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Seek Wisdom. www.morethantheancients.com the Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood Chapter 8 Emily's Recovery and the Old Story of Mrs. Howard After Emily's fever was gone, she got rapidly better every day. Her kind mother never left her but sat by her bed and talked to her and provided everything which was likely to do her good. When she was well enough, Mr. Fairchild borrowed Farmer Jones' covered cart for two days, and he set out with Mrs. Fairchild and Emily to fetch Henry and Lucy from Mrs. Goodrich's. It was a lovely morning at the finest season of the year. The little birds were singing in the hedges, and the grass and leaves of the trees shone with the dew. When John drove the cart out of the garden gate and down the lane, Oh, said Emily, how sweet the honeysuckles and the wild roses smell in the hedges. There, Mama, are some young lambs playing in the fields by their mothers, and there is one quite white, not a spot about it. It turns its pretty face toward us. How mild and gentle it looks. Whilst they were talking, the cart had come alongside a wood which was exceedingly shady and beautiful. Many tufts of primroses, violets, and wood anemones grew on the banks by the wayside, and as the wind blew gently over these flowers, it brought a most delightful smell. What is that sound which I hear among the trees, said Emily? It is very sweet and soft. That is the cooing of the wood pigeons or doves, said Mr. Fairchild, and look, Emily, there they are. They are sitting upon the branch of the tree. There are two of them. Oh, I see them, said Emily. Oh, how soft and pretty they look. But now the noise of the cart has frightened them. They are flown away. By this time the cart had passed through the wood, and they were come inside of Mrs. Goodrich's white house standing in a little garden under a hill. Oh, Mama, Mama, said Emily, there is Mrs. Goodrich's house, and I shall see my dear Lucy and Henry in a very little time. Just as Emily spoke, they saw Lucy and Henry step out of the house door and come running towards the cart. It would have pleased you to the heart had you seen how rejoiced these dear children were to meet each other. Mr. Fairchild lifted Henry and Lucy into the cart, and they cried for joy when they put their arms around dear Emily's neck. Oh, Emily, Emily, said Henry, if you had died, I never would have played again. God be praised, said Mr. Fairchild. Our dear Emily has been spared to us. When the cart came up to Mrs. Goodrich's garden gate, the good old lady came to receive Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild and to kiss Emily, and Suki peeped out of the kitchen window, not less pleased than her mistress to see Emily in good health. Whilst Suki was getting the dinner, Emily and her brother and sister went to play in the garden. Henry showed Emily some rabbits which Mrs. Goodrich had, and some young ducks which had been hatched a few days before, with many other pretty things. When dinner was ready, Mrs. Fairchild called the children in, and they all sat down full of joy to eat roast fowl and some boiled bacon with a nice cold currant and raspberry pie. After dinner, Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild and Mrs. Goodrich with the children walked as far as the wood where Emily had seen the doves to gather strawberries, which they mixed with some cream and sugar at night for their supper. The next morning after breakfast, Mr. Fairchild went out to take a walk. Then Mrs. Goodrich called the three children to her and said, Now, my dear children, I will tell you a story. Come, sit round me upon these little stools and hearken. The children were very much pleased when they heard Mrs. Goodrich say she would tell them a story, for Mrs. Goodrich could tell a great many pretty stories. The Old Story of Mrs. Howard about fifty years ago, said Mrs. Goodrich, a little lady named Mrs. Howard lived in this house with her maid Betty. She had an old horse called Crop, which grazed in that meadow and carried Betty to market once a week. Mrs. Howard was one of the kindest and most good-natured old ladies in England. Three or four times every year, Betty had orders, when she went to market, to bring all manner of playthings and little books from the toy shop. These playthings and pretty little books Mrs. Howard used to keep by her till she saw any children whom she thought worthy of them. But she never gave any playthings to children who did not obey their parents or who were rude or ill-mannered, for she would say, It is a great sin in the eyes of God for children to be rude and unmannerly. 
All the children in the neighborhood used from time to time to visit Mrs. Howard, and those who wished to be obliging never came away without some pretty plaything or book. At that time, there were in this country two families of the name of Cartwright and Bennett, the former much loved by the neighbors on account of their good qualities, the latter as much disliked for their bad ones. Mr. Bennett was a rich farmer and lived in a good old house, with everything handsome and plentiful about him, but nobody cared to go near him or to visit his wife because their manners were so rough and disobliging, and their two children, Master Jackie and Miss Polly, were brought up only to please themselves and to care for nobody else. But on the contrary, Mr. and Mrs. Cartwright made their house so agreeable by their civil and courteous manners that high and low, rich and poor, loved to go there, and Master Billy and Miss Patty Cartwright were spoken well of throughout the whole neighborhood for their pretty and modest behavior. It happened once upon a time that Betty went down at the end of the Midsummer Fair and brought some of the prettiest toys and books which had been seen in this country for a long time. Amongst these was a jointed doll with flaxen hair and a history of the Bible full of colored pictures exceedingly pretty. Soon after Betty brought these things home, Mrs. Howard said to her, Betty, you must make a cake and put some plums in it and a large apple pie and some custards and cheesecakes and we will invite Master and Miss Cartwright and Master Bennett and his sister Miss Polly and some other children to spend a day with us. And before they go home, we will give those who have behaved well during the day some of those pretty toys which you bought from the Midsummer Fair. Accordingly, Betty made the cake and the cheesecakes and custards and the large apple pie, and Mrs. Howard sent to invite Master and Miss Cartwright and Master Bennett and his sister to spend the next day with her. In those days, little Misses did not wear muslin or linen frocks, which, when they were dirty, may easily be washed and made clean again, but they wore stiff silk and satin slips with lace or gauze ruffles and bibs and aprons and little round caps with artificial flowers. Children were then taught to be very careful never to dirty their best clothes and to fold them up very smooth when they pulled them off. When Mrs. Bennett received Mrs. Howard's invitation for her children, she called them to her and said, My dears, you are to go tomorrow to see Mrs. Howard, and I have been told that she has by her some very pretty toys, which she means to give away to those children who please her best. You have seen the gilt coach and four which she gave last year to Miss Cartwright, and the little watch which Master Cartwright received from her last Christmas, and why should not you also have some of these fine toys? Only try to please the old lady tomorrow, and I dare say she will give you some, for I am sure you are quite as good as Master and Miss Cartwright, though you are not quite so sly. Oh, said Master Bennet, I should like to get the toys if it was only to triumph over Master Cartwright. But what must we do to please Mrs. Howard? Why, said Mrs. Bennet, when your best things are put on tomorrow, you must take care not to rumple or soil them before you appear in Mrs. Howard's presence. And when you come into her parlor, you must stop at the door and bow low and curtsy. And when you are desired to sit down, you must sit still till dinner is brought in. And when dinner is ready, you must stand up and say grace before you eat. And you must take whatever is offered you without saying, I will have this and I will have that as you do at home. Mrs. Bennet gave her children a great many other rules for their behavior in Mrs. Howard's presence, which I have not time to repeat now, said Mrs. Goodrich, all of which Master Jackie and Miss Polly promised to remember, for they were very desirous to get the playthings. And now I will tell you what Mrs. Cartwright said to her children when she got Mrs. Howard's invitation. She called them to her and said, Here, Billy, here, Patty, is a note from Mrs. Howard to invite you to spend the day with her tomorrow. And I am glad of it because I know you love to go to Mrs. Howard's. She is so good to all children and has been particularly kind to you. I hear she has some pretty playthings by her now to give away, but don't you be greedy of them, my dears. You have a variety of playthings, you know, more than most children have, and it does not become anyone to be covetous. And remember, my children, to behave civilly and politely to everybody. And now I will tell you how these children behaved. About eleven o'clock, Mrs. Cartwright had her two children dressed in their best and sent them with the maidservant to Mrs. Howard's. As they were walking quietly over a cornfield through which they must needs pass, they saw Master and Miss Bennet with their servant sitting on a stile at the farther end of the field. Oh, said Miss Patty, there are Master and Miss Bennet on the way, I suppose, to Mrs. Howard's. I am sorry we have met with them. I am afraid they will get us into some mischief. Why should you say so, said Master Cartwright? Let us speak of things as we may find them. When Master and Miss Cartwright came near the stile, Master Bennet called to them. What a long time you have been coming over the field. We have been waiting for you this half hour, he said he. Come now, let us join company. I suppose that you are going as we are to Mrs. Howard's. Master Cartwright answered civilly, and all the children, with the two servants, got over the stile and went down a pretty lane which was beyond. The children walked on quietly till they came to a duck pond, partly overgrown with weeds, which was at the farther end of the lane. When they came near to this, Master Bennet whispered to his sister, I'll see now if I can't spoil Miss Patty's smart silk slip. Do, Jack, answered Miss Polly. Master Bennet then, winking at his sister, went up to the pond and pulling up some of the weeds, which were all wet and muddy, he threw them at Miss Cartwright's slips, saying at the same time, There, Miss, is a present for you. 
But as it happened, Miss Cartwright saw the weeds coming and caught them in her hand and threw them from her. Upon this, Master Bennet was going to pluck more weeds, but Mr. Cartwright's maidservant held his hands whilst little Billy and his sister ran forwards to Mrs. Howard's house, which was just in sight as fast as their feet would carry them. There now, said Miss Polly, those spiteful children have gone to tell Mrs. Howard what you have done, brother, and we shall not get any toys. You are always in mischief, that you are. I am sure you told me to throw the weeds, answered Master Bennet. I'm sure I did not, said Miss Polly. But you knew that I was going to do it, said he. But I did not, said she. But you did, for I told you, said he. In this manner, this brother and sister went on scolding each other till they came to Mrs. Howard's gate. There Miss Polly smoothed her apron, and Master Jackie combed his hair with his pocket comb, and they walked hand in hand into Mrs. Howard's parlor as if nothing had happened. They made a low bow and curtsy at the door as their mamma had bidden them, and Miss Howard received them very kindly, for Master and Miss Cartwright had not mentioned a word of their ill behavior on the road. Besides Master and Miss Cartwright, there were several other children sitting in Mrs. Howard's parlor, waiting till dinner should be set on the table. My mother was there, said Mrs. Goodrich. She was then a very little girl, and your grandmother and great uncle, both young ones, with many others now dead and gone. In one corner of the parlor was a cupboard with glass doors, where Mrs. Howard had placed such of those pretty toys as I before spoke of, which she meant to give away in the afternoon. The prettiest of these was the jointed doll, neatly dressed in a green satin slip and gauze apron and bib. By the time Master and Miss Bennet had made their bow and curtsy and were seated, Betty came in with the dinner and Mrs. Howard called the children to table. Master and Miss Bennet, seeing the beautiful toys before them through the glass doors of the cupboard, did not forget to behave themselves well at the table. They said grace and ate such things as were offered them, and Mrs. Howard, who noticed their good behavior, began to hope that Farmer Bennet's children were becoming better. After the children had got their dinner, it being a very pleasant afternoon, Mrs. Howard gave them leave to play in the garden and in the little croft where she kept her old horse crop. But take care, my dears, she said to the little girls, not to soil your slips or tear your aprons. The children were much pleased with his permission to play, and after they were gone out, Mrs. Howard put on her hood and cloak and said to Betty, I shall drink tea, Betty, in my bower at the end of the grass walk. Do you bring my little tea table there, and the strawberries and cream, and the cake which you made yesterday? And when we have finished our tea, bring those toys which are in the glass cupboard to divide amongst the children. And I think, madam, said Betty, that Master and Miss Bennet will gain some of them today, for I thought they behaved very well at dinner. Indeed, Betty, said Mrs. Mrs. Howard, I must say I never saw them behave so mannerly as they did at dinner, and if they do but keep it up till night, I shall not send them home without some pretty present, I assure you. When Mrs. Howard had given her orders to Betty, she took her gold-headed stick in her hand and went down the grass walk to her bower. It was a pretty bower, as I have heard my mother say, formed of honeysuckles and other creeping shrubs nailed over a framework of lath in the old-fashioned way. It stood just at the end of that long green walk and at the corner of the field, so that anyone sitting at that bower might see through the lattice work and foliage of the honeysuckles into the field and hear all that was said. There good Mrs. Howard sat knitting, for she prepared stockings for most of the poor children in the neighborhood, whilst her little visitors played in the garden and in the field, and Betty came to and fro with a tea table and tea things. Whilst the children were all engaged with their sports in the cross, a poor old man who had been gathering sticks came by that way, bending under the weight of the load. When he appeared, the children ceased from their play and stood looking at him. Poor man, said Miss Patty Cartwright. Those sticks are too heavy for you to carry. Have you far to go? No, my pretty miss, said the old man, only a very little way. I cannot help to carry your sticks, said Master Cartwright, because I have my best coat on. I could take off that to be sure, but then my other things would be spoiled. But I have got a penny here if you would please to accept it. So saying, he forced the penny into the poor man's hand. In the meantime, Master Bennet went behind the old man, and giving the sticks a sly pull, the string that tied them together broke, and they all came tumbling on the ground. The children screamed, but nobody was hurt. Oh, my sticks, said the poor man, the string is broke. What shall I do to gather them together again? I have been all day making this little fogget. We will help you, said Master Cartwright. We can gather your sticks together without fear of hurting our clothes. So all the little ones set to work, excepting Master and Mrs. Bennet, who stood by laughing, and in a little while they made up the poor man's bundle of sticks again, and such as had a penny in their pockets gave it him. Miss Patty Cartwright had not a penny, but she had a silver sixpence, which she gave to the old man, and ran before him to open the gate which led out of the field, wishing him good night, and curtsying to him as civilly as if he had been the first lord of the land. Now the children never suspected that Mrs. Howard had heard and seen all this, or else Master and Miss Bennet, I am sure, would not have behaved as they did. They thought Mrs. Howard was in the parlor where they had left her. By this time, everything was ready for tea, and the cake set upon the table with the strawberries and cream. And now, Betty, said Mrs. Howard, you may call the children and be sure when tea is over to bring the toys. Master and Miss Bennet looked as demure when they came in to tea as they had done at dinner, and a stranger would have thought them as well-behaved children as Master and Miss Cartwright. But children who behave well in the sight of their parents or in company, and rudely or impertinently in private or among servants or their playfellows, cannot be called well-bred. 
After the young people had had their tea and cake and strawberries and cream, Betty came with the playthings and placed them on the table before Mrs. Howard. You would perhaps like to know what those playthings were. First of all was the jointed doll, dressed as I before said in a green satin slip and a gauze bib and apron and round cap according to the fashion of those days. Then there was the history of the Bible with colored pictures. Then came a little chest of drawers for doll's clothes, a doll's wicker cradle, a bat and ball, a red Morocco pocketbook, a needle book, and the history of King Pepin bound in gilt. These beautiful books and toys were placed on the table before Mrs. Howard, and the little ones waited in silence to see what she would do with them. Mrs. Howard looked first at the playthings and then at the children, and thus she spoke. My dear children, I sent for these pretty toys from the fair in order to encourage you to be good. There is nothing that gives me greater pleasure than to see children polite and mannerly, endeavoring to please everybody, and honor preferring one another as God hath commanded us to do. Pride and ill manners, my dear children, are great faults. But humility and a wish to please everyone rather than ourselves make us resemble the blessed Lord Jesus Christ, who did not despise the poorest among men. Many persons are polite and good-mannered when company with their betters, because if they were not so, people would have nothing to say to them. But really well-behaved persons are courteous and civil, not only when they are among their betters, but when they are with servants or with poor people. Then Mrs. Howard took the jointed doll and the history of the Bible and gave the one to Miss Patty Cartwright and the other to Master Billy, saying, I give you these, my children, because I observed your good manners, not only to me, but to the poor old man who passed through the croft with his bundle of sticks. To you, Master Bennet, and to you, Miss Polly, I shall not give anything, because you showed by your behavior to the old man that your good manners were all an outside garb which you put on and off like your Sunday clothes. Then Mrs. Howard gave the rest of the toys amongst the lesser children, commending them for helping the old man to gather his sticks together, and thus she dismissed them to their own houses, all of them, except Master Jackie and Miss Polly jumping and skipping for joy. When Mrs. Goodrich had finished her story, Lucy said, What a pretty story that is. I think Master and Miss Cartwright deserve those pretty toys. They were nice children, but I did not know that having rude manners was so very great a fault. If you will think a minute, my dear, said Mrs. Goodrich, you will find that rude manners must be one sign of badness of heart. A person who has always a lowly opinion of himself and proper love for his neighbor will never be guilty of rudeness. It is only when we think ourselves better than others, or of more consequence than they are, that we venture to be rude. I have heard you say how rude Miss Augusta Noble was the last time you were at her house. Now why was she rude, but because she thought herself better than her company? This is pride, and a great sin it is. End of section 8「Good evening and thanking her for her kindness, they returned home. The next morning, Mr. Fairchild got up early and went down to the village. Breakfast was ready, and Mrs. Fairchild and the children waiting at the table when he came back. Get your breakfast, my dear, said he to Mrs. Fairchild. Don't wait for me. So saying, he went into his study and shut the door. Mrs. Fairchild, supposing that he had some letters to write, got her breakfast quietly, after which she sent Lucy to ask her father if he would not choose any breakfast. When Mr. Fairchild heard Lucy's voice at the study door, he came out and followed her into the parlour. When Mrs. Fairchild looked at her husband's face, she saw that something had grieved him very much. She was frightened and said, My dear, I'm sure something is the matter. What is it? Tell me the worst at once. Pray do! Indeed, my dear, said Mr. Fairchild, I have heard something this morning which has shocked me dreadfully. I was not willing to tell you before you had breakfasted. I know what you will feel when you hear it. Do tell me, said Mrs. Fairchild, turning quite white. Poor Augusta Noble, said Mr. Fairchild. What, Papa? said Lucy and Emily and Henry in one voice. She is dead, exclaimed Mr. Fairchild. The children turned as pale as their mother, and poor Mrs. Fairchild nearly fainted. "'Oh, poor Lady Noble! Poor Lady Noble!' said she as soon as she could speak. "'Poor Lady Noble! 
Whilst the children were crying over the sad news, Mrs. Barker came into the parlour. Mrs. Barker was a kind woman, and, as she lived by herself, was always at liberty to go amongst her neighbours in times of trouble. Ah, oh, Mrs. Fairchild, she said, I know what troubles you. We were all in grief through the whole village. What was the cause of the poor child's death? asked Mrs. Fairchild. I never heard that she was ill. Ah, oh, Mrs. Fairchild, the manner of her death is the worst part of the story, and that which must grieve her parents more than all. You know that poor Miss Augusta was always the darling of her mother, who brought her up in great pride, and she chose a foolish governess for her who had no good influence upon her. I never thought much of Miss Beaumont, said Mrs. Fairchild. As Miss Augusta was brought up without the fear of God, continued Mrs. Barker, she had, of course, no notion of obedience to her parents, further than just trying to please them in their presence. She lived in the constant practice of disobeying them, and the governess continually concealed her disobedience from Lady Noble. And what is the consequence? The poor child has lost her life, and Miss Beaumont is turned out of doors in disgrace. But, said Mrs. Fairchild, how did she lose her life through disobedience to her parents? Pray tell me, Mrs. Barker. The story is so sad I hardly like to tell it to you, answered Mrs. Barker. But you must know it sooner or later. Miss Augusta had a custom of playing with fire and carrying candles about. Though Lady Noble had often warned her of the danger of this habit and strictly charged her governess to prevent it. But it seems that the governess, being afraid of offending, had suffered her very often to be guilty of this piece of disobedience without telling Lady Noble. And the night before last, when Lady Noble was playing at cards in the drawing room with some visitors, Miss Augusta took a candle off the hall table and carried it upstairs to the governess's room. No one was there, and it's supposed that Miss Augusta was looking in the glass with a candle in her hand when the flame caught her dress. But this is not known. Lady Noble's maid, who was in the next room, was alarmed by her dreadful screams, and hastening to discover the cause, found poor Augusta in a blaze from head to foot, the unhappy young lady was so dreadfully burnt that she never spoke afterwards, but died in agonies last night. When Mrs. Fairchild and the children heard this dreadful story, they were very much grieved. Mrs. Barker stayed with them all day, and it was, indeed, a day of mourning through all the house. End of section 9《セクション・テン・オフ・ザ・フェイ・チャイルド・ファミリー》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bernard Yom.《The Fair Child Family》by Mary Martha Sherwood. The Two Books. It was the time of the Midsummer Fair, and John asked Mr. Fairchild's leave to go to the fair. You may go, John, said Mr. Fairchild. And take the horse and bring everything that is wanting in the family. So John got the horse ready and set out early in the morning to go to the fair. But before he went, Emily and Lucy gave him what money they had and begged him to bring them each a book. Emily gave him two pence and Lucy gave him three pence. You must please choose a book for me with pictures in it, said Emily. I do not care about pictures, said Lucy, if it's a pretty book, so pray don't forget, John. In the evening after tea, the children and their father and mother, as usual, got ready to take a walk, and the children begged Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild to go with them to meet John. For John, said Henry, will be coming back now, and will have brought us some pretty books. So Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild took the road which led towards the town where the fair was held, and the children ran before them. It was a fine evening, the hedges were full of wild roses, which smelt most sweet. And the haymakers were making hay in the fields on each side of the road. I cannot think where John can be, said Henry. I thought he would be here long before now. By this time they were come to the brow of a rising ground, and looking before them, behold, there was John at a distance. The children all ran forward to meet him. Where are the books, John? Oh, where are the books? they all said with one voice. John, who was a very good natured man, as I have before said, smiled, and stopping his horse, began to feel in his pockets, and soon brought out, from among other things, two little gilt books. 
the largest of which he gave to Lucy, and the other to Emily, saying, Here is two pennyworth, and here is three pennyworth. Indeed, John, you are very good, said the children. What beautiful books! My book, said Emily, is the history of the orphan boy, and there are a great many pictures in it. The first is a picture of a funeral. That must be the funeral of the poor little boy's papa and mamma, I suppose. Let me see, let me see, said Henry. Oh, how pretty! And what's your book, Lucy? There are not many pictures in my book, said Lucy, but there is one at the beginning. It is the picture of a little boy reading to somebody lying in a bed, and there is a lady sitting by. The name of my book is The History of Little Henry, or The Good Son. Oh, that must be very pretty, said Henry. By this time, Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild would come up. Oh, Papa, oh, Mamma, said the little ones, what beautiful books John has brought. Indeed, said Mr. Fairchild, when he had looked at them a little while. They appear to be very nice books, and the pictures in them are very pretty. Henry shall read them to us, my dears, said Mrs. Fairchild, whilst we sit at work. I should like to hear them very much. Tomorrow, said Mr. Fairchild, looking at his wife, we begin to make hay in the primrose meadow. What do you say? Shall we go after breakfast, and take a cold dinner with us, and spend the day under the trees at the corner of the meadow? Then we can watch the haymakers, and Henry can read the books while you and his sisters are sewing. Oh, do let us go, do let us go, said the children. Do, Mamma, say yes. With all my heart, my dears, said Mrs. Fairchild. The next morning early the children got everything ready to go into the primrose meadow. They had each of them a little basket with a lid to it, in which they packed up their work and the new books, and as soon as the family had breakfasted, they all set out for the primrose meadow. Mr. Fairchild, with a book in his pocket for his own reading, Mrs. Fairchild, with her work bag hanging on her arm, Betty, with a basket of bread and meat and a cold fruit pie, and the children with their work baskets and Emily's doll, for the little girls seldom went out without their doll. The Primrose Meadow was not a quarter of a mile from Mr. Fairchild's house. You had only the corner of a little copse to pass through before you were in it. It was called the Primrose Meadow because every spring the first primroses in the neighbourhood appeared on a sunny bank in that meadow. A little brook of very clear water ran through the meadow, rippling over the pebbles, and there were many alders growing by the waterside. The people were very busy making hay in the meadow when Mr. Fairchild and his family arrived. Mrs. Fairchild sat down under the shade of a large oak tree which grew in the corner of the coppice, and Lucy and Henry, with Emily, placed themselves by her. The little girls pulled out their work, and Henry the new books. Mr. Fairchild took his book a little distance that he might not be disturbed by Henry's reading, and he stretched himself upon a green bank. Now, Mamma, said Henry, are you ready to hear my story? And have you done fidgeting, sisters? for Lucy and Emily had been bustling to make a bed for their doll in the grass with their pocket handkerchiefs. Brother, answered Lucy, we are quite ready to hear you. Read away. There is nothing now to disturb you, unless you find fault with the little birds who are chirping with all their might in those trees, and those bees which are buzzing amongst the flowers in the grass. First, said Henry, look at the picture at the beginning of the book, the picture of the funeral going through the churchyard. Let me see, brother, said Emily. Why, you have seen it several times, said Henry, and now I want to read. Still, my dear, said Mrs. Fairchild, you might oblige your sister. Good manners and civility make everybody lovely. Have you forgotten Mrs. Goodrich's story of Master Bennet? Henry immediately got up and showed his sister the picture, after which he sat down and began to read the story in Emily's book. End of section 10《セクション11 of the Fairchild Family》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bernard de Jong《The Fairchild Family》by Mary Martha Sherwood《The History of the Orphan Boy》In a little flowery valley near Tenterden, there lived once a certain farmer who had a wife and one little boy whose name was Martin. The farmer and his wife were people who feared God and loved their neighbours, and though they were not rich, they were contented. In the same parish lived two gentlemen, named Squire Broom and Squire Blake, as the country people called them. 
Squire Broom was a man who feared God, but Squire Blake was one of those men who cared for nothing beyond the things of this world. He was a very rich man, and was considered by the neighbours to be good-tempered. His lady kept a plentiful house, and was glad to see anyone who came. They had no children, and as they had been married many years, it was thought they never would have any. Squire Broom was not so rich as Squire Blake, and though a very worthy man, was not of such pleasing manners, so that many people did not like him, though in times of distress he was one of the kindest friends in the world. Squire Broom had a very large family, which he brought up in an orderly, pious manner, but some of the neighbours did not fail to find fault with him for being too strict with his children. When little Martin was about three years of age, his father was killed as he was going to Tainted and Markant by a fall from his horse. This was so great a grief to his mother, who loved her husband very dearly, that she fell immediately into a bad state of health, and though she lived as much as two years after her husband, yet she was all that time a dying woman. There was nothing in the thoughts of death which made this poor woman unhappy at any time, excepting when she considered that she must leave her little Martin to strangers, and this grieved her the more because little Martin was a very tender child, and had always been so from his birth. It happened a few weeks before her death, as little Martin's mother was lying on her couch, that one Mrs. Short, who lived in Tenterden, and spent her time in gossiping from house to house, came bustling into the room where Martin's mother lay. "'I am come to tell you,' said she, "'that Squire Blake's lady will be here just now.' "'It is some time since I have seen Mrs. Blake,' said Martin's mother, "'but it is kind of her to visit me in my trouble.' Whilst she was speaking, Mr. Blake's carriage came up to the door, and Mrs. Blake stepped out. She came into the parlour in a very free and friendly manner, and, taking Martin's mother by the hand, she said she was very sorry to see her looking so ill. Indeed, said the sick woman, I am very ill, dear madam, and I think that I cannot live longer than a few weeks. But God's will be done. I have no trouble in leaving this world but on account of little Martin, yet I know that God will take care of him, and that I ought not to be troubled on his account. Mrs. Blake then answered, as you have begun to speak upon the subject, I will tell you what particularly brought me here today. She then told her, as she and Mr. Blake had a large fortune and no family, they were willing to take little Martin at her death and provide for him as their own. This was a very great and kind offer, and most people would have accepted it with joy. But the pious mother recollected that Mr. Blake was one who declared himself to be without religion, and she could not think of leaving her little boy to such a man. Accordingly, she thanked Mrs. Blake for her kind offer, for a very kind offer it was, and said that she should feel obliged to her till her dying moment. But, added she, I cannot accept of your friendship for my little boy, as I have a very dear friend who would be disobliged if I did so. Mrs. Blake turned red and was offended, for she had never once thought it possible that Martin's mother should refuse her offer, and Mrs. Short lifted up her hands and eyes, and looked as if she thought the poor sick woman little better than a fool. Well, said Mrs. Blake, I am surprised, I must confess. However, you must know your own affairs best, but this I must say, that I think Martin may live long enough without having such another offer. And I must say that you are standing in the child's way, said Mrs. Short. Why, Mr. Blake can do ten times more for the child than his father could have done, had he lived a hundred years and I think it very ungrateful and foolish in you to make such a return for Mr. and Mrs. Blake's kindness. And pray, said Mrs. Blake, who is this dear friend who would be so much disobliged by your allowing us to take the boy? I suppose it is Squire Broom, said Mrs. Short, for who else can it be? Yes, said Mrs. Blake, I have no doubt it is, for Mr. Broom never loved my husband. But, added she, looking at Martin's mother, you do very wrong if you think Mr. Broom could do as much for the child even if he were willing, as my husband. Mr. Broom is not rich, and he has a great many children, whereas Mr. Blake has a very handsome fortune, and no near relation in the world. However, as you have once refused, I do not think I would take the boy now, even if you were to ask me. I am very sorry, answered Martin's mother, to appear unthankful to you, and perhaps, as I am a dying woman, I ought to tell you the true reason of my refusing your offer, though it may make you very angry. I do not doubt but that you would be kind to little Martin, and I know that you have more to give him than his father could have had. 
She then, in a very delicate manner, hinted at Mr. Blake's irreligious opinions and acknowledged that it was on the account of these that she had refused his protection for her son. The Lord Jesus Christ, added she, is the dear friend I spoke of, my dear madam, and the one I am afraid to offend by accepting Mr. Blake's offer. You are welcome to tell Mr. Blake all I say. Mrs. Blake made no answer, but got up, and wishing Martin's mother and Mrs. Short a good morning, went away very much offended. When Mrs. Short was left with the sick woman, she failed not to speak her mind to her, and that very plainly by telling her that she considered her little better than a fool for what she had done. Martin's mother answered, I am willing to be counted a fool for Christ's sake. The next day, Martin's mother sent for Squire Broom, and when she had told him all that had passed between herself and Mrs. Blake, she asked him if he would take charge of poor little Martin when she was dead, and also of what little money she might leave behind her, and see that the child was put to a good school. Squire Broom promised that he would be a friend to the boy, to the best of his power, and Martin's mother was sure that he would do what he promised, for he was a good man. And now, not to make our story too long, I must tell you that Martin's mother grew weaker and weaker, and about three weeks after she had this conversation with Mrs. Blake, she was found one morning dead in her bed, and it was supposed she died without pain. As Susan, the maid who slept in the same room, had not heard her move or utter a sigh, she was buried in Tenterden churchyard, and Squire Broom, as he had promised, took charge of all her affairs. And now, after having done with little Martin's good mother, I shall give you the history of the little boy himself, from the day when he was awoke and found his poor mother dead, and you shall judge whether God heard his mother's prayer and whether he took care of the poor little orphan. Martin's mother was buried on the Saturday evening. On Sunday, little Martin went and stood by his mother's grave, and no one but Susan could persuade him to come away. On Monday morning, Squire Broom came in a one-horse chase to take him to school at Ashford, the master of the school at the time was a conscientious man, but Squire Broom did not know that he was so severe in the management of children as he proved to be. Little Martin cried very much when he was put in the one-horse chase with Squire Broom. Oh, let me stay with Susan. Let me live with Susan, he said. What? said Squire Broom, and never learn to read? You must go to school to learn to read, and other things a man should know. Susan shall teach me to read, said Little Martin. Squire Broom promised him that he should come back in the summer and see Susan, and little Martin tried to stop crying. When little Martin got to Ashford School, he was turned into a large stone hall where about fifty boys were playing. He had never seen so many boys before, and he was frightened, and he crept into a corner. They all got around him and asked him a great many questions, which frightened him more, and he began to cry and call for Susan. This set the boys a-laughing, and they began to pull him about and tease him. Little Martin was a pretty child. He was very fair, and had beautiful blue eyes and red lips, and his dark brown hair curled all over his head. But he had always been a very tender in his health, and the kickings and thumpings and beatings he got amongst the boys, instead of making him hardy, made him the more sickly and drooping. The boys used to rise very early, and after they had been an hour in the school, they played in the churchyard for the schoolroom stands in the churchyard, till the bell rang to call them to breakfast. In the schoolroom there was only one fireplace, and the lesser boys would never get near it, so that little Martin used to be so numbed with cold in the mornings, for winter was coming, that he could scarcely hold his book, and his feet and hands became so swelled with chilblains that when the other boys went out to play, he could only creep after them. He was so stupefied with cold that he could not learn. He even forgot his letters, though he had known them all when his mother was alive, and in consequence he got several floggings. When his mother was living, he was a cheerful little fellow, full of play and quick in learning, but now he became so dull and cast down, and he refused to eat, and he would cry and fret if anyone did but touch him. His poor little feet and hands were sore and bleeding with cold, so that he was afraid anyone should come near to touch him. As the winter advanced, it became colder and colder, and little Martin got a very bad cough, and grew very thin. Several people remarked to the schoolmaster, Little Martin is not well, he gets very thin. Oh, he will be better, the master would answer, when he is more used to us. Many children, when they first come to school, pine after home. But what can I do for him? I must not make any difference between him and the other boys. 
One morning, in the beginning of December, when the boys were playing in the churchyard before breakfast, little Martin, not being able to run or scarcely to walk by reason of his chilblains, came creeping after them. His lips were blue and cold, and his cheeks white. He looked about for some place where he might be sheltered a little from the cold wind, and at length he ventured to creep into the porch of an old house which stood on the side of the churchyard. The door of the house was open a little way, and Martin peeped in. He saw within a small neat kitchen, where was a bright fire. An elderly maidservant was preparing a breakfast before the fire. The tea kettle was boiling, and the toast and butter and muffins stood ready to be carried into the parlour. A large old cat slept before the fire, and in one corner of the kitchen was a parrot upon a stand. Whilst Martin was peeping in and longing for a bit of toast and butter, a little old lady, dressed in a grey silk gown, wearing a mob cap and long ruffles, came into the kitchen by the inner door. She first spoke to the parrot, then stroked the cat, and then, turning towards the porch door, she said, speaking to the maid, Hannah, why do you leave the door open? The wind comes in very cold. So saying, she was going to push the door too when she saw poor little Martin. She observed his black coat, his little bleeding hands and his pale face, and she felt very sorry for him. What little fellow are you? she said as she held the door in her hand. Where do you come from, and what do you want at my door? My name is Martin, he answered, and I am very cold. Do you belong to the school, my dear? said she. Yes, ma'am, he answered. My mother is dead, and I am very cold. Poor little creature, said the old lady, whose name was Lovell. Do you hear what he says, Hannah? His mother is dead, and he is very cold. Do, Hannah, run over to the schoolhouse and ask the master if he will give this little boy leave to stay and breakfast with me. Hannah set down a teacup which she was wiping and looked at Martin. Poor young creature, she said. It is a pity that such a babe as this should be in a public school. Come in, little one whilst I run in over to your master and ask leave for you to stay a little with my mistress. Hannah soon returned with the master's leave, and poor little Martin went gladly upstairs into Mrs. Lovell's parlour. There Mrs. Lovell took off his wet shoes and damp stockings and hung them to the fire, while she rubbed his little numbed feet till they were warm. In the meantime Hannah brought up the tea things and toast and butter, and set all of the things in order upon the round table. "'You are very good,' said little Martin to Mrs. Lovell. I will come and see you every day. You shall come as often as you please, said Mrs. Lovell, if you are a good little boy. Then I will come at breakfast time, and at dinner time, and at supper time, said Martin. Mrs. Lovell smiled and looked at Hannah, who was bringing up the cream pot, followed by the cat. Puss took her place very gravely at one corner of the table, without touching anything. Is that your cat, ma'am? said Martin. Yes, said Mrs. Lovell, and see how well she behaves. She never asks for anything, but waits till she is served. Do you think you can behave as well? I will try, ma'am, said Martin. Mrs. Lovell then bade Martin to fetch himself a chair, and they both sat down to breakfast. Martin behaved so well at breakfast that Mrs. Lovell invited him to come to her at dinner time, and said she would send Hannah to his master for leave. She then put on his dry shoes and stockings, and as the bell rang, she sent him over to the school. When school broke up at twelve o'clock, she sent Hannah again for him, and he came running upstairs, full of joy. "'This is a half-holiday, ma'am,' he said, "'and I may stay with you till bedtime, and I will come again to breakfast in the morning.' "'Very well,' said Mrs. Lovell, "'but if you come here so often, you must do everything I bid you, and everything which Hannah bids you.' "'The same as I did my poor mother, and to Susan,' said Martin." Yes, my dear, said Mrs. Lovell. Then I will, ma'am, said Martin. So Martin sat down to dinner with Mrs. Lovell, and at dinner he told her all he knew of himself and his mother, and after dinner, when she gave him leave, he went down to the kitchen to visit Hannah, and to talk to the parrot, and to look about him till tea-time. At tea-time he came up again, and after tea Mrs. Lovell brought out a large Bible full of pictures, and told him one or two stories out of the Bible showing him the pictures. At night, Hannah carried him home, and he went warm and comfortable to bed. Mrs. Lovell grew every day fonder of little Martin, and as the little boy promised, he went to Mrs. Lovell's at breakfast, dinner, and supper, and Mrs. Lovell took the same care of him as his mother would have done, had she been living. She took charge of his clothes, mending them when they wanted it, prepared warm and soft woolen stockings for him, 
procured him a great coat to wear in school and got him some thick shoes to play in. She also would see that he learned his lessons well every day to carry up to his master. She then practiced him in reading out of school hours so that it was surprising how quickly he now got on with his books. But the best of all was that Mrs. Lovell from day to day gave such holy teaching to little Martin as was best adapted to make him a good man in afterlife. And God blessed her teaching, and the boy soon became all that she could desire. A little before Christmas, Squire Broom came over to Ashford to see little Martin, and determined in his own mind, if he saw the child unwell or not happy, to take him home and bring him up amongst his own children. For Mrs. Broom had said that she thought little Martin almost too young to be at a public school without a friend near him. Martin was standing in Mrs. Lovell's parlour window, which looked into the churchyard, when he saw Squire Broom's one-horse chase draw up in the schoolhouse door. Without speaking a word, he ran downstairs and across the churchyard, and taking Squire Broom's hand as he stepped out of the chase. "'I've got another mother, sir,' he said, "'a very good mother, and I love her with all my heart, and her name is Lovell, and you must come to see her.' "'Why, my little man,' said Squire Broom, "'you look very well, and quite fat.' When Squire Broom heard from the master what a kind friend Martin had found, and was told by all his friends in Ashford what a worthy woman Mrs. Lovell was, everybody in Ashford knew Mrs. Lovell's good character, he was very much pleased on little Martin's account, and said his poor mother's prayers were now answered. Little Martin could not be contented till he had brought Squire Broom to see Mrs. Lovell, and to drink tea with her. During this visit, Mrs. Lovell asked Mr. Broom if Martin might spend his Christmas holidays with her, and from that time, the little boy spent all his holidays with Mrs. Lovell. In the summer holidays, she often took him to a farmhouse in the country, where she had lodgings, and there he had the pleasure of seeing the haymaking and hop-gathering and all the country work and of running about in the field. Once or twice, she took him to Tenterden to see his old friends, particularly Susan, who lived with her mother in Tenterden. Martin became a fine boy, and as he grew in stature, he grew in grace. He was very fond of reading, and soon he became one of the best scholars of his age in the school. As Mrs. Lovell got older, her eyes became dim, and then Martin read to her, and managed her accounts, and was in all things as a dutiful son to her. Martin continued with Mrs. Lovell till it was time he should leave school and as he wished to become a clergyman in order that he might spend his life in the service of God, Mrs. Lovell paid for his going to the university. When Martin had been the proper time at university, he was ordained a clergyman, and he then returned to Mrs. Lovell, and soon afterwards he got a living in a pretty village in Kent. There he went to reside, and Mrs. Lovell, who was now become very old indeed, lived with him. He was as kind to her and to Hannah as if he had been their own child, and indeed, it was but his duty to be so. He did everything to make their last years happy, and their deaths easy. Mrs. Lovell left all she had when she died to Martin, so that he was enabled to live in great comfort. Some time after Mrs. Lovell's death, he married Squire Broom's youngest daughter, who made him a kind and good wife, and helped him to bring up their children well. Susan, who was now an elderly woman, took the place of Hannah when Hannah died, and never left her master till she herself died of old age. By this time it was one o'clock, and the haymakers left off their work, and sat down in a row by the brookside to eat their dinner. Mr. Fairchild called to his children from the place where he was lying at a little distance, saying, My dears, I begin to feel hungry. Lucy and Emily, see what Betty brought in the basket this morning, and you, Henry, go to the brook and bring some water. So Henry took an empty pitcher out of the basket and ran gaily down to the brook to fetch some water, whilst Lucy and Emily spread a clean napkin on the grass, on which they placed the knives and the forks and plates, with the loaf and cheese, and the fruit pie, and a bottle of beer for their papa, for Betty was gone back to the house, and when they had said grace, they dined, after which the children went to play in the coppice and amongst the hay for a little while. When they had played as much as their mamma thought fit, and they came back, and sat down to work as they had done in the morning, whilst Henry read the story in Lucy's book. End of section 11
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter O'Malley. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. The History of Little Henry, Part 1. Every person who lives in England has heard of France. A small arm of the sea parts this country from France. But, though a person may pass from England to France in a few hours, yet there is a great difference in the manners and customs of the French and English. A few years ago the French were governed by a king who had so much power that, if he did not like any person, he could condemn him to be shut up for life at his pleasure, and nobody dared to inquire after him. The religion of the French was, and still is, Roman Catholic. About 150 years ago, there lived in France a certain great man called the Baron of Bellamont. He was a proud man and very rich, and his castle stood in one of the beautiful valleys of the Pyrenees, not far from the dwelling places of those holy people, the Waldenses. What are Waldenses, Mama? said Henry. Why, my dear, answered Mrs. Fairchild, many hundred years ago, when many of the nations of Europe were very wicked, a certain set of persons retired from the sight of the rest of mankind and hid themselves in valleys amongst hills, where they led innocent and holy lives. These people, in some places, were called Waldenses, in others, Valdenses, and some were called the Poor Men of Lyons, because there was a city named Lyons near their dwelling places. The Baron de Bellamont, continued Henry reading again, lived in a castle not far from the valley of the Waldenses. He had one daughter of the name of Adelaide, who was very beautiful, and as she was to have much of her father's riches at his death, everybody flattered and seemed to admire her, and many rich and great men in France sought to marry her. The baron also had a poor niece living with him, named Maria. Maria was not handsome, and she was poor. Therefore, nobody who came to the castle took any notice of her, and her cousin, Adelaide, treated her more like a servant than a relation. Maria had been nursed among the Waldenses, and had learned, with God's blessing, all the holy doctrines of these people from her nurse. When Adelaide and Maria were about twenty years of age, they were both married. Adelaide was married to the young Marquis de Roseville, one of the handsomest and richest men in France, and went to live in Paris with her husband, where she was introduced to the court of the king and lived amongst the greatest and gayest people in France. "'Where is Paris, Mama? said Lucy. You know, my dear, answered Mrs. Fairchild, that London is the chief town of England and the residence of the Queen. In like manner, Paris is the chief town of France, and the Emperor of France's palace is in Paris. Maria's husband, continued Henry, was one of the pastors of the Waldenses, of the name of Claude. He lived in a small and neat cottage in a beautiful valley. He was a holy young man, and all his time and thoughts were given up to teaching his people and serving his God. Maria was much happier in her little cottage with her kind husband than she had been in the castle of the baron. She kept her house clean and assisted her husband in dressing their little garden and taking care of a few goats which afforded them abundance of milk. When the Martiness of Rosebill had been married twelve months, she brought the Marquise a son to whom her parents gave the name of Theodore. This child was so beautiful that he was spoken of in Paris as a wonder and his parents, who were very proud and vain before, became more and more so. All the Martinesses' love seemed to be fixed upon this child, so that when, at the end of two years more, she had a second son born, she showed no affection whatever for him. Although he was a lovely infant, not less beautiful than his brother, and of a tender and delicate constitution. When this little infant, who was called Henry, was little more than two months old, the Marquis and Martiness undertook a journey to the castle of Bellamont to visit the old baron, bringing their two sons with them. The fatigue of the journey was almost too much for poor little Henry, who, when he arrived at his grandfather's castle, was so ill that it was supposed he could not live. But his mother, having no love but for the eldest child, did not appear to be in the least troubled by Henry's sickness. As soon as Maria heard of her cousin's arrival at Bellamont, she hastened over to see her though she did not expect to be very kindly received. Maria, by this time, had two children, the youngest of which was more than a year old and a very healthy child. When this kind woman saw poor little Henry and found that his parents did not love him, she begged her cousin to allow her to take the poor infant to her cottage in the valleys, where she promised to take great care of him and to be as a tender mother to him. 
The partness was glad to be freed from the charge of the sick child, and Maria was equally glad to have the poor baby to comfort. Accordingly, she took the little Henry home with her, and he was brought up amongst her own children. When the Marquis and Martinez had remained a while at the castle of Bellemont, they returned with their favorite Theodore to Paris, and there they delivered themselves up to all the vicious habits of that dissipated place. The Martinez never stayed at home a single day, but spent her whole time in visiting, dancing, and playing at cards, and going to public gardens, plays, and musical entertainments. She painted her face and dressed herself in every kind of rich and vain ornament, and tried to set herself off for admiration. But she had little regard for her husband and never thought of God. She was bold in her manners, fond of herself, and hard-hearted to everybody else. The only person for whom she seemed to care was her son Theodore, for as for little Henry, she seemed to have forgotten that she had such a child but she delighted in seeing her handsome Theodore well-dressed and encouraged him to prattle before company and to showing himself off in public places. Even when he was but an infant, she employed the most famous artists in Paris to draw his picture. She hired dancing masters to teach him to carry himself well and music masters to teach him to sing and play. And sometimes, when he was to go out with her, she herself arranged his glossy hair in order that he might look the handsomer. She employed many servants to attend upon him, and commanded them never to contradict him, but do everything to please him. As she continued to lead this life, she became every year more and more bold, and more hardened in wickedness, so that from beginning to be careless about God, she proceeded in time to mock at religion. Nor was the Marquis any better than his wife. He was proud and quarrelsome, and loved no one but himself. He spent all his time amongst a set of wicked young men of his own rank, and they sat up all night drinking and swearing and playing at cards for large sums of money. In this manner, they went on till Theodore was as much as fifteen years of age. In the meantime, the old baron had died and left all his money to his daughter. But the Marquis and Martinez were none the better for all the riches left them by the baron, for they became more and more wasteful and more and more wicked. About this time, the king, who was a very wicked man, began to talk of driving the Waldenses out of their pleasant valleys or forcing them to become Roman Catholics. He consulted the great men in Paris about it, and they gave it as their opinion that it would be right either to make them become Roman Catholics or to drive them out of the country. The Marquis, among the rest, gave his opinion against the Waldenses, never considering that he had a relation amongst them, and that his little son Henry was at that very time living with them. Whilst these things were being talked of in the king's palace, Theodore had seized with a violent fever, and before anything could be done for him, or his father or mother had any time for consideration, the poor boy died. The Martinez was like a distracted woman when Theodore died. She screamed and tore at her hair, and the Marquis to drive away the thoughts of his grief, went more and more into company, drinking and playing at cards. When the grief of the Marquis and Martinez for the loss of their beautiful Theodore was a little abated, they began to turn their thoughts towards their son Henry, and they resolved to send for him. Accordingly, the Marquis sent a trusty servant to the Valley of Piedmont to bring Henry to Paris. The servant carried a letter from the Marquis to the pastor Claude, thanking him for his kind attention to the child and requesting him to send him immediately to Paris. The servant also carried a handsome sum of money as a present from the Marquis to Claude, which Claude, however, would not take. Whilst all of these things which I have been telling you were happening in Paris, little Henry had been growing up in the humble yet pleasant cottage of Maria and the pious Claude. During the first years of his infancy he had been very delicate and tender, and no one would have reared him who had not loved him as tenderly as Maria had done. But from the time she first saw him in the castle of Bellemont, she had loved him with all the love of the tenderest mother. Henry was very beautiful, though always pale, never having very strong health. He always had the greatest fear of doing anything which might displease God. He was gentle and humble to all around him. And to his little cousins, the sons of Claude, he was most affectionate and mild. When they were old enough, these three little boys used to go with the pastor Claude when he went to visit his poor people in the little cottages along the valleys, and heard him read and pray with them. 
Thus they acquired, when very young, such a knowledge of God and of the Holy Bible as might have put to shame many older people. Many of the cottages which Claude and his little boys used to visit were placed in spots of ground so beautiful that they would have reminded you of the Garden of Eden, some in deep and shady valleys, where the brooks of clear water ran murmuring amongst the groves of trees and over mossy banks, some on high lawns on the side of mountains where the eagles and mountain birds found shelter in the lofty forest trees. Some of these cottages stood on the brows of rugged rocks which jutted out from the sides of the hills on spots so steep and high that Claude's own little stout boys could scarcely climb them, and Claude was often obligated to carry little Henry up these steeps in his arms. In these different situations were flowers of various colors and of various kinds, and many beautiful trees, besides birds innumerable and wild animals of various sorts. Claude knew the names and natures of all these, and he often passed the time, as he walked, in teaching these things to his children. Neither did he neglect as they got older, to give them such instructions as they could get from books. He taught his little boys first to read French, and afterwards he made them well acquainted with Latin and the history of ancient times, particularly the history of such holy people as have lived and died in the service of God, the saints and martyrs of old days. He also taught his little boys to write, and they could sing sweetly many of the old hymns and psalms which from time immemorial had been practiced amongst the Waldenses. Claude's own little sons were obliged to do many homey household jobs to help their mother. They used to fetch the goats to the cottage door along the hillside path and milk them and feed them. They used to weed the garden and often to sweep the house and make up the fire. In all these things, little Henry was as forward as the rest, though the son of one of the greatest men in France but though this family were obliged to labor at the lowest work, yet they practiced towards each other the most courteous and gentle manners. In this manner, Henry was brought up amongst the Walden Seas until he was more than twelve years of age, at which time the servant came from his father, the Marquis, to bring him to Paris. And when the Marquis's letter arrived, all the little family of Pastor Claude's house were full of grief. You must go, my dear child, said the pastor. You must go, my beloved Henry, for the Marquis is your father, and you must obey him. But, oh, my heart aches when I think of the hard trials and temptations to which you will be exposed in the wicked world. Yet I have confidence, said Maria, wiping away her tears. I have prayed for this boy, this, my dear boy. I have prayed for him a thousand and a thousand times, and I know that he is given to us, this our child, will not be lost. I know he will not. He will be able to do all things well, Christ strengthening him. Oh, Maria, said the pastor Claude, your faith puts me to shame. Why should I doubt the goodness of God any more than you do? In the meantime, Henry's grief was so great that for some hours after the servant came, he could not speak. He looked on his dear father and mother, as he had always called Claude and Maria, and on their two boys, who were like brothers to him, he looked on the cottage where he had spent so many happy days, and the woods and valleys and mountains, saying beyond this he knew nothing, and he wished that he had been born Claude and Maria's child, and that he might be allowed to spend all his life, as Claude had done, in that delightful valley. Whilst Maria, with many tears, was preparing things for Henry's journey, the pastor took the opportunity of talking privately to him, and giving him some advice which he hoped might be useful to him. He took the child by the hand, and leading him into a solitary path above the cottage, where they could walk unseen and unheard, he explained to him the dangerous situation into which he was about to enter. He told him, with as much tenderness as possible, what his father's and his mother's characters were, that they never knew the fear of God, and that they acted as most persons do who are rich and powerful, and who are not led by divine grace. And he pointed out to him how he ought to behave to his parents, telling him that he must not be led away, but must persevere in well-doing. These, with many other things, the good Claude besought Henry always to have in remembrance, as he hoped to see his Redeemer in the land which is very far off. And he ended by giving him a little Bible and a small velvet bag, which he had received from his own father, and which he had been accustomed to carry in his pocket in all his visits to his poor people. In these days, Bibles were so common that every little boy and girl may have one. But this was not the case in former days. Bibles were very scarce and very difficult to get. 
and this Henry knew, and therefore he knew how to value this present. It would only trouble you were I to describe the sorrows of Claude's family when, the next morning, Henry, according to his father's orders, was dressed in a rich suit of clothes and set upon a horse, which was to carry him from among the mountains to the castle of Bellamont, where the Marquis's carriage waited for him. Henry could not speak as the horses went down the valley, but the tears fell fast down his cheeks. Every tree and every cottage which he passed, every pathway winding from the high road among the hills, reminded him of some sweet walk taken with Claude and his sons, or with his dear foster mother. As the road passed under one of the cottages which stood on the brow of a hill, Henry heard the notes of one of those sweet hymns which Maria had been accustomed to singing to him when he had been a very little boy, and which she had afterwards taught him to sing himself. Henry's heart at that moment was ready to burst with grief, and though the servant was close to him, yet he broke out in these words, Farewell, farewell, sweet and happy home. Farewell, lovely, lovely hills. Farewell, beloved friends. I will never, never see you again. Do not give way to grief, sir, said the servant. You are going to be a great man, and you will see all the fine things in Paris, and be brought before the king. The servant then gave him a long account of the grandeur and pleasures of Paris, but Henry did not hear one word he said, for he was listening to the last faint sounds of the hymn as they became more and more distant. End of section 12, part 1. Section 13 of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter O'Malley. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. The History of Little Henry, Part 2. Nothing particular happened to Henry on his journey and at the end of several days he arrived at the gates of his father's grand house at Paris. The Martiness that evening, as was common with her, gave a ball and a supper to a number of friends, and on this occasion the house was lighted up and set off with all manner of ornaments. The company was just come, and the music beginning to play, when little Henry was brought into the hall. As soon as it was known who was come, the servants ran to tell the Marquis and Martiness and they ran into the hall to receive their son. The beauty of Henry and his lovely mild look could not but please and delight his parents. And they said to each other as they kissed him and embraced him, How could we live so long a stranger to this charming child? His mother had expected that her son would have an awkward and low appearance. She was, therefore, greatly surprised at his courteous and polite manners, which delighted her as much as his beauty. All that evening Henry remained silent and modest and serious, and as soon as his parents would give him leave, he asked to go to bed. He was shown into a room richly furnished, and so large that the whole of Claude's little cottage would have gone into it. The servant who attended him would have undressed him, but he begged to be left alone, saying he had been used to dress and undress himself. As soon as the servant was gone, he took out his little Bible and read a chapter, after which, kneeling down, he prayed his Almighty Father to take care of him now, in this time of temptation, when he feared he might be drawn aside to forget his God. The young son of the Marquis de Roseville did not awake early, having been much tired with his journey. When he had dressed, he was taken to breakfast in his mother's dressing room. She was alone, as the Marquis had gone out after the ball the night before, and was not returned. The Martiness kissed Henry and made him sit down by her, showing him every proof of her love. Nevertheless, everything he saw and heard made him wish himself back again in the cottage amongst the hills. He could perceive by the daylight what he had not found out the night before, that his mother was painted white and red, and that she had a bold and fretful look, which made her large dark eyes quite terrible to him. Whilst the Martiness and Henry sat at breakfast, she asked him a great many questions about his education and manner of life among the mountains. He did not hide anything from her, but told her that he never intended to become a Roman Catholic. She answered that there was time enough yet before he needed to trouble himself about religion. You have a long life before you, Henry, she said, and many pleasures to enjoy. It will be well enough to become devout when you are near death. May not death be near now? asked Henry, looking very serious. 
Had my brother Theodore any greater reason to expect death than I have? And yet he was suddenly called away. The Martinez looked grave for a moment, then smiled and said, Oh, Henry, Henry, how laughable it is to hear one at your age speaking so seriously. Yet everything sounds prettily out of your mouth, she added, kissing him. For you are a charming boy, but come, she said. I will be dressed, and we will go out and pay visits, and I will show you something of this fine city. When the Martinez was dressed, she and Henry went out in the carriage, and, returning at dinner time, they found the Marquis at home. He looked pale and fatigued, but was pleased to embrace his son, with whom he seemed better and better satisfied as he saw more of him. The next day a tutor was appointed for Henry. He was a Roman Catholic priest, but although he bore the character of a clergyman, he seemed to have no thought of religion. He took great pains to teach Henry such things as he thought would please his father and mother and make him appear clever before his fellow creatures. But he had no desire to make him a good man. Besides this tutor, Henry had masters to teach him music and dancing and drawing and all such things as were wont to be taught to the children of the great men at that time in France. Thus Henry's mornings were employed by attending on his masters, and his mother often in the evening took him out to pay visits and to balls and public amusements. He was introduced several times to the king and became acquainted with all the nobility in Paris. But amongst all these worldly pleasures and enjoyments, God still held the heart of Henry, so that he took no delight in all these fine things and would have preferred Claude's cottage to all the splendors of Paris. When Henry had been in Paris about six months, it happened that one day his father went to the king's palace to pay him court. So it was that something had vexed the king that day, and he did not receive the Marquis so cordially as he had been used to. This affronted the Marquis so much, for he was a very proud man, that from that time he gave himself up altogether to abusing the king and contriving how to do him mischief and he invited to his house all the people of consequence in Paris who were discontented with the king, so that his house was filled with bad people who were always contriving mischief against the king. These people used to meet almost every evening to sup at the Marquise, and you would be shocked if I were to repeat to you the language which they used and how they used to rile against their king. On these occasions they drank abundance of wine after which they used to play at cards for large sums of money, and the Marquis and Martinez, not being so clever in play as some of the others in the party, lost a great deal of money, so that what with their extravagance, and what with the money they lost at cards, they had almost wasted all they possessed, and were in debt to everybody who supplied them with anything. Poor Henry, although so young, understood very well the wicked way in which his father and mother went on and though he did not dare to speak to his father about the manner of life he led, yet he spoke several times to his mother. Sometimes the Martinez would laugh at Henry when he talked to her in this way, and sometimes she would be quite angry and tell him he was meddling with things he could not understand. Abusing the king and forming schemes against the government are called treason. It was not long before the treasonable practices of the Marquis and the bad company he kept were made known to the king who one night, without giving notice to anyone, sent certain persons with a guard to seize the Marquis and convey him to a strong castle in a very distant part of France, where he was to be confined for life. At the same time, the king gave orders to seize all the Marquis's property for his own use. It was one night in the spring, just after the Marquis's wicked companions had taken their leave, that the persons sent by the king rushed into the Marquis's house, and making him a prisoner in the name of the king, forced him into a carriage with his wife and son, scarcely giving them time to gather a little linen and a few other necessary things to take with them. Amongst these, Henry did not forget his little Bible and an old book of martyrs, which he had bought at a bookstall a few days before. The Marquis and his family, well guarded, were hurried away so fast that before the dawn of the morning they were some miles from Paris. The Marquis then asked the person who rode by the carriage where they were taking him. They answered that his plots against the king had been found out, and that he was going to be put into a place where it would be out of his power to execute any of his mischievous purposes. On hearing this, 
the Marquis broke out into a violent rage, abusing the king and calling him every vile name he could think of, after which he became sullen and continued so to the end of his journey. The Martiness cried almost without ceasing, calling herself the most miserable of women and wishing she had never seen the Marquis. At the end of several days, towards the evening, they entered into a deep road between two high hills, which were so near each other that from one hill the cottages and little gardens and sheepfolds, with the cows and sheep feeding, might be plainly seen to the other. As they went on further, they saw a little cottage on the right hand among some trees, and above the village a large old castle with high walls and towers, and an immense gateway with an iron gate. When the Marquis saw the castle, he groaned, for he supposed that this was the place in which he was to be confined. And the Martiness broke out afresh in crying and lamenting herself. But Henry said not one word. The carriage took the road straight to the castle, and the guard kept close, as if they were afraid the Marquis would strive to get away. They passed through the little village, and then saw the great gate of the castle right before them, higher up the hill. It was almost dusk before the carriage stopped at the castle gate and the guards called to the porter, that is, the man who has the care of the gate, to open the gate and call the governor of the castle. When the porter opened the gate, the guard took the marquis out of his carriage, and all gathering close around him, led him through the gate into the outer court of the castle, which was surrounded by dark high buildings, Henry and his mother following. From thence he went through another gate and up a number of stone steps, till they came to an immense hall, so big that it looked like a large old church. From the roof of this hall hung several lamps, which were burning, for it was now quite dark. There the governor of the castle, a respectable-looking old officer with a band of soldiers, met the Marquis and received him into his charge. He spoke civilly to the Marquis and kindly to Henry and his mother. "'Do not afflict yourself, ma'am,' he said. "'I am the king's servant and must obey the king's orders.' But if I find that you and the Marquis are patient under your punishment, I shall make you as comfortable as my duty to the king will allow. To this kind speech, the Martiness only answered by breaking out like a child, crying afresh, and the Marquis was so sullen he would not speak at all. But Henry, running up and kissing the hand of the old gentleman, said, Oh, sir, God will reward you for your kindness to my poor father and mother, but you must pardon them, for they are not able to speak. You are a fine boy, said the old gentleman. It is a pity that at your age you should share your parents' punishment and be shut up in this place. Where my father and mother are, answered Henry, I shall be best contented, sir. I do not wish to be parted from them. The governor looked pleased with Henry, and giving his orders to his soldiers, they took up a lamp and led the poor Marquis to the room where he was to be shut up for the remainder of his life. They led him through many large rooms and up several flights of stone steps, until they came to the door of a gallery, at which a sentinel stood. The sentinel opened the door, and the Marquis was led along the gallery to a second door, which was barred with iron bars. Whilst the soldiers were unbarring the door, the Marquis groaned and wished he had never been born, and the poor Marchioness was obliged to lean upon Henry, or she would have fallen to the ground. When the iron-barred door was open, the guard told the Marquis and his family to walk forward. For this, they said, is your room. Accordingly, the Marquis and his wife and Henry went on into the room whilst the guard shut and barred the door behind them, one little lamp hanging from the top of the room, but high above their reach. For the rooms in these old castles are in general very lofty, was all the light they had. By this light they could just distinguish a large grated window, a fireplace, a table, some chairs, and two beds placed in different corners of the room. However, the unhappy family offered not to go near the beds, but the Marquis and Marchioness throwing themselves on the ground, began to rail at each other and at the king. Poor Henry endeavored to soothe and comfort them, but they pushed him from them, like people in a frenzy saying, Go, go, would to God you were in your grave with your brother Theodore. Henry withdrew to a distance, and kneeling down in a dark part of the room, he began to pray, till, being very weary, he fell asleep on the floor. When Henry awoke, he was surprised to find it was daylight. He sat up and looked around him on the prison room. It was a large and airy room, receiving light from a window strongly grated with iron. In two corners of the room, there were two old-fashioned but clean and comfortable-looking beds. Opposite the beds were a chimney piece and hearth for burning wood, and several old-fashioned chairs and a table stood against the wall. There were also, in the room, two doors which led into small closets. 
Henry's poor father and mother had fallen asleep on the floor after having wearied themselves with their violent grief. The Marquis had made a pillow of his cloak, and the Marchioness of a small bundle which she had brought in her hand out of the carriage. Henry looked at them till his eyes were full of tears. They looked quite pale and sorrowful, even in their sleep. He got up gently, for fear of disturbing his poor parents, and went to the window. The air from the opposite hill blew sweet and fresh in at the casement. It reminded Henry of the air which he used to breathe in Claude's cottage. The window was exceedingly high from the court of the castle, so that the little village below and the opposite green hill, with its cottages and flocks and herds, were all to be seen from thence above the walls of the court. "'What reason have we to be thankful?' said Henry. "'I was afraid my poor father might have been shut down in a dismal vault without light and fresh air. If the governor of this castle will but allow us to stay here, and give us only bread and water, we may be happy, and I have my little Bible and my book of martyrs. Whilst Henry stood at the window, he heard somebody unbar the door, and an old man came in with a basket, in which there was a comfortable breakfast. I have orders, said he, from my lord the governor, to give you everything which is convenient. God bless your lord, said Henry, and he begged the old man to return his thanks to him. I shall come again presently, said the old man, and bring you the things which you brought with you in the carriage. Your lord the governor is a kind man, said Henry. Yes, said the old man, and if your noble father will but make himself contented and not try to get away, he will have nothing to complain of here, and you would do well to tell him so, my young gentleman. Excuse an old man for giving advice. Henry went to the old man, and taking his hand, thanked him for his kindness. When the old man was gone, Henry, full of joy and thankfulness, began to take the things out of the basket and to set them in order upon the table. And now Henry found the use of having been brought up to wait upon himself and upon others. He soon set out the little table in the neatest way, and set a chair for each of his parents, and all this so quietly that the poor Marquis and Marchioness did not wake till he had done. The Marchioness first opened her eyes and looked round her. Henry ran to her, and kissing her said, Dear mother, see what comforts we have still got? We are fallen into good hands. Look around this room, and how light, how airy, and how pleasant it is. Henry then told her all the kindness of the governor, and showed her the breakfast prepared for them. But she still looked sullen and unthankful, and began to blame the Marquis as he lay asleep as the cause of all her affliction. Oh, mother, dear mother, cried Henry, look at my poor father. How pale he looks, and how he sighs in his sleep. You once loved him, dear mother. Oh, now love him again, and comfort him in his trouble." In this manner, Henry talked to his mother till she broke out into tears and putting her arms around his neck. My child, my Henry, she said, you are too good for me. Yet still Henry could not persuade her to take any breakfast. She placed herself in a chair in a corner of the room and leaving her head upon her hands, continued crying without ceasing. When the Marquis awoke, Henry endeavored to comfort him as he had done his mother. The Marquis embraced him and called him his beloved child and only comfort but he complained that he was ill, and put his hand to his head. Henry brought him a cup of coffee, which he made him drink, and the old man, coming in with the linen and other things which had been brought from Paris, they put some clean linen on the Marquis, and the old man and Henry assisted him to bed. The Marquis continued to get worse, and before night he was in a violent fever. The fever continued many days, and brought him very near to death. Whilst this illness lasted, Henry never left him, and the governor of the castle not only provided him with everything he wanted, but brought a doctor from the village to see him. For many days the poor Marquis did not seem to know anything that passed, or to know where he was, or who was with him, but seemed in great horror of mind, expressing great dread of death. But when his fever left him, though he was very weak, he recovered his recollection and expressed himself very thankful for the kindness he had received, particularly from the governor and the doctor. As to Henry, he kissed him often, calling him his darling son, and could not bear him to leave him for a moment. It was lovely to see how Henry watched by his poor father and how he talked to him, sometimes soothing and comforting, and sometimes giving him descriptions of the happy manner in which he used to live in Claude's cottage. And all this happiness, dear father, he would say, came from our being religious, for all the ways of religion are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Claude and Maria, said the Marquis one day to Henry, were very good people, and they always led innocent lives. 
They had no sins to trouble their consciousnesses, therefore they were happy. But I have many evil actions to remember, Henry. Oh, dear father, do let me read the Bible to you. I have got a little Bible, and I will, if you please, read a little to you every day, as you can bear it. The Marquis did not refuse to hear Henry read. Accordingly, every day his good son used to read certain portions of scripture to his father. The Marquis, having nothing else to take his attention, no cards, no wine, no gay companions, and being still confined by weakness to his bed, often lay for many hours listening to the word of God. At first, as he afterwards owned, he had no pleasure in it, and would rather have avoided hearing it. But how could he refuse his darling son, when he begged him to hear a little, only a little more? In the meantime, the Marchioness appeared sullen, proud, and unforgiving. She seldom came near her husband, but sometimes spent the day in crying and lamenting herself, and sometimes in looking over the few things which she had brought with her from Paris. The governor of the castle, seeing her so miserable, told her that he had no orders from the king to keep her or her son in confinement, and that she had liberty to depart when she pleased, and to take her son with her. But Henry would not hear of leaving his poor father, and used all his endeavors to persuade his mother to stay. When the Marquis was first able to leave his bed and sit in his chair opposite the window, Henry was very happy. He brought him clean linen and helped him to dress. And when he had led him to his chair, he set a table before him and arranged upon it, as neatly as he could, the little dinner which the old man had brought in the basket, with a bottle of weak but pleasant wine which the governor had sent him. Dear father, said Henry, you begin to look well. You look even better than you did when you were at Paris. Oh, if you could but learn to love God, you might now be happier than ever you were in all your life. And we might all be happy if my poor mother would but come to you and love you as she used to. Oh, come, dear mother, added Henry, going up to her and taking her hand. Come to my father. Come to my poor father. You loved him once. Love him again. In this manner, Henry begged and entreated his mother to be reconciled to his father. The Martiness at first seemed obstinate, but at last she was overcome, and running to her husband, put her arms around his neck and kissed him affectionately, whilst he, embracing her, called her his beloved wife, his own Adelaide. This little family then sat down to their dinner, enjoying the lovely prospect, and the soft and delightful breezes from the opposite hill. And after they had dined, Henry sang to his parents some of the sweet hymns he had learned when living in the valleys of Piedmont. Henry had done a great work. He had made peace between his father and his mother, and now he saw with great delight his poor father gaining strength daily, and though sometimes full of sorrow, yet upon the whole composed, and never breaking out in impatient words. About this time the governor of the castle invited Henry to dine with him. Henry was much pleased with the governor, who received him kindly, and took him to walk with him in the village. I am glad to hear, said the governor, that your father is more contented than he was at first, and you may tell him from me that if he will endeavor to make himself easy and not attempt to escape, I will always do everything within my power to make him comfortable. And now, if you can tell me what I can send him which you think will please him or your mother, if it is in my power, you shall have it. Oh, sir, said Henry, God has certainly put into your heart to be kind to my dear father. Henry then mentioned that he had heard his father say that in his younger days he had been very fond of drawing, and he begged of the governor a small box of colors and some paper, and also needles and thread and linen for his mother. With what joy did Henry run back to his father and mother in the evening with these things? They received him as if he had been a long while absent from them, instead of only a few hours. What Henry had brought afforded great amusements to the poor Marquis and Marchioness the Marquis passing his time in drawing, and the Marchioness with her needlework, whilst Henry continually read and talked to them, giving them accounts of the holy and happy lives which the Waldenses led, and the sweet lessons which Claude used to give to his children. In this manner the summer passed away, and the winter came. The governor then, finding that the Marquis was content, and made no attempt to escape, allowed the prisoners abundance of wood for fire and candles with every convenience which could make the winter pass away pleasantly. And he often came himself and passed an evening with them, ordering his supper into the room. The governor was an agreeable man and had traveled into many countries, which he used to describe to Henry. When he paid his evening visit, it was a day of festivity to the Marquis and his little family. 
and when he did not come, their evenings passed pleasantly, whilst Henry read the Bible aloud and the Martinez sewed. In the meantime, the work of grace seemed to advance in the heart of the Marquis, and he who but a year ago was proud, insolent, self-indulgent, boasting, blasphemous, was now humble, gentle, polite, in honor, preferring all men. His behavior to the Marchioness was quite changed. He was tender and affectionate towards her, bearing with patience many of her fretful little ways. In this manner the winter passed away, and the spring arrived, at which time the governor gave the Marquis permission, attended by a guard, to walk with his family every day upon the roof of the castle. There the Marquis enjoyed the fresh air and the beautiful prospect, and he said that all the pleasures of Paris were not to be compared to his happiness on such occasions. At the end of the fourth year of the Marquis's confinement, the smallpox broke out in the village, and the infection was brought to the castle. The Marquis and Henry were both seized by the dreadful disease, and both died in consequence. After their deaths, the poor Marchioness, hearing that the Waldenses had been driven from their happy valleys by the king, removed into a small house in the village near, where the governor supported and protected her till her dying day. End of section 13. Section 14 of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. A Story of Besetting Sins. Do you remember anything of the sermon? One Sunday, soon after the death of poor Miss Augusta Noble, Mrs. Fairchild, having a bad cold, could not go to church with the rest of the family. When the children were come home from church, Mrs. Fairchild asked Lucy what the sermon was about. Mamma, said Lucy, taking her Bible out of her little basket, I will show you the text. It is in Hebrews 12, 1. Let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which doth so easily beset us. When Mrs. Fairchild had looked at the text, she said, Do you remember anything more of the sermon, Lucy? Indeed, Mamma, said Lucy. I did not understand the sermon. It was all about besetting sins. What are they, Mamma? I will explain, said Mrs. Fairchild. Though our hearts are all naturally sinful, yet every man is not inclined alike to every kind of sin. One man, perhaps, is inclined to covetousness, another to swear and use bad words, another to lie and deceive, another to be angry and cruel and that sin which a man feels himself most inclined to is called his besetting sin oh now i know what besetting sins mean answered lucy has everybody a besetting sin mamma yes my dear answered mrs fairchild we all have although we do not all know what they are have i a besetting sin mamma said lucy yes my dear said mrs fairchild what is it mamma asked lucy can you not tell what fault you fall into oftener than any other said mrs fairchild lucy considered a little and then answered she did not know i think my dear said mrs fairchild although it is hard to judge any other person's heart that your besetting sin is envy i think i have often observed this fault in you you were envious about emily's doll and about poor miss augusta noble's fine house and clothes and servants and about the muslin and ribbon i gave to emily one day and the strawberry your papa gave to henry and i have often thought you showed envy on other occasions lucy looked grave when her mother spoke and the tears came into her eyes mamma she said i am a naughty girl my heart is full of envy at times but i pray that god would take this sin out of my heart and i hate myself for it you don't know how much mamma my dear child said mrs fairchild kissing lucy if you really grieve for your sins and call in faith upon the lord jesus christ you will surely in god's good time be set free from them and now my dear added mrs fairchild you know what is meant by the sin which doth so easily beset us and you understand that every person has some one besetting sin yes mamma said lucy and you have told me what my own besetting sin is and i feel that you have found out the right one but mamma you said that many people do not know their own besetting sins yes my dear answered mrs fairchild careless people do not know their hearts and have no idea of their besetting sins indeed they would laugh if you were to speak of such things before them whilst mrs fairchild was speaking these last words they heard the dinner-bell ring so they broke off their talk and went downstairs 
whilst mr and mrs fairchild and all the family were sitting at dinner they saw through the window a man on horseback carrying a large basket right up to the door mrs fairchild sent john out to see who this person was and john presently returned with a letter and a haunch of venison packed in a basket sir said john the man says that he is one of mr crosby of london's servants and that he has brought you a letter with his master's compliments and also a haunch of venison mr crosby's servant said mr fairchild taking the letter and reading it aloud as follows dear mr fairchild i and my wife and my sister miss crosby and my daughter betsy have been taking a journey for our health this summer we left london three months ago and have been down as far as yorkshire we are now returning home and have turned a little out of our way to see you as it is as much as twelve years since we met so you may look for us no accident happening to-morrow a little before two we hope to dine with you and to go on in the evening to the next town for our time is short i have sent a fine haunch of venison which i brought yesterday from the innkeeper where we slept it will be just fit for dressing to-morrow so i shall be obliged to mrs fairchild to order her cook to roast it by two o'clock which is my dinner hour my man thomas who brings this letter will tell the cook how i like to have my venison dressed and he brings a pot of currant jelly to make sauce in case you should have none by you though i dare say this precaution is not necessary as mrs fairchild no doubt has all these things by her i am not particular about my eating but i should be obliged to you if you would have the venison ready by two o'clock and let thomas direct your cook my wife and sister and daughter betsy send best compliments to our old friend mrs fairchild and hoping we shall meet in health to-morrow i remain dear mr fairchild your old friend obadiah crosby p s you will find the haunch excellent we dined upon the neck yesterday and it was the best i ever tasted when mr fairchild had finished the letter he smiled and said i shall be very glad to see our old friends but i am sorry poor mr crosby still thinks so much about eating it always was his besetting sin and it seems to have grown stronger upon him as he has got older who is mr crosby papa said lucy mr crosby my dear said mr fairchild lives in london he has a large fortune which he got in trade he has given up business some years and now lives upon his fortune when your mamma and i were in london twelve years ago we were at mr crosby's house where we were very kindly treated therefore we must do the best we can to receive mr and mrs crosby kindly and to make them as comfortable as possible when john went to church that same evening mr fairchild desired him to tell nurse to come the next day to help betty for nurse was a very good cook and the next morning mrs fairchild prepared everything to receive mr and mrs crosby and mr fairchild invited mr somers the clergyman of the parish to meet them at dinner when the clock struck one mrs fairchild dressed herself and the children and then went into a little tea-room the window of which opened upon a small grass plot surrounded by rose bushes and other flowering shrubs mr somers came in a little before two and sat with mrs fairchild when the clock struck two mr crosby's family were not come and mr fairchild sent henry to the garden gate to look if he could see the carriage at a distance when henry returned he said that he could see the carriage but it was still a good way off i am afraid the venison will be over-roasted said mrs fairchild smiling henry soon after went to the gate and got there just in time to open it wide for mr crosby's carriage mr and mrs fairchild ran out to receive their friends i am glad to see you once again said mr crosby as he stepped out of the coach followed by mrs crosby miss crosby miss betsy and mrs crosby's maid mr crosby was a very fat man with a red face yet he looked good-humoured and had in his younger days been handsome mrs crosby was a little thin woman and there was nothing in her appearance which pleased emily and lucy though she spoke civilly to them miss crosby was as old as her brother but she did not look so for her face was painted red and white and she and miss betsy had sky-blue hats and tippets with white feathers which lucy and emily thought very beautiful have you any company mrs fairchild said miss crosby as mrs fairchild was leading them into the parlor only one gentleman mr somers our rector said mrs fairchild oh then i must not appear in this gown and my hair too is all rough said miss crosby i must put on another gown i am quite frightful to look at indeed said mrs fairchild your dress is very nice there is no need to trouble yourself to alter it oh sister said mrs crosby don't think of changing your dress mrs fairchild's dinner is ready i dare say miss crosby would not be persuaded 
but calling the maid to attend her ran upstairs to change her dress and mrs fairchild sent lucy after her the rest of the company then went into the tea-room where they sat round the window and mr crosby said what a pretty place you have here mr fairchild and a good wife as i well know and these pretty children you ought to be a happy man and so i am thank god said mr fairchild as happy as any man in the world i should have been with you an hour ago said mr crosby that i might have walked over your garden before dinner but for my wife there what of your wife there said mrs crosby turning sharply towards him now mind mr crosby if the venison is over roasted don't say it is my fault mr crosby took out his watch it is now twenty-five minutes past two said he the venison has been down at the fire twenty-five minutes longer than it should have been and did you not keep us an hour waiting this morning at the inn where we slept whilst you quarrelled with the innkeeper and his wife mrs crosby answered you are always giving people to understand that i am ill-tempered mr crosby which i think is very unhandsome of you mr crosby there is not another person in the world who thinks me ill-tempered but you ask thomas or my maid what they know of my temper and ask your sister who has lived with me long enough why don't you ask me what i think of it mamma said miss betsy pertly hold your tongue miss said mrs crosby must i not speak said miss betsy in a low voice but loud enough for her mamma to hear her when miss betsy first came in emily admired her very much for besides the sky-blue hat and feather she had blue satin shoes and a very large pair of gold earrings but when she heard her speak so boldly to her mother she did not like her so much by this time john came to tell the company that dinner was on the table and mr crosby got up saying the venison smells well exceedingly well but where is miss crosby asked mr fairchild oh my aunt thought herself not smart enough to show herself before mr summers said miss betsy pertly be silent miss said mrs crosby don't wait for her then said mr crosby let us go in to dinner my sister loves a little finery she would rather lose her dinner than not be dressed smart i never wait for her at any meal come come ladies lead the way i am very hungry so mrs fairchild sent emily to tell miss crosby that dinner was ready and the rest of the company sat down to table mrs crosby said mr crosby looking at the venison then at his wife the venison is too much roasted i told you it would be so what finding fault with me again mr crosby said mrs crosby do you hear mr fairchild finding fault with his wife in this manner perhaps the venison is better than you think mr crosby said mr summers let me help you to some mr fairchild i know is not fond of carving mr crosby thanked mr summers and mr summers had just begun to cut the venison when mr crosby called out as if in agony oh mr summers you will spoil the venison you must not cut it that way upon any account do put the haunch by me and let me help myself what confusion you are making at the table mr crosby said mrs crosby you are putting every dish out of its place surely mr summers knows how to carve as well as you do but papa is afraid mr summers won't give him all the nice bits said miss betsy learn to be silent miss said mr crosby miss betsy was going to answer her father when miss crosby came into the room newly dressed in a very elegant manner she came smiling in followed by lucy and emily who went to sit at a small table with henry sister said mrs crosby where was the need of your dressing again if we had waited for you the dinner would have been spoiled but we did not wait for miss crosby so there was no harm done said mr fairchild smiling my aunt would not lose an opportunity of showing her new fashion gown for the world said miss betsy indeed niece answered miss crosby i do not know why you should say that i am fond of showing my clothes i wish to be neat and clean but no person cares less than i do about fashions and finery la said miss betsy whispering to mrs fairchild hear my aunt she says she does not care about finery that's like mamma saying how good-natured she is fie fie miss betsy said mrs fairchild speaking low you forget your respect to your elders miss betsy coloured and stared at mrs fairchild she had not been used to be found fault with for she was spoiled by both her parents and she felt quite angry indeed 
she said i never was thought disrespectful to any one before can't i see people's faults can't i see that mamma is cross and my aunt fond of fine clothes and that papa loves eating hush hush said mrs fairchild in a low voice your papa and mamma will hear you and i don't care if they do said miss betsy they know what i think what's that you are saying there miss betsy said mr crosby oh don't ask brother said miss crosby i know it is something saucy by my niece's looks and why should you suppose i am saying anything saucy aunt said miss betsy i am sure you are not accustomed to hear me say saucy things miss miss be quiet said mrs crosby for she was afraid mr and mrs fairchild would think her daughter ill-behaved what mamma answered miss betsy am i to sit quietly and hear my aunt find fault with me before company and for being impertinent too to my elders as if i were a mere child well well enough said mr crosby what is that pie mrs fairchild in the middle of the table i must have some if you please mr and mrs fairchild were not sorry when dinner was over and mrs crosby proposed that mrs fairchild should show her the garden accordingly the ladies and children got up and left the gentlemen together for mr crosby never stirred for some time after dinner when mrs crosby had got into the garden and had looked about her she said ah mrs fairchild how happy you are such a pretty house and garden such a kind husband such good children then she sighed and gave mrs fairchild to understand that she was not so happy herself after tea mr crosby and his family took their leave and went off to the next inn upon the london road where they were to sleep for mr crosby was in haste to be at home and would not stay although mr and mrs fairchild begged that they would at least till the next day when they were gone mr fairchild and henry took a walk towards the village with mr somers whilst the little girls remained at home with their mother dear lucy said mrs fairchild as soon as she was alone with her little girls do you remember what we were speaking about yesterday before mr crosby's letter came yes mamma said lucy we were speaking of besetting sins and you said that everybody has a besetting sin and you told me what you believe mine to be true my dear answered mrs fairchild i told you that without the help of the holy spirit of god very few people know what their own besetting sins are you had an opportunity to-day of observing this every individual of our friend mr crosby's family has a very strong besetting sin mr crosby loves eating mrs crosby is ill-tempered miss crosby is vain and fond of finery and miss betsy is very pert and forward we can see these faults in them and they can see them in each other but it is plain they do not see them in themselves mr crosby said several times that he was not particular about what he ate or drank mrs crosby said that there was not a person in the world who thought her ill-tempered but her husband miss crosby said that nobody in the world cared less for finery than she did and miss betsy was quite offended when she was told she was not respectful in her manners to her elders oh yes said emily she said i am not saucy of all faults sauciness is not one of my faults i am sure and i thought all the time she looked as saucy and impertinent as possible and how mr crosby did eat said lucy he ate half the haunch of venison and then he was helped twice to pigeon pie and then he ate apple tart and custard and then well well you have said enough lucy said mrs fairchild interrupting her i do not speak of our poor friend's faults out of malice or for the sake of making a mockery of them but to show you how people may live in the constant practice of one particular sin without being at all conscious of it and perhaps thinking themselves very good all the time we are all quick enough my dear emily and lucy in finding out other people's faults but as i said before we are often very blind to our own mamma said lucy do you know any prayer about besetting sins yes my dear answered mrs fairchild i have one in my own book of prayers and i will copy it out for you to-morrow morning so mrs fairchild broke off her conversation with her little girls and bade them go and play a little before bedtime end of section fourteen chapter fifteen of the fairchild family 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. Chapter 15. A Visit to Mary Bush. Not very long after the death of poor Miss Augusta Noble, a note came from Sir Charles and Lady Noble, inviting Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild to dinner the next day, but not mentioning the children, as they used to do when they sent their invitations. "'Poor Lady Noble,' said Mr. Fairchild, "'I wish we could give her any comfort, but we will certainly go.' The next day, when Sir Charles's carriage came for Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild, they kissed the children, and told them when they had dined they might, if they pleased, go with Betty to see old Mary Bush. Mary Bush was one of the old women who lived at the end of the coppice, and being a good woman, Mr. and Mrs. Fairchild were not afraid of trusting their children with her. The children were very much pleased, and made haste to get their dinner after which lucy packed up a little tea and sugar which her mamma had given her in a basket and the little girls having put on their bonnets and tippets went into the kitchen to see if betty was ready betty was tying up a small loaf and a pot of butter in a clean napkin and she had put some nice cream into a small bottle for which john was cutting a cork betty are you ready said henry lucy has got the tea and sugar and emily has got miss dolly and i have got my hat and stick so come betty come but who is to milk the cow said john pretending to look grave betty must stay to milk the cow at five o'clock no john said the children all gathering round him good john will you be so kind as to milk the cow and let betty go well i will see about it said john putting the cork into the cream bottle there's a good john said emily i love you john said henry and now betty come make haste away so the children set out and they went out across the garden to a little wicket gate which mr fairchild had opened towards the coppice and came into henry's favourite sunday walk the green trees arched over their heads and on each side the pathway was a mossy bank out of which sprang such kind of flowers as love shady places such as the wood anemone and wild vetch thrushes and blackbirds were singing sweetly amongst the branches of the trees this is my walk said henry and i say it is the prettiest in the country no henry said emily it is not so pretty as the walk to the hut at the top of the hill for there you can look all over the coppice and see the birds flying over the tops of the trees sister said lucy now you shall carry the basket and i will have the doll a little with all my heart said emily why don't you give miss to me said henry oh yes said emily did i not give her to you one day and did you not hang her upon a tree in the garden with a bit of string round her neck and say she was a thief lucy said henry let's have a race to that tree which has fallen down over the path so away they ran and when they got to the tree they sat down upon the trunk until betty came up with emily on one side of the fallen tree was a place where the wood had been cut away and the woodmen had made themselves a little hut which they had now left empty round this hut were scattered many dry sticks and chips master henry said betty here are some nice sticks let us gather a few together they will do to make a fire to boil mary bush's kettle oh yes betty answered the children and they set to work and soon gathered a great many sticks and betty tied them together with a piece of pack thread which henry pulled out of his pocket then betty took off her bonnet and placed the bundle upon her head they went on to mary bushes the children wanted to help carry the sticks but betty would not let them saying they were too heavy for them but we can carry the bread and butter said lucy so betty allowed them to do it when they had walked a little further they came in sight of mary bush's house down in a kind of little valley or dingle deeply shaded by trees in the very deepest part of the dingle was a stream of water falling from a rock the light from above fell upon the water as it flowed and made it glitter and shine very beautifully among the shady trees this was the same which took its course through the primrose meadow and on towards the village and so to brookside cottage where the nurse lived a clear and beautiful stream as could be 
Mary Bush's cottage was so large that after the death of her husband she had let half of it to one Goodman Gray, who lived in it with his old wife Marjorie, and cultivated the garden, which was a very good one. John Truman's wife was Mary Bush's eldest daughter, and Joan, nurse's son's wife, was her youngest, and it was said of them that there were not two better wives and mothers in the parish. So Mary Bush was very happy in her children. When the children and Betty came up to the cottage, they found Mary Bush spinning at the door. "'We are come to drink tea with you, Mary,' said Lucy. "'And we have brought bread and butter and tea and cream with us,' said Emily. "'And a bundle of sticks,' said Henry, "'to boil the kettle.' "'Welcome, welcome, my little loves,' said old Mary, as she got up and set her spinning wheel to one side. "'Come in, little dears.' Mary had but one room and a little pantry but it was a very neat room there was a bed in one corner covered with a clean linen quilt there were also a nice oaken dresser a clock two armchairs two three-legged stools a small round table a corner cupboard and some shelves for plates and dishes the fireplace and all about it were always very neat and clean and in winter you would probably see a small bright fire on the hearth how does the cat do said henry looking about for mary bush's cat oh here she is henry said emily screaming with joy in this basket under the dresser with two such beautiful tortoiseshell kittens do look lucy do look henry miss lucy said old mary would you like to have one of the kittens when it is big enough to leave its mother oh yes yes and thank you mary answered lucy if mamma pleases when the children had looked at the kittens and kissed them, they went to visit Marjorie Gray, and to talk to old Goodman Gray, who was working in the garden, whilst Betty, in the meantime, and old Mary Bush, set out the teacups and set the kettle to boil for tea. When the tea was ready, Betty called the children, and they would make Marjorie Gray come and drink tea with them. Henry would have the old man come too. "'No, master,' said the old man. "'I know my place better.' "'Well, then,' said Lucy, i will send you a nice cup of tea and some bread and butter into the garden i wish you could have seen them all drinking tea at the door of the cottage round the little table the two old women sitting in the armchairs for lucy would have them do so betty making tea and the three children sitting on stools how pleased and happy they were end of chapter fifteen end of part one Section 16 of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. Part 2. Story of Miss Crosby's Presence. Miss Crosby spoke kindly to her. We will begin this history again by telling what had happened since the first part was concluded sir charles and lady noble had left their fine place soon after the funeral of their daughter and it was supposed would never return for the house and park were advertised to be let after a few months it was taken by a family of the name of darwell said to be immensely rich this family had an only daughter no other changes had taken place everybody else lived where they did in the last part of our history which is very pleasant as we may hope to see our old friends all again mr fairchild had had a few hundred pounds left him by a friend from whom he had expected nothing on the strength of which he bought a plain roomy carriage which would hold himself and mrs fairchild in the front seat with a child between them and two children behind the pillion was put aside and the old horse put in the shafts and though to be sure he went but slowly and not very far at a time yet the whole family found great pleasure in the change the winter was past and the sweet spring was beginning to show itself when that happened which shall be related without delay one morning when henry was with his father in the study and lucy and emily were busy with their needles seated in the parlour window together and alone they saw a gentleman's carriage stop at the gate and a lady get out a great number of bandboxes were taken from different parts of the carriage by a servant who was attending the carriage and before the little girls could make anything of all these wonders they saw their father first and then their mother run out and shake hands with the lady and seemed to invite her to come in henry too 
had gone out after his papa and had been sent back as they thought to fetch betty for betty soon appeared and began with the help of henry who seemed to be delighted at this interruption of his lessons to carry the boxes into the house lucy and emily soon discovered that this lady was the elder miss crosby but they wondered how she had happened to come that day miss crosby had come from london where she had been for some time and was now so far on her way to visit a friend in the country she had come to mr fairchild's door in another friend's carriage and she was come to ask mr fairchild to take her in until the monday morning mr and mrs fairchild both assured her that they were most glad to see her expressed a hope that she would stay longer than monday and showed themselves so kind and hospitable that miss crosby was quite at her ease and everything was settled about her staying before mr fairchild brought her into the parlor but there was quite time enough before miss crosby came in for lucy and emily to say many things for which i am happy to add they were afterwards very sorry lucy spoke first what a quantity of boxes she has brought she said some finery i dare say in all of them how silly for such an old person to be fond of dress it is very silly replied emily and particularly for one so ugly don't you think miss crosby uncommonly ugly to be sure i do she answered everybody must with her little nose and her gray eyes and her wide mouth and to be so fond of finery after all said emily i am sure if i was like miss crosby instead of dressing myself out i would wear a veil and hide my face in this way the two little girls kept on chattering and i fear my reader will say that they are not improved since last she heard anything of them when miss crosby came into the parlor she kissed them both and made some remarks about their looks which showed that she was quite pleased with their appearance mrs fairchild employed them a little time in going backwards and forwards to betty and helping in many things for when people keep but one maid-servant they must occasionally assist her when the room was ready for miss crosby and a fire lighted and all the boxes and packages carried up mrs fairchild showed the lady to her room and miss crosby having asked when dinner would be ready said well i shall just have time to change my dress oh pray do not trouble yourself to dress said mrs fairchild you are very nice now and we are plain people you are very good answered miss crosby but i shall not be comfortable in the dress in which i travelled mrs fairchild said no more but having told her little girls who had gone up with her to the visitor's room to go and make themselves neat in their sunday frocks she hastened to give some orders and perhaps some help in the kitchen we will not repeat what lucy and emily said to each other whilst they were in their little room all that passed was of the same kind if not worse than what they had said in the parlor one encouraging the other and carrying the ridicule of their mother's visitor far than either of them intended when they began when the little girls were dressed they went into the best parlor or tea-room as their mother called it in the old-fashioned way and there they found a fire burning and everything in order john was laying the cloth in the next room and henry soon came to them in his sunday dress and soon afterwards their father and mother but miss crosby did not appear till dinner was being served up she came dressed in a muslin gown with a long train and large full sleeves tied in several places with crimson ribbons she had her hair frizzed and powdered and a turban of crimson satin on her head her dress was quite out of place but persons who are always used to be rather overdressed are not judges of the times and places in which to put on their finery at the sight of her lucy and emily gave each other a look which seemed to say how very silly the dinner-time passed off very well miss crosby had a great deal to tell about london and her journey down into the country and soon after dinner the children had leave to go to their playroom they were not in the humor to do much good there they began with talking nonsense and finished off with getting pettish with each other henry said that he did not want to hear any more of miss crosby and her finery lucy called him cross and emily said that he was not to hinder them talking of what they pleased they were called to tea about six o'clock and when the tea-things were removed miss crosby said 
now mrs fairchild you shall see some of the things which i have brought from london will you come to my room or shall i send for the bandbox down here oh pray said mr fairchild let us have the box down here that henry and i may see the fine sights also you don't mean to say answered miss crosby laughing that a sensible man like you mr fairchild can be amused by the sight of specimens of the fashions i am amused with everything said mr fairchild which entertains my family i make a point of enjoying everything which they do as far as i can well then said miss crosby if i had my bandbox here the children all at once offered to fetch it she explained which they were to bring out of the many which had come with her and in a very few minutes they had brought it down and set it on the table miss crosby sent them up again to look in her work-bag for her keys and to bring down a small parcel wrapped in brown paper which was to be found in the same bag the parcel and the keys soon appeared miss crosby opened the parcel and presented henry with a neat pocket-book inside of which were a pencil a leaf of ass's skin a penknife and a pair of scissors oh thank you thank you ma'am said henry how good you are and his father and mother joined in the boy's thanks there was nothing on henry's mind particularly to render that gift bitter to him he had not joined in the ridicule of miss crosby she next opened the bandbox and took out of it two bonnets and two tippets of grass-green silk lined with pale pink satin there were also two neatly plaited lace caps to wear under the bonnets and waist ribbons to suit these i hope will please you my dear miss lucy and miss emily she said i brought them for you and i trust you will like them it was well at the moment that emily was not struck by this kindness in the way that lucy was she was one full year younger than her sister and could hardly be supposed to be able to reflect so deeply she therefore could look joyful could run forwards to kiss miss crosby and was ready almost to dance with delight when she looked at the beautiful things on the table had she not as it were pushed herself first miss crosby must have been struck as mrs fairchild was with the manner of lucy the little girl first flushed up to her brow and all over her neck she came forward to miss crosby but slowly and with her eyes cast down she stood one moment and then throwing her arms round her neck and pressing her face against her shoulder she sobbed deeply miss crosby was certainly surprised she did not expect that her present could have made the little girl feel so much she spoke very kindly to her put her arms round her kissed her several times and said but my dear a bonnet and a tippet are not worthy of such deep gratitude you make me ashamed that i have done so little for you but you are so good ma'am so very good sobbed lucy miss crosby continued to soothe the little girl and say kind things to her which only made her seem to feel the more mr and mrs fairchild were certainly surprised but they took no notice and after a little while lucy became calm and the affair passed off miss crosby appearing to be rather pleased at the manner in which her present had been received lucy became quite calm after her fit of crying but her mother observed that she sighed deeply once or twice when eight o'clock came the children at hint from their mother were wishing their friends good-night when miss crosby asked leave for their staying to supper mrs fairchild said not to-night if you please miss crosby but to-morrow night we will all sup together to-morrow miss crosby kissed lucy affectionately before she left the room and mrs fairchild again saw the tears in the eyes of her little girl but she did not appear to take notice when lucy and emily had got into their own room lucy at once gave way to her feelings oh emily emily she said as she laid her new bonnet and tippet on the drawers i am so unhappy i have been so wicked to think how kind miss crosby was to bring those beautiful things for us and to know how i laughed at her and said cruel things about her and called her ugly i have been naughtier than you because i am older and because at the same time i did it i knew i was wrong and when i saw those beautiful bonnets i felt as if there had been a thorn put into my heart it is odd said emily that i did not think of it even when i saw you crying if miss crosby had not been so kind replied lucy i should have not cared i can't forgive myself i can't forget it then lucy cried again and emily with her and they were still weeping when sleep came over them they were leaning back on their pillow emily had put her arm over lucy and their cheeks were still wet with tears when their mother came in before she went to bed to look at them she was again surprised to see their tears and stood a while looking at them being uneasy to think 
what could have caused them they did not wake and she did not like to disturb them but she went to bed rather uneasy though she hoped that there was no great cause for being so and in the morning all her fears were soon removed for she heard the voices of her little girls before she had quite finished dressing they were knocking at her door and asking to speak to her she went to them immediately and lucy told her at once all that had made them unhappy the last evening telling how they had prayed to be kept from such naughtiness again and saying what pain miss crosby's kindness had given them mrs fairchild heard all they had to say without interrupting them but her face looked kind and full of pity when the story was told she put her arms round both of them and kissed them tenderly and then talked to them for some time of the want of kindness and good feeling they had shown towards their guest oh mamma said lucy the more you talk the more vexed i am with myself what am i to do shall i go and beg miss crosby's pardon shall we mamma added emily no no my children answered mrs fairchild half smiling what would you give the poor lady pain by telling her wherefore you come to beg her pardon no replied lucy thoughtfully that will not do i see but we will not wear our bonnets to-day mamma said emily though it is so fine she wishes to see you in them answered their mother she must not be disappointed now wipe away your tears my little girl she added we must try to make this day as pleasant as possible to poor miss crosby and all went most pleasantly from the time that they met at breakfast till they parted after supper and miss crosby said well miss fairchild i have certainly had a most delightful day and i wish that i could spend all my sundays with you as i have done this for in general i must confess i do find the sunday the dullest day of all the seven then ma'am said lucy i hope you will come often again and mrs fairchild joined in the invitation end of section sixteen chapter seventeen of the fairchild family this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter O'Malley The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood A Visit to Mrs. Goodrichie Nothing happened for some weeks after Miss Crosby went away which would be put down in this history, because almost every day was like another, unless we were to say what lessons the children did, and what the doll was dressed in, and what walks were taken. The spring came on, and a very fine spring it was, and Henry found a place among the trees where he thought a very beautiful arbor might be made, and he got leave to make it, and John helped, and Lucy and Emily were very busy about it, and a most pleasant place it was. The hut in the wood was too far off for the children to run to when they had but little time, but Henry's arbor could be reached in three minutes by the shortest way. Mr. Fairchild was so good as to pay John Truman to make a thatched roof and sides to it, and the manservant John found some old boards for seats, but he could not find time to finish the seats as soon as Henry wished. During this time Mrs. Goodrichie came over to visit Mrs. Fairchild, and she then invited all the family to come and spend the whole day with her in the summer, and she promised that on that day, if all went well, she would tell them another story about old Mrs. Howard. But the happiest times of people's lives are often those in which there is the least to write and talk about. So we must pass over the spring and go on to the month of June, the very first day of which was that fixed for the visit to Mrs. Goodrichy. It was a bright morning when the party set out in the carriage which Mr. Fairchild had brought. The dew was not off the ground, for they were to breakfast at Mrs. Goodrichy's. But, as Harry said, the day would be too short anyhow, for these happy children thought many days too short. What a curious old house Mrs. Goodrichie's was. It was the very house in which Mrs. Howard had lived, and it had been scarcely altered for Mrs. Goodrichie. There was what the old lady had called her summer parlor, because she never sat in it in cold weather. It was low and large and had double glass doors, which opened upon the old-fashioned garden. And there was a short walk which went from the door to the old arbor. The walls of the room were painted blue. The windows were casements and had seats in them. And there was a step up from the floor into the garden. The visitors found Mrs. Goodrichie in the summer parlor. After breakfast, the two older ladies took out their work. Mr. Fairchild walked away somewhere with a book. 
and the children went into the arbor. Lucy and Emily had their doll's work, and Henry had his knife and some bits of wood. It was very hot, so they could not run about. I love this arbor, said Henry. Lucy, so do I. Don't you remember, Henry, that we were sitting there once, thinking of poor Emily when she had the fever, when Mrs. Goodrichie came to us and told us that Emily was so much better and the fever gone, and how glad we were and how we jumped and screamed. Oh, that was a dreadful time. To me, it was not dreadful, replied Emily. I think I may say it was a happy time, Lucy, for I had thoughts put into my mind in that illness, which make everything seem different to me ever since. You know what I mean, Lucy? I can't explain it. Lucy, I know what you mean, Emily. Emily, I never felt anything like that till I had the fever, so I call the fever a happy time. I wish you would not talk about it, said Henry. Lucy and I were miserable then. Were we not, Lucy? Mrs. Goodrichie dined very early, and after dinner she and Mrs. Fairchild came into the arbor, and there she told the story which she had promised. End of chapter 17「Section 18 of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Audrey Giger. The Fairchild Family by Martha Sherwood. Story of the Last Days of Mrs. Howard. It was about half a year after the things had happened which are related in the last story of Mrs. Howard that Betty, one evening when she returned from market upon crop, came into the parlor to her mistress and said, Ma'am, I have heard a bit of news. Mr. Bennet is going to leave the country. Indeed, Betty, said Mrs. Howard. How has that happened? Some relation towards London has left him a property, and our county is glad of anything that takes off the family. Well, well, Betty, said Mrs. Howard. And Betty knew that when her mistress said, well, well, it was a hint to her to say no more on the subject. Mrs. Howard soon heard from other quarters that the Bennets were going, but they were not to be off till the Lady Day next. A week or two before that time, Betty had occasion to go again to town. Many things were wanted, and on such occasions Crop did not object to carry panniers. When Betty was quite ready, and Crop at the door, and the woman in the house who always came to take care of things on such occasions, she came to ask her mistress if there was anything more not yet mentioned. Betty never traveled in cold weather without a long blue cloak and a black felt hat tied over her mob. Yes, Betty, replied Mrs. Howard, but you must be very particular. You must get me two small neat Bibles with gilt edges bound in Morocco, scarlet, or green. I should wish them alike and a clear print, besides which you must bring a young gentleman's pocket book, all complete and handsome, with a silver clasp, and lastly, you must bring me a genteel equipage in chased silver, the furniture quite complete and as it should be, and mind it is well wrapped in paper. Oh, ma'am, said Betty, how shall I be able to choose one that will exactly suit for what you want? I am quite afraid to undertake the bringing of a genteel equipage. There is such a difference of opinion about so tasty a thing. Betty, replied Mrs. Howard, you know I am always pleased with your taste, and if anyone in the world knows what I like, it is you, my good girl. Mrs. Howard often called Betty a good girl, though she was too old to be so called, but it was a habit in those days in which the old lady lived. I should know your taste, ma'am said Betty, smiling. By this time, I should think, me, who has lived in yours in your lady mother's service four and forty years next Candlemas. And so saying, Betty set out. Pray, ma'am, asked Lucy, what is an equipage? A fine carriage and horses to be sure, Lucy, said Henry. Lady Noble had an equipage. I heard John once say, that's a fine equipage when he saw Lady Noble riding by. Oh, Henry, said Emily, surely what Betty was to bring with her could not be a carriage and horses wrapped in paper. Mrs. Goodrich smiled and explained to the children what Mrs. Howard meant. She told them that an equipage was a little case which held a thimble, scissors, a pencil, or other such little matters, and, being either of gold or silver, was hung to the girdle to balance the great watches worn by the grandmothers and great-grandmothers of people now living.
Thank you, ma'am, said Lucy. And now please to go on and tell us what Mrs. Howard meant to do with this equipage. When Betty returned, continued Mrs. Goodrich, Mrs. Howard was well satisfied with what she had done, and the very next Sunday evening she took occasion after service to speak to Master and Miss Bennet and to invite them to tea for the next evening. I wonder, said Master Jackie to Miss Polly, as they walked home together by their mother, what she can want with us. I promise you I shan't go. What's that you are saying, Jackie? said Mrs. Bennet. Miss Polly then told her mother of the invitation and what her brother had said. You had best go, said Mrs. Bennet, and you may perhaps get some pretty present. I was told by one who was told by another that Betty was in town last week and laying out money at the silversmith's and at Mr. Bates the bookseller's, so I would have you go. You don't know but that the old lady may have some keepsakes to give you. Well then, said Jackie, if Polly goes, I will, for I don't see why she is to have the presents and me nothing, but as to anything that Mrs. Howard ever gave me yet added the rude boy, I might put it into my eye and see none the worse. And whose fault is that? said Miss Polly. It don't become you to talk, miss, replied Jackie, for if I have had nothing, you have had no more, so there is half a dozen for one and six for another. By this discourse we may see, said Mrs. Goodrich, that no great change for the better had yet passed on these rude children. But they had got a notion that, as Jackie said, there were presents in the wind, and they set out for Mrs. Howard's determining to behave their best, though they did not tell their thoughts to each other, for Jackie hoped that Polly would disgrace herself and get nothing, and Polly had the same kind wishes for Jackie. Mrs. Howard received them in the summer parlor, and they both behaved themselves very well, but more out of spite for each other than from love of what is right in itself but you shall hear by and by how I came to the knowledge of these their thoughts. Betty had made a cake, and there was a roast fowl and hot apple tart for supper, and between tea and supper Mrs. Howard showed them many curious things, pictures and dolls dressed in the fashions of her youth, and a number of other things which she kept in a Japan cabinet, which always stood in the summer parlor while she lived in this house. It was not till after supper that she brought out the two Bibles and the pocket book and equipage. She then laid them before her on the table and spoke to the two children. She began by saying that as they were going out of the country and she was far in years, she might, perhaps, never see them again in this world. She then spoke, in her own sweet, warm way, of what our dear Savior has done for us, and when she had said as much as she thought the children could bear, she presented each a Bible, having written their names in them. She next took the other presents in her hands. And these, my dears, she said, I ask you to accept. I am sorry if on former occasions I may have seemed harsh to you, but these little gifts are to prove that I am truly sorry if I ever gave you pain. When you look at them, you will think of me and know that nothing would ever give me more delight than to hear that you are both walking in the ways of holiness. She then put the pocketbook into Jackie's hand, and the equipage into Miss Polly's, but she hardly expected what followed. The two children burst into tears. Jackie rubbed his eyes to hide his, but Miss Polly sprang from her chair and fell weeping into Mrs. Howard's arms. We will, we will try to do better, ma'am, she said. We will indeed. As the children walked home, they said not one word to each other, and a very few days afterwards the family left the country, Mr. Bennet not having had even the decency to call and say goodbye to the old lady. Mrs. Howard was halfway between sixty and seventy when the Bennets left the country, and was supposed by many to be older, for she had dressed like an old woman for many years. Her hair had long been gray, and she had always been a weakly person very small and very pale. She, however, continued to live in this house as many as seventeen years after the Bennets were gone, and every year till the last had her children's party, but a change was coming on her household. 
Crop had died years before, and Betty afterwards always went to town in the market cart. But what was the loss of Crop to the loss of Betty? Betty was younger than Mrs. Howard, but she was called away before her. She had lived forty years with Mrs. Howard in this very house, and the loss could not be made up to her in this world. Mrs. Howard had a great nephew, a surgeon, of the name of Johnson, who lived in a fair village called Pangburn in Berkshire, and when he heard of the death of Betty, and how low his aunt was, he came to her and persuaded her to leave the country and go and reside near to him. She was at first unwilling to go, but was at last persuaded. She took nothing with her but her favorite chair, her old round table, her books, and her cabinet. Her nephew got her some very pleasant rooms in a house called the Wood House, about half a mile from the village, towards the hills which are near the place. That side of Pangburn was in those days almost a continued wood coppice, with occasional tall trees towards the hills, and there was a narrow road and raised path through the wood to town. Mrs. Howard's parlor had an old-fashioned bow window in it, looking to the road, though somewhat raised above it, and Mrs. Howard, as old people do, loved in fine weather to sit in the bow and see the few people who passed. Every day her kind nephew came to see her, and now and then she returned his visit, but she was getting very infirm, though she had lost neither sight nor hearing, could read and work as in her younger days, and having got over the first shock of losing Betty and the fatigue of the change, her faith in God's love was making her as happy as she had been before. She liked the people also who kept the house, and made herself very pleasant to them. Though she went to Pangburn in the autumn, she did not, until the month of April, find the pleasure of sitting in the bow window. It was then that she first noticed two little girls passing and returning every day at certain hours to and from the village. They were so near of a size that she thought they must be twins. They were very fair and very pretty and very neat. They wore light green stuff frocks with lawn aprons and tippets and little tight neat silk bonnets of the color of their frocks. They both always carried a sort of satchel as if they were going and coming from school, and there was often with them, when they went to the village, either a man or woman servant, such as might be supposed to belong to a farmhouse. They often, however, passed by the window in the evening without a servant, and sometimes were met by a servant near the house. These little ones could not, from their appearance, have been more than seven years of age. As Mrs. Howard watched them from day to day, she thought them the pleasantest little people she had seen for a long time, and all her ancient love for children, which age and weakness had almost made her fancy was snipped and blighted, began to spring up again and blossom as flowers in May. She wished to get acquainted with these fair ones, but she took her own way to do so. She began one morning, when her window was open, by giving them a kind smile as they were walking gravely by, with a man in a smock frock behind them. On seeing the smile, they both stopped short and dropped formal curtsies. From that time, for a week or more, these smiles and these curtsies passed between the old lady and the twins twice every day regularly. Before the end of the week, the children had left off looking grave at the lady and gave smile for smile. You may be sure that Mrs. Howard, though she had not poor Betty and Crop to send on her errands, did manage to get some pretty toys ready to give these little girls whenever the time should come when she should think it right to make herself better acquainted with them, but she thought that she would observe their ways first, and in doing so she saw several things which pleased her. Once she saw them give a poor beggar some of what had been put in their satchels for their dinners, and she saw them another time pick up something which a very old man had dropped and give it to him as politely as they would have done to my lord judge, though it was only a potato which he had dropped from a basket. Seeing this, it reminded her of the old man and his bundle of sticks, and of the ill behavior of Master Bennet, and then all those old days came fresh to her mind. Mrs. Howard had sent a friend to London to get the toys, two dolls exactly alike, and the histories of Miss Jemima Meek and Peter Pippin were the things she sent for, 
and they had not arrived a week when Mrs. Howard found a use for them. It was the beginning of July, and a very hot, close day. Mrs. Howard sat at her window, and saw the little ones go as usual towards the village. It was Saturday, and she knew that they would be back again about one, for it was a half-holiday. The heat became greater and greater towards noon. There was not a breath of air, and the sun was hidden by a red, glaring mist. "'We shall have a tempest,' said Mrs. Howard to a maid who had been hired to wait upon her. "'I hope the little girls will get home before it comes on. Have they far to go?' When Mrs. Howard had explained what little girls she meant, the maid told her that they were the children of a farmer of the name of Simmons, and that the house was not a half-mile distant up the lane. Whilst Mrs. Howard was talking with the servant, the heavens had grown black, the clouds hung low, there was a creaking, groaning sort of sound among the trees, and the larger birds arose and flew heavily over the woods, uttering harsh cryings. "'It's coming,' said the servant, and at the same instant the two little ones appeared walking from the village. "'There they are,' cried Mrs. Howard, and at the same moment a tremendous flash of lightning covered the whole heavens, followed by a peal of awful thunder. Mrs. Howard put her head out of the window and called the little girls, who, from very fright, were standing still. They gladly obeyed the call, and the maid went down to meet them, and the next minute they stood curtsying within the parlor door. The maid had seen a boy who had been sent to meet them, and sent him back to tell his mistress that the missus were with the lady, and that she would keep them till the storm was over. "'What lady am I to say?' asked the boy. "'Our lady,' replied the maid, "'Surgeon Johnson's aunt.' The boy ran home and told Mrs. Simmons not to be uneasy, for little missus were safe with Madame Johnson, who lodged at the woodhouse, so Mrs. Simmons was made easy about her pretty daughters. "'Well, my dears,' said Mrs. Howard, putting her hands out to the little people, "'I am glad to see you in my parlor.' "'Thank you, ma'am,' said one of them, and the other repeated the same words. As they spoke, they came near, and put each a hand into Mrs. Howard's. "'Let me look at you, my children,' said the old lady in her pleasant, smiling way. "'You are like two lilies growing out of one root. I cannot tell one from the other. What are your names?' "'I am Mary, ma'am,' said the eldest. "'And I am Amelia,' said the other. "'Amelia,' said Mrs. Howard. "'Why, that is my name.' But which is the oldest? We came to our mother the same day, replied Mary. But I came first, only a very little while, though. Indeed, said Mrs. Howard. Mrs. Baines had come into the parlor after the children to see and hear what was going forward, and now she thought it time to put in a word. Yes, ma'am, she said. They are twins. They are the only ones their mother ever had, and they are two pretty misses and very good children. Are not you very good, my precious dears? The two little ones turned to her and answered both together. No, ma'am. Mrs. Howard rather wondered at this answer and said, Not good, my dears. How is that? We wish to be good, ma'am, said one of the little girls, but we are not. Well, to be sure, remarked Mrs. Baines, but you have a very good mamma, my little dears. Mamma is good to us, said Mary. But God is the only real good person, added Amelia. Mrs. Howard was rather surprised, but as the storm was still getting more frightful, she moved her chair, shut the window, and sat in the middle of the room, the two little ones in their fear clinging to her, whilst she put an arm around each of them. Mrs. Baines went out to close the windows, and they were left together. Peel came after peel, and flash after flash, and the old lady and children trembled. We ought not to fear, said Mrs. Howard. It is strong, as not the lightning in the hands of God. We will try not to be afraid, said the little ones, and they clung closer to Mrs. Howard. And now there came a fearful hailstorm, patter, patter, against the window, and when the hail ceased, the rain came pouring down. Now, my loves, let us thank God, said Mrs. Howard. The danger is past. The little ones, with that quick obedience which we see in children only who are well brought up, joined their hands and said, Thank God! 
but they expressed some fear lest their mother should be frightened about them. "'We will see about that,' said Mrs. Howard, and she rang the handbell which always stood on the table, for bells were not then fixed on cranks and wires in every room as they are now. Up came Mrs. Baines again, and told the little ones that their mother knew where they were, for she had sent her a message by the boy. "'Then we can stay, ma'am,' said the children, quite pleased, and Mrs. Howard asked to have the dinner sent up, requesting Mrs. Baines to make up a little more from her own pantry, if she could. "'That shall be done, ma'am,' she answered, and she added some eggs and bacon and a currant tart to Mrs. Howard's four bones of roast lamb. "'We should like to dine with you, ma'am,' said one of the little girls, "'and to drink tea with you sometimes.' Mrs. Howard did not yet know one from the other, but she felt that all her love for children was burning up again in her heart. "'I am old, my dears,' she answered, "'and cannot bear noise and bustle. If you can be quiet, I shall be glad to see you often, but if you tire me, I cannot have you.' "'I hope we shall be quiet,' they answered, and then they asked her if she was very, very old. She told them she was eighty-two, and they said to each other, then we must be very quiet. The maid came in to lay the cloth, and they seemed quite amused by looking at her. The table was very small, but they said there would be quite room, and by Mrs. Howard's direction they went to her bedroom, took off their bonnets, and the maid combed their pretty curling hair. They behaved as well as children could possibly do at a table, though they prattled a little, and told Mrs. Howard of the animals they had at home, their kittens and the old cat, and an owl in the garden called Rolf, and many other things. When the dinner was removed, Mrs. Howard said she had a great treat for them. What is it, ma'am? they said. Something very nice, replied the old lady. And going to the corner cupboard, she brought out a doll's cradle, and a small trunk full of doll's clothes, and the two new dolls both wrapped in the paper in which they had come from London. Now, she said, these are dolls which I keep for my visitors and when you are here you may play with them. I do not call them yours, only when you are here, but you may choose which you will call your own in this house. Their names are Mary and Amelia. Oh, ma'am! Oh, ma'am! cried the children. They were too glad to say another word. You may take out the clothes from the trunk and dress them, but before you go you must put on their night dresses and put them to bed in the cradle and restore all the clothes to the trunk. The little ones quite trembled with joy. They were past speaking. Now, said Mrs. Howard, go into the bow window. The lightning is past. I must keep in my chair, and you must not disturb me. If the day was finer, I should let you go into the garden to play, but today you cannot. The happy little girls went with the dolls into the bow window, and Mrs. Howard got her usual short sleep. They did not make any noise. In all their behavior, they showed that they had been well brought up. They drank tea with Mrs. Howard, and were very busy after tea in showing all the clothes to their old kind friend, and in packing them up in the trunk, and putting the dolls in the cradle, and restoring all the things to the place from whence they had been taken. Mrs. Howard saw them kiss the dolls, and heard them wish them a good night when they had done. Mrs. Simmons had sent her green market cart and cloaks for the little girls. When the cart came, they both kissed Mrs. Howard and asked her if they had been quiet. Very quiet, my dears, she answered. Then may we come again? You may, my darlings, answered the old lady, and next Saturday shall be the day, if all is well. The fair little creatures did come on the day fixed, and the man who fetched them home that night brought Mrs. Howard a small cream cheese and several pats of fresh butter, with many, many thanks from Mrs. Simmons for her great kindness to her children. From the day of the thunderstorm till the end of the summer, the little girl spent Saturday afternoon every week with Mrs. Howard, and now and then stopped an hour with her on other days, and never passed the window without speaking to her, after coming in with flowers, or fruit, or a fresh egg, or some little thing from the garden or poultry yard. Thus a friendship grew between the old lady and these little girls that one might have thought that Mrs. Howard must have been their grandmother. Often and often she would hear them read a chapter or repeat a hymn and do what she could to improve their minds. 
She taught them to sing some fine old psalm tunes, and she also taught them some new stitches in the samplers they were working. Many times she walked between them a little way in the wood whilst they carried the dolls, and in these walks she often told them stories, so that they loved her more and more every day, and tried more and more to please her. All this time, Mrs. Simmons had been so busy with the work of the farm that she had not found the time to come herself to thank Mrs. Howard for all she was doing for her little ones, and it was rather strange that all this time she had understood that the kind old lady's name was Johnson. The children never called her anything but our nice lady, and never thought of any other name for her. But the harvest time being over, Mr. Simmons told his wife that she must not put off calling on the lady any longer. And be sure he said, that you take something nice in your hand, or let the boy carry it after you, some nice cakes and butter pats, or anything else, and you may as well go and meet the children as they come home this evening, and go in with them. Mrs. Simmons was one of those old-fashioned wives who never went anywhere but the church, and as her church was not at Pangburn, she seldom passed the wood house. She, however, made up her basket of presents and having dressed herself neatly, she took the boy and went to meet her children. She met them a little above the wood house, and they turned back with her, and soon brought her to the door of Mrs. Howard's parlor. There they knocked, and the old lady, having called them to come in, the twins entered, leading their mother. But how great was their surprise when their mother, at the sight of Mrs. Howard, uttered a cry, ran forwards, and threw her arms around the old lady's neck. "'Oh, dear, dear Mrs. Howard!' she said is it you can it be you mrs howard did not know mrs simmons and as she drew herself civilly from her arms she said indeed ma'am i have not the pleasure of knowing you not remember polly bennett replied mrs simmons but i remember you my best and dearest friend and shall remember you for i have cause to do so when time shall be no more mrs howard now herself came forward and kissed mrs simmons the tears stood in the old lady's eyes, and she placed her old, thin hands in the other's. "'And are you,' she said, "'the mother of these dear little girls? And have I lived near you so long and not known you? Now I think I can trace the features. Sit down, my dear friend, and tell me all about yourself and your family.' "'I have not much to say,' answered Mrs. Simmons. "'My parents are dead, and my brother living far off, and I have been blessed beyond my deservings.' and a good husband and these dear children dear indeed said mrs howard but how can i value enough what you have done for me mrs howard said mrs simmons and through me in some sort to my mother and father before their death i do not understand you said mrs howard mrs simmons then told the old lady how she had been affected by the last kindness which she had shown to her and her brother when you sent for us dear madam we accepted your invitation because we expected presents, but with presents we expected also what we had well deserved, a severe lecture. But when you spoke to us, as you did, with such amazing kindness, when you even almost begged our pardons if you had been hard upon us, which you never were, when you spoke to us of our Saviour, whilst your eyes filled with tears, we were cut to the heart and filled with shame, and we then resolved to read the Bibles you gave us, and we never could forget your words. The work, indeed, is of God, but you, dear lady, were made the minister of it in the commencement. You were the first person who made me and my brother to understand that the new spirit imparted by God to his children is a spirit of love. Mrs. Simmons said much more. Indeed, she went on speaking till Mrs. Howard burst into tears of joy and thankfulness. The little ones were frightened to see their mother and Mrs. Howard weeping, and could not at first be made to understand that they were crying for very joy. When they understood that Mrs. Howard was an old dear friend of their mother's, they became happy again. What a pleasant party there was that evening in the bow window! The white cakes and fresh butter and cream were added to the feast, and what a delightful story was there to tell Mr. Simmons when his wife and children got home! Told the old lady! said Mr. Simmons, that I should be ever ready to serve her to the last drop of my blood. From that time, continued Mrs. Goodrich, till the death of Mrs. Howard, which happened in her ninetieth year, 
Mr. and Mrs. Simmons were a son and daughter to her. Mary and Amelia never both left her, sometimes one and sometimes both, being continually with her. This is a beautiful story, said Lucy. I wish it was longer, said Henry. Can't you tell us more, ma'am? Not now, my dear, said Mrs. Goodrich. We must go in now, and, indeed, I know not that I have any more to tell. It was late when the family got home. As they were returning, Mrs. Fairchild told Mr. Fairchild the story of old Mrs. Howard, which pleased him much. End of section 18 Recording by Audrey Gicker Chapter 19 of The Fairchild Family This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter O'Malley The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood The Fair Little Lady it was not long after that delightful day at Mrs. Goodrich's when the children, having done their morning lessons, had just gone out of the hall door on their way to Henry's arbor when they heard the wheels of a carriage sounding from a distance. The sound was not like that of a wagon which goes along heavily, crushing and breaking the stones in its passage, whilst the feet of the horses came down with a heavy beat along the ground. But horses and wheels went lightly, and as if the carriage was coming near quickly. Very few light carriages passed that way, and therefore when anything of the kind was heard or seen, everybody left off what they were doing to look, let them be ever so busy. Lucy and Emily and Henry ran down to the gate which opened on the road. Henry climbed to the top of the highest bar, but the little girls stood on one side where they were half hidden by a rose bush. When they were got there, the carriage was heard more plainly, and Henry was hardly fixed upon the top of the gate before John came up with a hoe and a basket in his hand. "'So, Master Henry,' he said, "'you are come to see the coach? "'I just caught sight of it as it went round the corner below, "'and I promise you, it is worth seeing. "'It beats Sir Charles Nobles to nothing. "'But there they come.' "'At first there appeared a groom, "'dressed in a glazed hat and a livery and shining boots. "'And he was riding a fine horse, and he went forward quickly. "'He had several dogs running by him. "'Lucy and Emily were glad that John, with his hoe, was close by.' for they did not love strange dogs. But the groom and his dogs were very soon out of sight. He was riding on to see that the gates were open where the coach was going. Immediately afterward the coach came in sight, and a fine new coach it was. And there were four horses, with postilions whipping and cutting away, and ladies and gentlemen in the coach. Lucy and Emily and Henry did not look at the grown people, but at the very pretty little lady, of Emily's age perhaps, who was looking out of the window on their side. They saw her face, which was fair and very pale, and they saw her curling light hair and her blue satin hat, which had white feathers in it, and they knew that she saw them, for she rather smiled and looked pleased, and turned to speak about them, they thought, to the lady next to her. But the coach was gone in a minute, not rattling like a hack chase, but making a sort of low rumbling sound, and that sound was not heard long. Who are those, said Henry, as he stood at the very top of the gate like a bird upon a perch, who are those fine people? They are great folks, replied John, who come to live at Sir Charles Noble's. They call them honorable by way of distinction, the honorable Mr. and Mrs. Darwell, and they are immensely rich, and that is their only child, for they have but one, and she, to be sure, is no small treasure, as people say, and they never can make enough of her. What's her name, John? asked Lucy. Don't ask me, miss, replied John, for though I have heard the name, I could not pretend to speak it properly. It is so unaccountably fine. I should like to hear it, said Emily. And that you will be sure to do soon, miss, answered John, for all the country is talking about the family, and they say they are uncommon grand. But John, said Henry, when will you come and nail the benches in my hut? Will you come now? Shall I fetch the hammer and nails? No, master, replied John, you need not fetch them, for I have them here in this basket, and was going there when I saw the coach. Away then, cried Henry, jumping from the top of the gate and running before whilst John followed close behind him, and Lucy and Emily came afterwards, talking of the fair little lady. End of chapter 19 Section 20 of The Fairchild Family This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. Story of a Holiday. One day a letter came from Mrs. Goodrich to say that she was going early the next day to the town in a hired chaise, and that she hoped to be back again in the evening. She added that, as she should be quite alone, it would be a great pleasure to her to take up Mrs. Fairchild and one of the little people to go with her to town, and she would set them down again at their gate. Mrs. Fairchild thought this a very neighbourly offer, and it was soon settled that she should go and take Lucy with her, and that Mr. Fairchild should get the horse he often rode and attend the carriage. Lucy very much pressed her mother to take Emily instead of herself, but it was Lucy's turn to go out when there was a scheme only for one, and I don't think that Emily would have taken it from her on any account. So an answer was written to Mrs. Goodrich, and her kind invitation accepted. There was a good deal of talking and settling with Lucy about what Emily and Henry wanted her to get for them in the town before they went to bed. Emily had one shilling and sixpence, and Henry tenpence, and it was of great consequence to them that this money should be spent to the best advantage. It was at last settled that Lucy should choose a book for each of them. Henry's book was to be about a boy, and the rest of their money, if any was left, was to be spent as Lucy thought might please them best. So she took their money and put it into her purse with her own. She had two shillings, and she had settled it in her own mind that she would buy nothing for herself but spend some, if not all of it, for her sister and brother. The family were all up at six o'clock, and soon afterwards they might be seen seated before the open window of the parlour at breakfast, those who were going being quite ready. Emily and Henry, who were to be left, were to have no lessons to do, but their father and mother advised them not to tire themselves in the early part of the day by running about, but to amuse themselves during the very hottest hours with something quiet. Mr. Fairchild also reminded them that they must not go beyond the bounds in which they were always allowed to play. I hope we shall be good mamma, said Emily. I hope we shall, and Henry said the same. Henry ran out to the gate to look for the carriage after he had taken breakfast, and he got to the very highest bar and looked along the road, which he could see a great way, because it came down a steep hill from Mrs. Goodrich's house. It was hardly more than a black speck on the white road when he first saw it, and then he lost sight of it as it descended into the valley, and he heard it rattle and jingle before he got sight of it again. But when he was sure of it, he ran to the house, and you might have heard Lucy's name from the very cellar to the roof. Emily was with Lucy in their little room, and she was holding her gloves while Lucy tied her bonnet and she was talking over the things that were to be bought when their brother's voice came up the stairs as loud and sharp as if a stagecoach was coming, which would not wait one moment for those who were going. I hope we shall not get into a scrape today, said Emily. Henry has forgotten the day when Mamma and Papa went out, and we behaved so ill. What can we do to keep ourselves out of mischief? Lucy had no time to answer, for Henry was at the door, and there was such a rub-a-dub-dub upon it that her voice could not have been heard. At the same minute, the hack chaise had come jingling up to the gate, and Mrs. Goodrich was looking out with her pleasant smiling face. John, too, had brought the horse to the gate, and everybody who belonged to the house was soon out upon the grass plot. The dog was there, and quite as set up as Henry himself, and Betty came too, though nobody knew why. Mrs. Fairchild got in first, and then Lucy, 
and everybody said good-bye as if those who were going were not to come back for a month and the postboy cracked his whip and mr fairchild mounted his horse and away they went emily and henry watched them till the turn of the road prevented them from seeing any longer and then henry said let us run to the chestnut trees at the top of the round hill and then we shall be able to see the carriage again going up on the other side i saw it come down from mrs goodrich's stay but one moment said emily and she ran upstairs put on her bonnet and tippet and was down again in one minute with her doll on her arm and a little book in her hand come come said henry and away they ran along a narrow path among the shrubs in the garden out at a little gate and up the green slope they were very soon at the top of the small hill and under the shade of the chestnut trees they passed through the grove to the side which was farthest from their house and then they sat down on the dry and bare root of one of the trees for a minute or more they could not see the carriage because it was down in the valley beneath them and the road there was much shaded by willows and wick elms and other trees that loved the neighbourhood of water for the brook which turned the mill was down there but when the carriage began to go up on the other side they saw it quite plain there was the postboy in his yellow jacket jogging up and down on his saddle and mr fairchild sometimes a little before and sometimes a little behind the carriage henry was still in high spirits he was apt to be set up by any change and when he was set up he was almost sure to get into a scrape unless something could be thought of to settle him down quietly emily had thought of something and got it ready but whilst the carriage was in sight nothing was to be done for henry had picked up a branch which had fallen from one of the trees and as he sat on the root was jogging up and down waving his branch like a whip and imitating those sort of odd noises which drivers make to their horses such as gee up so ho and now and then he made a sort of smacking with his lips are you driving a wagon or a coach asked emily a coach to be sure said henry don't you see that i've got a chaise from the red lion and that i am driving mrs fairchild and mrs goodrich and miss lucy fairchild to the town and here we go on the carriage was long getting up the hill for it was a very steep one but when it had reached the top it got in among trees again and was soon out of sight and then emily said now henry i am going to curl my doll's hair and dress her over again for she is not tidy and i have got a little book here which you may read to me what book is it said henry you never saw it she answered mamma found it yesterday in a box where she keeps many old things she did not know that she had saved it it was hers when she was a little child and she supposed it was lost let me see it emily said henry will you read it to me then asked emily henry was a good-natured boy and loved his sisters and had much pleasure in doing what they wished him to do he therefore said at once yes threw away his branch of fir and took the book this little book which mrs fairchild had found in her old chest could not have been much less than a hundred years old it was the size of a penny book and had a covering of gilt paper with many old cuts its title was the history of the little boy who when running after the echo found his papa when henry had seen how many pictures there were and when he had read the title he was quite in a hurry to begin the story and emily was so much pleased at hearing it although she had read it before that she forgot her doll altogether and let her lie quietly on her lap End of chapter 20section 21 of the fairchild family this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Recording by Beth Thomas. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. Little Edwy and the Echo. It was in the time of our good Queen Anne, when none of the trees in the great forest of Norwood near London had begun to be cut down, that a very rich gentleman and lady lived there. Their name was Lawley. They had a fine old house and a large garden with a wall all around it. And the woods were so close upon this garden that some of the high trees spread their branches over the top of the wall. Now, this lady and gentleman were very proud and very grand, and despised all people poorer than themselves, and there were none whom they despised more than the gypsies, who lived in the forest all about. There was no place in all England then so full of gypsies as the forest of Norwood. Mr. and Mrs. Lawley had been married many years, and had no children. At length they had one son. They called him Edwy and they felt they could not make too much of him or dress him too fine when he was just old enough to run about without help he used to wear his trousers inlaid with the finest lace with gold studs and laced robings he had a plume of feathers in his cap which was of velvet with a button of gold to fasten it up in front under the feathers so that whoever saw him with the servants who attended him used to say whose child is that he was a pretty boy too and when his first sorrow came he was still too young to have learned any of the proud ways of his father and mother no one is so rich as to be above the reach of trouble therefore pride and self-sufficiency are never suitable to the state of man trouble was long in coming to mr and mrs lawley but when it came it was only the more terrible one day when the proud parents had been absent some hours on a visit to a friend a few miles distant edwy was nowhere to be found on their return his waiting-maid was gone and had taken away his finest clothes at least these were also missing the poor father and mother were almost beside themselves with grief and all the gentlemen and magistrates rose up together to find the child and discover those who had stolen him but all in vain of course the gypsies were suspected and well examined but nothing could be made of it nor was it ever made out in what way the little boy was got off but got off he had been by the gypsies and carried away to a country among hills on the borders of the two shires of worcester and hereford did i not know it cried henry as he stopped to turn over a leaf i knew it from the first that the gypsies had him in that country he continued as he read on there is a valley where two watercourses meet deep in a bottom where there are many trees and many bushes and much broken irregular ground where also there are rocks and caves and holes in these rocks and every possible convenience for the haunt of wild people to this place the gypsies carried the little boy and there they kept him all the following winter warm in a hut with some of their own children they had stripped him of his velvet and feathers and lace and gold clasps and studs and clothed him in rags and daubed his fair skin with mud but they fed him well and after a little while he seemed to be unconscious of any change now the part which comes next of this true and wonderful history has nothing to go upon but the confused and imperfect recollections of a little child the story nowhere tells the age of edwy when he was stolen but he had been lost to his parents from the time that the leaves in the forest of norwood were becoming sere and falling off till the sweet spring was far advanced towards the summer probably the cunning gypsies had hoped that during the long months of the winter the little child would quite forget the few words which he had learned to speak distinctly in his father's house or that he would forget also to call himself edwy or to cry as he remembered that he often did oh mamma mamma papa papa come to little edwy the gypsies tried to teach him that his name was not edwy but jack or tom or some such name and to make him say mam and dad and to call himself the gypsy boy born in a barn but after he had learned all these words whenever anything hurt or frightened him he would cry again mamma papa come to edwy the gypsies could not take him out, of course, whilst there was danger of his breaking out this way, and after he came to that hut in the valley he did not remember ever going out with any of the people when they went their rounds of begging and pilfering and buying rags, telling fortunes meanwhile, as gypsies always do. When left behind there were always two or three children, a great girl, an old woman, or a sick person staying with him, until the day which set him free from his troubles. It was in the month of May who would not like to live like a gypsy in a wood if all the year round was like that month of may it was about noon and edwy who had been up before the sun to breakfast with those who were going out for their days begging and stealing had fallen asleep on a bed of dry leaves in the hut as soon as most of the people were gone one old woman who was too lame to tramp was left with him 
He slept long, and when he awoke he sat up on his bed of leaves, and looked about him to see who was with him. He saw no one within the hut, and no one at the doorway. Little children have a great dread of being alone. He listened to hear if there were any voices without, but he could hear nothing but the rush of a waterfall close by, and the distant cry of sheep and lambs. The next thing the little one remembered that he did was to get up and go out of the door of the hut. The hut was built of rude rafters and wattles in the front of a cave or hole in a rock. It was low down in the glen at the edge of the brook, a little below the waterfall. When the child came out, he looked anxiously for somebody, and was more and more frightened when he could see no creature of his own kind amid all the green leaves, and all along the water's edge, above and below. Where was the old woman all this time? Who can say? But perhaps not far off. Perhaps she might have been deaf, and though near, did not hear the noise made by the child when he came out of the hut. Edwy did not remember how long he stood by the brook but this is certain that the longer he felt himself to be alone the more frightened he became and soon began to fancy terrible things there was towards the top of the rock from which the waters fell a huge old yew tree or rather bush which hung forward over the fall it looked very black in comparison with the tender green of the fresh leaves of the neighbouring trees and the white and glittering spray of the water edwy looked at it and fancied that it moved his eye was deceived by the dancing motion of the water whilst he looked and looked some great black bird came out from the midst of it ushering a harsh croaking noise the little boy could bear no more he turned away from the terrible bush and the terrible bird and ran down the valley leaving hut and all behind and crying as he always did when hurt or frightened papa mamma oh come oh come to edwy he ran and ran whilst his little bare feet were pierced with pebbles and his legs torn with briars until he came to where the valley became narrower and where one might have thought the rocks and banks on each side had been cleft by the hand of a giant so nicely would they have fitted could they have been brought together again the brook ran along a pebble channel between these rocks and banks and there was a rude path which went in a line with the brook a path which was only used by the gipsies and a few poor cottagers whose shortest way from the great road at the end of the valley to their own houses was by that solitary way as edwy ran he still cried mamma mamma papa papa oh come oh come to edwy and he kept up his cry from time to time as he found breath to utter it till his young voice began to be returned in a sort of hollow murmur when first he observed this he was even more frightened than before he stood and looked around and then he turned with his back towards the hut and ran and ran again till he got deeper amongst the rocks he stopped again for the high black banks frightened him still more and setting up his young voice he called again and his call was the same as before he had scarcely finished his cry when a voice from whence he knew not seemed to answer him it said come come to edwy it said it once it said it twice it said it a third time but each time more distant the child looked up the child looked round he could never describe what he felt but in his great agitation he cried more loudly oh papa mamma come come to poor edwy it was an echo the echo of the rocks which repeated the words of the child and the more loudly he spoke the more perfect was the echo but he could catch only the last few words this time he only heard poor poor edwy edwy had not lost all recollection of some far distant happy home and of some kind parents far away and now at that minute he believed that what the echo said came from them and that they were calling to him and saying poor poor edwy but where were those who called to him alas he could not tell were they in the holes and the rocks his mind was then used to the notion of people living in caves or were they at the top of the rocks or were they up high in the bright blue heavens it would have been a sorrowful sight to behold that pretty boy looking up at the rocks and the sky and down among the reeds and sedges and alders by the side of the brook for some persons to whom the voice might belong in hopes of seeing that same lady he sometimes dreamed of and that kind gentleman he used to call papa and to see how the tears gushed from his eyes when he could not find any one after a while he called again and called louder still come come was his cry again edwy is lost 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 echo repeated the last words as before lost 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 and now the voice sounded from behind him for he had moved round a corner of the rock the child heard the voice behind and turned and ran that way and stopped and called again and then heard it the other way and next he shrieked from fear 
and the echo returned the shriek once more, and thrice finishing off with broken sounds, which to Edwy's ears appeared as if somebody a long way off was mocking him. His terror was now at its highest. Indeed, he could never remember what he did next, or when he turned to go down the valley. But turn he did, after having run back many paces. His steps, however, were guided by one whose eye was never off him, even his kind and heavenly father and on he went neither heeding stones nor briars every step taking him nearer to the mouth of the glen and the entrance of the great high road and who had been driving along that road in a fine carriage with four horses who cried henry fairchild turning over another leaf who but his own papa but i must go on mr and mrs lawley had given up all hopes of finding their little boy near norwood and they had set out in their coach to go all over the country in search of him they had come the day before to a town near to the place where the gipsies had kept edwy all the winter and there they had made many inquiries particularly about any gipsies who might be in the habit of haunting that country but the people there were afraid of the gipsies and did not like to say anything which might bring them into trouble with them the gipsies never did much mischief in the way of stealing near their own huts and were always civil when civilly treated the poor father and mother therefore could get no information there and the next morning they had come on across the country and along the road into which the gipsies valley opened wherever these unhappy parents saw a wild country full of woods and where the ground was rough and broken they thought if possible more than ever of their lost child and at those times mrs lawley always began to weep indeed she had done little else since she had missed her boy the travellers first came in sight of the gipsies valley and the vast sweep of woods on each side of it just as the horses had dragged the coach to the top of a very high hill or bank over which the road went and then also those in the coach saw before them a very steep descent so steep that it was thought right to put the drag upon the wheels mr lawley proposed that they should get out and walk down the hill mrs lawley consented the coach stopped every one got down from it and mr lawley walked first followed closely by his servant william while Mrs. Lawley came on afterwards, leaning on the arm of her favourite little maid Barbara. The poor parents, when their grief pressed most heavily on them, were easier with other people than with each other. "'Oh, Barbara,' said Mrs. Lawley, when the others were gone forward, "'when I remember the pretty ways of my boy, and think of his lovely face and gentle temper, and of the way in which I lost him, my heart is ready to break.' and i often remember with shame and sorrow the pride in which i indulged before it pleased god to bring this dreadful affliction upon me the little maid who walked by her wept too but she said oh dear mistress if god would give us but the grace to trust in him our grief would soon be at an end i wish we could trust in him for he can and will do everything for us to make us happy ah oh, barbara said the lady and she could add no more she went on in silence mr lawley walked on before with the servant he too was thinking of his boy and his eye ranged over the wild scene on the right hand of the road he saw a raven rise from the wood he heard its croaking noise it was perhaps the same black bird that had frightened edwy william remarked to his master that there was a sound of falling water and said there were sure to be brooks running in the valley mr lawley was however too sad to talk to his servant he could only say i don't doubt it and then they both walked on in silence. They came to the bottom of the valley even before the carriage got there. They found that the brook came out upon the road at that place, and that the road was carried over it by a little stone bridge. Mr. Lawley stopped upon the bridge. He leaned on the low wall, and looked upon the dark mouth of the glen. William stood a little behind him. William was young. His hearing and all his senses were very quick. As he stood there, he thought he heard a voice but the rattling of the coach-wheels over the stony road prevented his hearing it distinctly he heard the cry again but the coach was coming nearer and making it still more difficult for him to catch the sound his master was surprised to see him vault over the low parapet of the bridge the next moment and run up the narrow path which led up the glen it was the voice of edwy and the answering echo which william had heard he had got at just a sufficient distance from the sound of the coach-wheels at the moment when the echo had returned poor little edwy's wildest shriek the sound was fearful broken and not natural but william was not easily put out he looked back to his master and his look was such that mr lawley immediately left the bridge to follow him though hardly knowing why they both went on up the glen the man being many yards before the master another cry and another answering echo again reached the ear of william proceeding as from before him the young man again looked at his master and ran on 
the last cry had been heard by mr lawley who immediately began to step with increasing quickness after his servant though as the valet turned and turned among the rocks he soon lost sight of him mr lawley was by this time come into the very place where the echo had most astonished edwy because each reverberation which it had made seemed to sound from opposite sides and here he heard the cry again and heard it distinctly it was the voice of a child first crying no 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 papa mamma oh come oh come and then a fearful shriek or laugh of some wild woman's voice mr lawley rushed on winding swiftly between the rocks whilst various voices in various tones which were all repeated in strange confusion by the echoes rang in his ears but amid all these sounds he thought only of that one plaintive cry papa mamma oh come oh come suddenly he came out to where he saw his servant again and with him an old woman who looked like a witch she had the hand of a little ragged child to which she held firmly though the baby for such almost he was struggled hard to get free crying papa mamma oh come oh come william was arguing with the woman and he had got the other hand of the child mr lawley rushed on trembling with hope trembling with fear could this boy be his edwy william had entered his service since he had lost his child he could not therefore know him nor could he himself be sure so strange so altered did the baby look but edwy knew his own father in a moment he could not run to meet him for he was tightly held by the gypsy but he cried oh papa papa is come to edwy the old woman knew mr lawley and saw that the child knew him she had been trying to persuade william that the boy was her grandchild but it was all up with her now she let the child's hand go and whilst he was flying to his father's arms she disappeared into some well-known hole or hollow in the neighbouring rocks who can pretend to describe the feelings of the father when he felt the arms of his long-lost boy clinging round his neck and his little heart beating against his own or who could say what the mother felt when she saw her husband come out of the mouth of the valley bearing in his arms the little ragged child could it be her own her edwy she could hardly be sure of her happiness till the boy held out his arms to her and cried mamma mamma this story is too short said henry i wish it had been twice as long i want to hear more of that little boy and of the gypsies it is getting very hot said emily when they had done talking let us go into the house and we will not come out again until it is cool i hope we shall not be naughty to-day henry but do what papa and mamma will think right come then replied henry and they went back to the house and spent the rest of the morning in their playroom and i am sure that they were very happy in a quiet way for henry was making a grotto of moss and shells fixed on a board with paste and emily was just beginning to make a little hermit to be in the grotto till they both changed their minds a little and turned the grotto into a gypsy's hut and instead of a hermit an old woman was made to stand at the door End of section twenty one Section 22 of The Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. Further Story of a Holiday the evening was very cool and pleasant when emily and henry went out to play mary bush had given henry a young magpie she had taught it to say a few words to the great delight of the children it could say good morning how do you do oh pretty mag mag's hungry give mag her dinner a bit of meat for poor mag to be sure the bird's words did not come out very clearly but it was quite enough, as Henry said, if he understood them. Mag had a large wicker cage, which was generally hung up on a nail in the kitchen, but her master, being very fond of her company, used often to take the cage down with the bird in it, and take it into his playroom, or hang it upon the bough of a tree before the parlour window, that Mag might enjoy the fresh air. Sometimes, too, Henry let the bird out, that she might enjoy herself a little, for as the feathers of one of her wings were cut close, she could not fly, and she was very tame, and never having known liberty, she was as fond of her cage when she was tired or hungry as some old ladies are of their parlours. 
Let us take Mag with us out of doors, said Henry, and the cage was taken down and carried out between the two children, whilst Mag kept chattering all the way, and was, if anything, more pert and brisk than spoiled magpies generally are. They first went to the hut and set the cage on the bench, whilst Henry and Emily busied themselves in putting a few things to rights about the place, which had been set wrong by a hard shower, which had happened the night before. There were a few fallen leaves, which had blown into the hut from some laurels growing on the outside, and Henry said, I do hate laurels, for they are always untidy, and scattering about their yellow leaves when all the trees about them are in their best order. Whilst the children were going in and out after these leaves, to pick them up and throw them out of sight, Mag kept hopping from one perch to another, wriggling her tail, twisting her head to one side and another, and crying, Oh, pretty Mag! Mag's hungry! in a voice more like a scolding than anything else. What now, mistress? said Henry. She is not in the best possible temper, replied Emily. She wants to be out, answered Henry. She does not like to be shut up. But, said Emily, it would be dangerous to let her out here, so far from the house and amongst the trees. Henry was in a humour common not only to small but great boys on occasions. He chose just then to think himself wiser than his sister, and without another word, he opened the cage door and out walked Mag, with the air of a person who had gained a point and despised those who had given way to her. At first she strutted round the inside of the hut crying, Oh pretty Mag, with a vast deal of importance, and then she walked out at the entrance, trailing her tail after her like a lady in a silk gown. She will get amongst the shrubs, said Emily, and how shall we get her out of them? Never fear, returned Henry, you know that she cannot fly. One would have thought that the bird knew what they said, for whilst they spoke, she laid her head on one side, as if turning an ear, stood still a minute, and then paraded onward. I say paraded, for if she had been walking at a coronation, she could not have taken more state upon herself. Let us see which way she goes, said Henry. And the two children walked after her, Emily bringing the light wicker cage with her. Mag knew as well that they were after her, as if she had been what the country people call a Christian, meaning a human creature, and she walked on, not taking to the shrubs, which grew thick about the hut, but along a bit of grass plot, at the farthest end of which was a row of laurels and other evergreens. These trees hid the backyard of the house from the garden and a small portion of land near to it, which Mr. Fairchild had given up to flowering shrubs and ornamental trees. Behind these evergreens was a row of palings, and as Mag drew near to these laurels, Henry ran forward crying, She will get through the palings, if we don't mind, and into the yard. Mag let him come near to her, and then gave a long hop, standing still. He was only at arm's length from her. Then she gave a second hop, alighting under a branch of laurel, and when Henry rushed forward to catch her there, she made another spring, and was hidden among the leaves. Stop, stop, cried Henry. Stop there, Emily, where you are and I will run round and drive her back, and you must be ready to catch her. And away he ran to the nearest wicket, and was on the other side of the laurels and the paling in the fold yard, not a minute afterwards. Emily heard him making a noise on the opposite side of the shrubs, as if he thought Mag was between him and his sister among the laurels, and he called also to her, bidding her to be ready when the bird appeared. Emily watched and watched, but no bird came out, and not a minute afterwards she heard Henry cry, Oh, there, there, I see her going across the yard towards the barn. Come round, leave the cage, come quickly, Emily. She obeyed the call. In an instant, down went the cage on the grass. She was at the wicket and in the fold yard in a minute, and there she saw Mag pacing along the yard in her coronation step towards the barn, being to all appearance in no manner of hurry, and seeming to be quite unconscious of the near neighbourhood of her master and his sister. "'Hush, hush!' whispered Henry. 
don't make a noise and the two children trod softly and slowly towards the side of the yard where the bird was as if they had been treading on eggs or groping through the dark and afraid of a post at every step they thought that maggie was not conscious of their approach though emily did not quite like the cunning way in which the bird laid her head on every side as if the better to hear the sound once again henry was at arm's length from her and had even extended himself as far forward as he could and stretched out his hand to catch her when his foot slipped and down he came at full length in the dust at the same instant maggie made a hop and turned to look back at henry from the very lowest edge of the thatch of the barn or rather of a place where the roof of the barn was extended downwards over a low wood house henry was up in a minute not heeding the thick brown powder with which his face and hands and pinafore were covered and emily had scarcely come up to the place where he had fallen before he was endeavouring to catch at the bird on the low ledge to which she had hopped but maggie had no mind to be thus caught she had gotten her liberty and was disposed to keep it a little longer and when she saw the hand near her she made another hop and appeared higher up on the slanting thatch after some little talking over the matter henry proposed getting up the thatch and how he managed to persuade emily to do the same or whether she did not want much persuasion is not known but this is very certain that they both soon climbed upon this thatch having found a ladder in the yard which john used in some of his work and having set it against the wood-house and from the top of the wood-house made their way to the roof of the barn now we shall have her cried henry as he made his way on his hands and knees along the sloping thatch and again his hand was stretched out to seize the bird when she made another upward hop and was far off as she had been when she sat on the edge of the thatch and he lay in the dust what a tiresome creature cried henry i am sure she does it on purpose said emily only to vex us and there she sits looking down upon us and crying oh pretty mag i knew when she was in the hut that she was in a wicked humour let us sit down here a while said henry and seem not to be thinking about her let us seem to be looking another way perhaps she will then come near to us of her own accord we will try replied emily and the children seated themselves quietly on the thatch and if they had not been uneasy about the magpie would never have been better pleased with their seats but it might seem that mag did not choose to be thus passed over and not to have her friends busy and troubled about her for as soon as emily and henry had planned not to notice her and to seem to look another way she began to cry in her usual croaking voice how do you do sir good morning sir oh pretty mag mag's hungry what a tiresome bird it is said henry impatiently and emily began to coax and invite her to come near her holding out her hand as if she had something in it mag was not a bit behind in returning emily's empty compliments for she hopped towards her and very nearly within reach of her hand still crying good morning oh pretty mag emily now thought she had her and was putting out her arm to catch her when the bird turned swiftly round and hopping up the thatch took her station on the very point of the roof henry lost no time but turning on his hands and knees crept up the slope of the roof and was followed by his sister who was quite as active as himself they were not long in reaching the place where mag was perched but before they could catch hold of her she had walked down very leisurely on the other side and hopped off into the field henry was after her half sliding down the thatch but emily more wisely chose to go back by the wood-house as she had come and in a very few minutes afterwards they were in the field henry had never lost sight of his bird since he had found her in the fold-yard but he was none the nearer to catching her she waited at a respectful distance till emily came up between walking and hopping made her way across the field and perched herself on the upper bar of a gate the children were now in serious trouble because they were not suffered when alone to go beyond the bounds of the next field 
Beyond the second field was the lane into which they had followed the pig on that unfortunate day in which they had been left under the care of John, and if the magpie should go over into this lane, what could they do? They did wish to obey their parents this day. In order, however, to prevent this misfortune, Henry did the worst thing he possibly could. He began to run and cry, Mag, Mag, with a raised voice, whilst the bird, as if resolved to torment him, hopped forward across the other field, perched herself on the stile, and as he drew near, flew right down from thence into the lane. When Emily came up, there was poor Henry sitting across the stile in the greatest possible trouble, being more than half tempted to break bounds, and yet feeling that he ought not to do it. And there was Mag, walking up and down, pecking and picking, and wagging her tail, and now and then looking with one cunning eye towards her little master, as much as to say, Why don't you come after me? Here I am. It is often by very small things that the strength of our resolutions to be good is tested. Henry was hardly tried, yet strength was given him to resist the temptation, and by Emily's persuasion he was induced to wait a little before he ventured to go down into the lane, and Mag seemed as well content to wait, or rather more so than he was. The children were in hopes that someone might come by, who would help them in their distress, and they had not waited a minute before they could see two children just coming in sight at the very farthest point where the lane was visible from the stile these children were a very ragged boy without shoes stockings or hat about nine or ten years of age and a little girl worse clothed if possible than himself for her petticoat was all in fringes showing her little legs above the ankle they both looked miserably thin. Mag waited saucily till these had come nearly opposite the stile and then only stepped aside, whilst Henry, calling to the boy, told him his trouble, pointing out to the bird to him and asking his help. The boy looked towards the bird and then, turning cheerfully to Henry, he said, Never fear, master, but I'll catch her for you and dropping the hand of the little girl, he pulled off his ragged jacket and crept towards Maggie. Cunning as the creature was, she did not understand that she had a deeper hand to deal with than that of her young master. She therefore let the boy come as near to her as she had let Henry do many times during the chase, and in this way she gave him the opportunity he was seeking of throwing his jacket over her and seizing her as she lay under it. He has her, cried Emily and Henry at once, and the ragged little girl set up quite a shriek of joy. Yes, I has her, added the boy, but she pulls desperate hard and would bite me if she could through the cloth. Suppose I wraps her in it and carries her home for you, for we must not let her loose again. Hark, how she skirls, master and miss. Henry and Emily approved of the scheme, and the boy kept Maggie in the folds of the old jacket, and Emily helped the little girl to get over the stile, and the four children walked quickly towards the house. When they had crossed the two fields, Emily ran forward to fetch the cage, and the boy managed to get Mag into it without getting his fingers bit, after which Henry and Emily had leisure to ask the boy who he was, for they had never seen him before. He told them that his name was Edward, and that his little sister was called Jane, and that they had no father or mother, but lived with their grandmother in a cottage on the common, just by Sir Charles Noble's Park, and that their grandmother was very bad, and could not work, but lay sick in bed, and that they were all half-starved, and he was come out to beg. Miss and Master, added the boy, for we would not starve, nor see Granny dying of hunger. What a sad thing it is that stories of this kind are often told to deceive people and get money out of them on false pretenses. But Emily and Henry saw how thin and ragged these poor children were, and Emily thought of a plan of giving them a supper without taking what they gave from her father. So she proposed her scheme to Henry, and he said, That will just do. I did not think of it. Emily then said to the children, Sit down here, we will take naughty Mag into the house and come back to you. And she and Henry were off in a minute. They ran into Betty and asked her what she had for their supper. 
Betty was shelling peas in the kitchen, and she told them that she was going to cook them for her master and mistress, and she said, I suppose, Miss Emily, you and your brother will sup with your parents tonight? But, if you please, we would rather have our supper now, said Emily. That we would, cried Henry, so please, Betty, do give us something now. Then you must not have a second supper, Master Henry, said Betty, if I give you something to eat now. Very well, Betty, replied both children at once, but we would like it now, instead of waiting later for Papa and Mamma. So Betty gave each a current turnover, a puff, and a slice of bread and some milk. May we take our supper out of doors, Betty, said Emily. If you please, replied Betty, and she put the turnovers, as she called the puffs, into a little basket with two large slices of bread and two cans of milk, and put the basket into Emily's hands. You have made beautiful ears and eyes to the turnovers, Betty, said Henry. I always call them pigs when they are made in that way. And they taste much better, don't they, Master Henry, asked Betty. To be sure they do, answered Henry, and away he walked after his sister. So Emily and Henry gave their supper to the little children, and they were very much pleased with them because, when they had eaten part of the bread and drunk the milk, they asked leave to take what was left home to their grandmother. Emily fetched them a piece of paper to wrap the puffs in, and then she and Henry watched them back into the lane, and afterwards walked quietly home to be ready when their parents and Lucy should come back. End of section 22section 23 of the fair child family this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org your reader is rosie roberts from california the fairchild family by mary martha sherwood the happy evening henry had just finished washing his hands and combing his hair and emily had only that minute changed her pinafore when the distant sound of the carriage was heard Betty was preparing the piece for supper, and John laid the cloth, when Henry and Emily ran out upon the lawn. What a happy moment was that when the carriage stopped at the gate, and John opened the door and let down the step, and Lucy jumped out and ran to meet Emily and Henry. One would have thought that the children had been parted a year instead of a day, and all the family came into the parlour. How nice the peas smell, said Mr. Fairchild, and I really want my supper. So do I, Papa, said Lucy, and so do I, whispered Henry to Emily. But you must not say so, returned Emily. No, no, said Henry firmly, I know that. We agreed upon that before. John came in with a very large basket, well packed out of the chase. Lucy was running to begin to unpack it, when Mr. Fairchild said, Let us have our supper first, dear child, and the basket shall be our dessert. Very well, Papa, answered Lucy and her young heart was filled with joy on account of the things that were in it, though she did not know of things for herself. John came in with a nice smoking leg of lamb, and he then went out and brought some peas and young potatoes, to which he added a hot currant and raspberry pie. Mr. Fairchild said grace and began to help those at the table from the lamb, whilst Mrs. Fairchild served the peas. Lucy being helped, Mr. Fairchild said to Emily, Are you very hungry, my dear? Shall I give you much or little? none thank you papa was the answer a few peas my dear then said her mother none thank you mamma replied emily mrs fairchild offered potatoes or tart none thank you mamma was emily's answer to every offer mrs fairchild seemed rather surprised but was still more so when henry who was always provided with a good appetite gave exactly the same answers which Emily had done. She supposed, however, that the children had supped already and said, What did Betty give you, my dears? Emily told her mother, but colored very much while speaking, and there was something their parents thought rather odd in both their faces. What is it? said Mr. Fairchild. There is some little mystery here. Let us hear it. What has happened? I trust that you have not been playing in the sun and made yourselves unwell. We did, Papa, replied Henry bravely and when the things are taken away we will tell you all about it i do beg said mr fairchild that you will tell us all about it even before we begin to eat for there is your mamma looking anxious 
Emily looking ready to cry, and Lucy too with her. What is this great secret? I will tell you, Papa, said Henry, getting up and walking round to his father's knee. I opened the door, Papa, he said. It was not Emily's fault. She told me not to do it, and then she came out, and she went to the top of the barn, and we went after her, and she chattered to us, and then she went. And then when we came after her, and then she sat on the gate, and went on and came to the stile, talking all the way, almost as if she had been making game of us. Did she not, Emily? Really, my dear boy, replied Mr. Fairchild, forcing himself to smile, let's try to make your story plainer, or we shall be more in the dark at the end of it all than we were at the beginning. All I now understand is that you and Emily climbed over the roof of the barn after somebody. Well, and I hope you got no fall in this strange exploit. Angry Papa, said Lucy. Henry has often been on the thatch of the barn and never got hurt. I did not say I was angry, my dear, replied Mr. Fairchild. I might say that it was neither safe nor prudent for little girls to scramble up such places. And I might say, do not try these things again. But if no harm was intended, why was I to be angry? But I must hear a more straightforward story than Henry has told me. He has not given me the name of the person who went chattering before him and Emily. Was it a fairy, a little spiteful fairy, Emily? Did you let her out of a box, as the princess did in the fairy tale? And what has all this to do with your refusing your suppers? Come, Emily, let us hear your account of this affair. Poor Emily had been sadly put out by all that had passed between Henry and her father, and she therefore looked very red when she began her story, but she got courage as she went on and told it all, just as it related in the last chapter. Only she passed slightly over the willfulness which her brother had shown in opening the cage door. She finished by saying that as they had given away their suppers, they had agreed together not to eat another, and we settled not to tell our reasons till the things were taken away. Yes, Papa, added Henry, we did. I will own that I was fearful. There was something much amiss. And she put out her hand to her little girl and boy, and having kissed them, she added, Now, my children, sit down and eat. All supped together, cried Lucy, with her brightest, happiest smile, and afterwards opened the basket. More than give each of you a slice of lamb, said Mr. Fairchild. I am going tomorrow to pay a visit to Mr. Darwell. I have put this visit off too long, and I will call on Mr. Burke, Sir Charles Noble's steward, and inquire about these poor people. What is the name of the old woman, my dears? Edward, Papa, cried Henry. Edward, said Emily, is the boy's name, not the old woman's. We did not ask her name. I thought that was likely, answered Mr. Fairchild, smiling. Well, Henry, I will tell you what must be done. You must be ready at six o'clock tomorrow morning, and we will walk, whilst it is cool, to Mr. Burke's, and get our breakfast there and you must help us to find these poor people oh papa said henry he could not say another word for joy after supper and when everything but the candles was cleared from the table the basket was set on it and mrs fairchild began to unpack it first she took out a number of parcels of rice and sugar and pepper and mustard and such things as children do not care to see these were put aside and then came a smooth long parcel which she opened it contained a piece of very nice muslin to make Lucy and Emily best frocks. There was no harm in the little girls being very pleased at the sight of this. They had been taught to be thankful for every good and useful thing provided for them. These two were put aside, and next came a larger parcel tied up in a paper with care, and the name of Lucy from Mrs. Goodrich written upon it. It was handed to Lucy. She did not expect it, and her hands quite shook while she untied the string. It contained a beautiful doll, the size of Emily's famous doll, and I could not say which of the two little sisters was most delighted. The two largest parcels were at the bottom of the basket, and came last. One was directed with a pencil by Lucy to Emily, and the other to Henry, and when these were opened, it was found out that Lucy had spent all her own money to make these parcels richer. Each contained a beautiful book with many pictures, and in Emily's parcel, were a pair of scissors for doll work and needles and cotton and lots of bright penny ribbon and a bundle of ends of bright chintz for dolls frocks they were the very things that would please emily most and as she said would help so nicely to dress lucy's doll henry beside his book had a large rough knife a ball of string and all 
a little nail passer a paper of tax and some other little thing which happened to be just what he wanted most of all things in the world for he was always making things in wood well that was a happy evening indeed it had been a happy day only mag had given some trouble but as emily said even mag's mischief had turned out for some good because the poor little children had got a supper by it the next day was almost if not quite as pleasant as the day before henry was out with his father and lucy and emily had all the day given to them for the dressing the new doll and settling her name so they called her amelia after mrs howard end of section twenty three your reader has been Rosie Roberts from California. Section 24 of The Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruhi Huck The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood Breakfast at Mr. Burke's We will leave Lucy and Emily making their dolls' clothes and go with Mr. Fairchild and Henry. They were off by six o'clock in the morning for the park. Sir Charles Noble's place was about two miles from Mr. Fairchild's house but Mr. Burke, the steward, lived as much as half a mile nearer on Mr. Fairchild's side, so that Henry had not two miles to walk, for his father was to leave him at Mr. Burke's while he went on to pay his visit to Mr. Dowell. The first part of their walk lay along a lane, deeply shaded on one side by a very deep dark wood. It was black wood henry saw the chimneys of the old house just rising above the trees they were built of brick and looked as if several of them had been twisted round each other as the threads of thick twine are twisted they looked quite black and parts of them had fallen mr fairchild and henry next crossed the corner of a common where they saw several huts built of clay with one brick chimney each and very ragged thatch and going a little farther they saw Mr. Burke's house before them. It was a large farmhouse with a square court before it, and behind it a quantity of buildings and many ricks. Mr. Burke was the steward of the estate, and he was also a farmer, and he was reckoned to be a rich man. But he and his wife were very plain sort of people, and though they had got up in the world, they carried with them all their old-fashioned ways. They had eight children. The eldest was in his sixteenth year, the youngest between two and three. There were four boys and four girls, and they had come in turns, first a boy, and then a girl, and so on. The three elder boys and the three elder girls went to boarding schools, but it was holiday time, and they were all at home. There was no sign about the old people themselves of being rich, excepting that they had both grown very stout but they were hearty and cheerful. Mr. Burke spied Mr. Fairchild before he got to the house and called to welcome him over a hedge, saying, You have done right to take the cool of the morning, and you and the little gentleman there, I dare say, are ready for your breakfasts. Go on, Mr. Fairchild, and I will be with you before you get to the house. Mr. Fairchild and Henry crossed the fold yard, and coming into the yard, which was surrounded by a low wall with a paling at the top of it they saw mrs burke standing on the kitchen steps and feeding an immense quantity of poultry of all sorts and kinds she called to welcome her visitors but though she spoke in a high key it was impossible to hear a word she said for the noise made by the geese ducks hens turkeys and guinea fowl all crowding forward for their food besides which there was a huge dog chained to a kennel which set up a tremendous barking and before he could be stopped was joined by other dogs of diverse sorts and sizes which came running into the yard setting up their throats all in different keys they did not however attempt to do more than bark and yelp at henry and his father come in come in mr fairchild said mrs burke 
when they could get near to her through the crowd of living things come in the tea is brewing and you must be very thirsty and she took up an end of her white apron and wiped her brow remarking that it was wonderful fine weather for the corn mr fairchild and henry followed mrs burke through an immense kitchen into a parlour beyond which was nothing in size compared to the kitchen and there was a long table set out for breakfast the table was covered with good things a large pasty which had been cut a ham from which many a good slice had already been taken a pot of jam another of honey brown and white loaves cream and butter and fruit and the tea too was brewing and smelt deliciously mr burke followed them in almost immediately and shook mr fairchild by the hand complimenting henry by laying his large rough hand on his head and saying you are ready for your breakfast i doubt not little master adding come mistress tap your barrel but where are the youngsters he had hardly spoken when a tall girl very smartly dressed though with her hair in papers looked in at the door and ran off again when she saw mr fairchild her father called after her judy i say why don't you come in but miss judy was gone to take the papers out of her hair the next who appeared was little miss jane the mother's pet because she was the youngest she came squalling in to tell her mother that dick had scratched her though she could not show the scratch and there was no peace until she was set on a high chair by her mother and supplied with a piece of sugared bread and butter a great sturdy boy in petticoats of about four years old followed little miss jane roaring and blubbering because jane had pinched him in return for the scratch but mrs burke managed to settle him also with a piece of ham which he ate without bread fat and all dicky was presently followed into the room by the three elder boys james william and tom being admonished by their father they gave mr fairchild something between a bow and a nod james compliment might have been called a bow williams was half one and half the other and tom's was nothing more than a nod these boys were soon seated and began to fill their plates from every dish near to them mrs burke asked james if he knew where his sisters were and tom answered why at the glass to be sure taking the papers out of their hair what's that you say tom was heard at that instant from some one coming into the parlour it was miss judy and she was followed by miss mary and miss elizabeth these three paid their compliments to mr fairchild somewhat more properly than their brothers had done and in a very few minutes all the family were seated and all the young ones engaged with their breakfasts it was mr fairchild's custom always when he had business to do to take the first opportunity of forwarding it so he did not lose this opportunity but told his reasons for begging a breakfast that morning from mr burke mr burke entered kindly into what his neighbour said and had no difficulty though the surname was not known in finding out who the grandmother of edward and jane was he told mr fairchild that she bore a good character had suffered many afflictions and if she were ill must be in great need it was then settled that as he was going in his little gig that morning to the park mr fairchild should go with him that they should go round over the common to see the old woman who did not live very near to the farm and that henry should be left under mrs burke's care as the gig would only carry two persons when mr burke said the gig would only hold two james looked up from his plate and said i only wish that it would break down the very first time you and mother get into it thank you jem for your good wishes said mr burke for shame jen cried miss judy i don't mean that i wish you and mother to be hurt answered the youth but the gig is not fit for such a one as you to go in i declare i am ashamed of it every time you come in sight of our playground in it the boys have so much to say about it well well jem said miss judy well well jen repeated the youth it's always well well or oh fie jem but you know judy that you told me that your governess herself said that father ought to have a new carriage 
i don't deny that jem said judy miss skilly grew knows that father could afford a genteel carriage and she thinks that he ought to get one for the respectability of the family who cares what miss killigrew thinks asked john i do replied judy miss killigrew is a very genteel elegant woman and knows what's proper and as she says has the good of the family at heart nonsense replied jane the good of the family you mean her own good and her own respectability she would like to see a fine carriage at her door to make her look genteel but how can you be bamboozled with such stuff judy mr burke seemed to sit uneasily while his children were going on in this way he was thinking how all this would appear before mr fairchild that is he was listening for the moment with mr fairchild's ears when we keep low company we are apt to listen with their ears and when we get into good company we do the same we think how this will sound and that will sound to them and we are shocked for them at things which at another time we should not heed this is one way in which we are hurt by bad company and improved by good mr burke had never thought his children so ill-bred as when he heard them that morning with mr fairchild's ears and as he was afraid of making things worse by checking them he invited him to a walk out with him after he saw that he had done his breakfast to look at a famous field of corn near the house when this had been visited the gig was ready and they set out leaving henry at the farm and it was very good for henry to be left for he had an opportunity of seeing more that morning than he had ever yet seen of the sad effects of young people being left to take their own way end of section 24Section 25 of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lydia. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. The Unruly Family. After Mr. Fairchild was gone out with Mr. Burke, the young people, who still sat round the table, all began to speak and make a noise at once. The two youngest were crying for sugar or ham or more butter. Tom was screaming every moment, I am going to the river a-fishing. Who comes with me? Looking at the same time daringly at his mother and expecting her to say, No, Tom, you know that is forbidden. For the river was very dangerous for anglers, and Mr. Burke had given his orders that his boys should never go down to it unless he was with them. James and Judy were squabbling sharply and loudly about Miss Killigrew and her gentility. William, in a quieter way and with a quiet face, was from time to time giving his sister Mary's hair a violent pull, causing her to scream and look about for her tormentor each time, and Elizabeth was balancing a spoon on the edge of her cup and letting it fall with a clatter every moment. Children never mind noise, indeed they rather like it, and if the truth must be told, Henry was beginning to think that it would not be unpleasant if his father would let him and his sisters have their own ways, as these children of Mr. Burke seemed to have, at least on holidays and after lesson hours. When Miss Jane's mouth was well filled with jam and Dick's with fat meat, Tom's voice was heard above the rest. He was still crying, "'I am going a-fishing. Who will come with me?' his large eyes being fixed on his mother, as if to provoke her to speak. "'You are not going to do any such thing, Tom,' she at length said. "'I shall not allow it.' Tom looked as if he would have said, "'How can you help it, mother?' But he had not time to say it, had he wished, for Miss Judy, who had a great notion of managing her brothers, took him up and said, "'I wonder at you, Tom. How often have you been told you are not to go down to fish in the river? "'Pray, miss, who made you my governess? If it's only to vex you, I will go to the river. "'And if I don't fish, I will bathe. Will that please you better?' "'Henry Fairchild could not make out exactly what was said next, "'because three or four people spoke at once in answer to Tom's last words, "'and as all of them spoke as loud as they could in order to be heard, "'as always happens in these cases, no two words could be made out clearly.' But Henry perceived that Tom gave word for word for, to his sisters, and was, as he would himself have said, quite even with them. After a little while, James, at the whisper of his mother, cried, "'Nonsense! Nonsense! No more of this!' and, taking Tom by the arm, lugged him out of the room by main force, while the youngster struggled and tugged and caught at everything as he was forced along, the noise continuing till the two brothers were fairly out of the house." Mrs. Burke then turned to Henry, and thinking, perhaps, that some excuse for her boy's behavior was necessary, "'It is all play, Master Fairchild. 
Tom is a good boy, but he loves a little harmless mischief. He has no more notion of going down to the river than I have. La, mother, said Miss Judy, that is what you always say, though you know the contrary. Tom is the very rudest boy in the whole country, and known to be so. Come with me, Master Fairchild, said William in a low voice to Henry. Come with me. Now Judy has got on her hobby horse. She will take a long ride. What is my hobby horse, Master William? said Judy sharply. Abusing your brothers, Miss Judy, replied William. She set her lips and turned away, as if she did not think it worth while to answer him, for he was younger than herself, but the next sister took up the battle, and said something so sharp and tart that even William, the quietest of the family, gave her a very rude and cutting answer. Henry did not understand what he said, but he was not sorry when Mrs. Burke told him that he had better go out with William and see what was to be seen. William led Henry right through the kitchen and court into the fold yard. It was a very large yard, surrounded on three sides by buildings, stables, and storehouses, and cattle sheds and stalls in the midst of it was a quantity of manure all wet and sloppy and upon the very top of this heap stood that charming boy master tom with his shoes and stockings all covered with mire on one side of the yard stood james talking to a boy in a labourer's frock these last were very busy with their own talk and paid no heed to tom who kept calling to them you said he cried that i could not get here and here i am do you see safe and sound and i do not care how long you stay there at length answered the eldest brother we should be free from one plague for the time at least that time then shall not be long answered tom for i am coming stop him stop him cried james here will and you hodge speaking to the young carter have at him he shan't come out so soon as he wishes and giving a whoop and a shout the three boys james william and hodge set to drive tom back again whenever he attempted to get out of the heap of mire upon the dry ground there were three against one, and Tom had the disadvantage of very slippery footing, so that he was constantly driven back at every attempt, and so very roughly, too, that he was thrown down more than once. But he fell on soft ground, and got no harm beyond being covered with mire from head to foot. The whole yard rang with the shouts and screams of the boys, and this might have lasted much longer if an old laboring servant had not come into the yard and insisted that there was enough of it, driving Hodge away and crying shame on his young masters. When Tom was let loose, he walked into the house— as Henry supposed to get himself washed, and James and William, being very hot, called Henry to go with them across the field into the barn, in one corner of which they had a litter of puppies. They were a long time in this barn, for after they had looked at the puppies they had a game of marbles, and Henry was much amused. William Burke was generally the quietest of the family, and almost all strangers liked him best, but he had his particular tempers, and as those tempers were never kept under by his parents, when they broke out they were very bad. James did something in this game which he did not think was fair, so he got up from the ground where they were sitting or kneeling to play, kicked the marbles from him, told his brother that he was cheating in so many plain words, and was walking quietly away when James followed him and seized his arm to pull him back. William resisted, and then the brothers began to wrestle, and from wrestling half playfully they went on to wrestle in earnest. One gave the other a chance blow, and the other returned an intended one, and then they fought in good earnest, and did not stop until William had got a bloody nose, and perhaps they might not have stopped then if Henry Fairchild had not begun to cry, running in between them and begging them not to hurt each other any more. "'Poor child,' cried James as he drew back from William. "'Don't you know that we were only in play? Did you never see two boys playing before?' "'Not in that way,' replied Henry. "'That is because you have no brother,' answered James." It is a sad thing for a boy not to have a brother. Then they all left the barn, and William went to wash his nose at the pump. Whilst he was doing this, James turned over an empty trough which lay in the shade of one of the buildings in the fold yard, and he and Henry sat down upon it. William soon came down to them. He had washed away the blood, and he looked so sulky that anyone might have seen that he would have opened out the quarrel again with James had not Henry Fairchild been present, for though he did not care for the little boy, yet he did not wish that he should give him a bad name to his father henry fairchild was learning the best lesson he had ever had in his life amongst the unruly children of mr burke but this lesson was not to be learned only by his ears and eyes it would not have been enough for him to see tom soused in the mire or william with his bloody nose his very bones were to suffer in the acquirement of it and he was to get such a fright as he had never known before but before the second part of his adventures that morning is related it will be well to say in this place that mr fairchild was taken first by mr burke to the poor widow's cottage where he found her almost crippled with rheumatism she had parted with much of her furniture and clothes to feed the poor children but was gentle and did not complain from the cottage mr burke drove mr fairchild to the park and there mr fairchild had an opportunity of speaking to the poor grandmother and the little children to mr and mrs darwell Mr. Darwell said if the cottage required repair, Mr. Burke must look after it, and then speak to him, as the affair was not his, as he was only Sir Charles Noble's tenant. 
Mrs. Darwell seemed, too, Mr. Fairchild, to be a very fine lady, and one who did not trouble herself about the concerns of the poor. But there was in the room who heard every word Mr. Fairchild said, and heard it attentively. This was little Miss Darwell. She was seated on a sofa with a piece of delicate work in her hand. She was dressed in the most costly manner, and she looked as fair and almost as quiet as a waxen doll. Who can guess what was going on in her mind while she was listening to the history of the poor grandmother and her little ones? Miss Darwell, in one way, was as much indulged as Mr. Burke's children, but of course she was not allowed to be rude and vulgar. Therefore, if her manners were better than those of the little Burke's, it was only what might be expected. But, happily for her, she had been provided with a truly pious and otherwise very excellent governess, a widow lady, of the name of Colvin, but Mrs. Colvin very seldom appeared in the drawing-room. Mr. Darwell was very proud of his little girl. He thought her very pretty and very elegant, and he wanted to show her off before Mr. Fairchild, who he knew had some little girls of his own. So, before Mr. Fairchild took leave, he called her to him and said, "'Ellen, my dear, speak to this gentleman, and tell him you should be glad to see his daughters, the Mrs. Fairchild. They are about your age, and, as I am told, are such ladies as would please you to be acquainted with.' The little lady rose immediately and came forward. She gave her hand to Mr. Fairchild, and, turning to her father, "'May I,' she said, "'ask the Mrs. Fairchild to come to my feast upon my birthday?' "'You may, my love,' was the answer. "'Then I will write a note,' she said, and Mr. Fairchild saw that the pretty waxen doll could sparkle and blush, and look as happy as his own children often did. She ran out of the room, and a minute afterwards came back with a neat little packet in her hand. There was more in it than a note, but she asked Mr. Fairchild to put it into his pocket and not look at it. Mr. Fairchild smiled and thanked her, and at that very moment other morning visitors were brought in, and took up the attention of Mr. and Mrs. Darwell. Mr. Fairchild was rising, when the little girl, bending forward to him, said in a low voice, "'I heard what you said, sir, about those poor little children, and I will try to help them.' How pleasant was it to Mr. Fairchild to hear those words from that fair little lady, and he came away quite delighted with her and pleased with Mr. Darwell. He found Mr. Burke in his gig at the gates, with the horse's head turned towards home. As they were driving back, Mr. Fairchild spoke of Miss Darwell, and said how very much he had been pleased with her. Mr. Burke said that she was a wonder of a child, considering how she was indulged, and that she seemed to have no greater pleasure in doing good to the poor, especially to the children. Then they talked of the old woman. Mr. Burke said he would, on his own responsibility, have the cottage put to rights. It should have been done before, he added, and I will see that she receives some help from the parish for the children. She has had a little for herself all along. "'And my wife shall send her some soup, and maybe I could find something for Edward to do, "'if it be but to frighten away the birds from the crops, "'so let that matter trouble you no more, Mr. Fairchild.' End of section 25. Recording by Lydia. Section 26 of the Fairchild Family. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. The Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood. Story of Henry's Adventure. Henry Fairchild sat with William and James Burke for some time under the shade of the building, and had the pleasure of hearing the two brothers sparring on each side of him, though they did not come to blows again. Whatever one said, the other contradicted. If one said such a thing is, the other said, I am sure it is not, or there you go, that's just you. Nonsense, was a favorite word of James's. Nonsense, Will, was his constant answer to everything his brother proposed, and they used many words which Henry did not understand. All this time Tom did not appear, and his brothers did not seem to think about him. After a while, William said, "'Let's go into the cornfield and see what the men are about. "'This yard is very dull.' "'No,' said James. "'Let us show Master Fairchild the young bull.' "'No, no!' cried Henry. "'I do not want to see it.' "'But the boys laughed outright at Henry's cry of, "'I do not want to see it.' "'And then they assured him that the creature was well tied up. "'He was in the cattle stall, just opposite to them, "'and could not hurt them. "'And they laughed again, till Henry was ashamed "'and said that he would go with them to look at him.' The cattle stall was a long, low, and narrow building, which ran one whole side of the yard. At some seasons it was filled with cattle, each one having a separate stall and being tied in it, but at this time there was no creature in it but this bull. Now it must be told that, whilst the boys were in the barn, and just about the time in which James and William had been scuffling with each other and making much noise, Tom, who had not yet taken the trouble to wash himself, had got to the top of the cattle shed, 
and had been amusing himself by provoking the bull through an air hole in the roof. First he had thrown down on his head a quantity of house leek which grew on the tiles, and then he had poked at him with a stick till the creature got furious and began to beat about him, and at length to set up a terrible bellowing. Tom knew well that he should get into trouble if it was found out that he had been provoking the creature, so down he slipped and was off in another direction in a few minutes. The laborers were all in the field, and Henry and his companions were in the barn, so that no one heard distinctly the bellowing of the bull, but the girl in the dairy, and she had been too long accustomed to the noises of a farm to give it a second thought. The animal, however, was so furious that he broke his fastenings, snapping the ropes and coming out of the stall and even trying to force the door of the shed, but in this he failed, as there was a wooden bar across it on the outside. After a little while he ceased to bellow, so no one was aware of the mischief which had been done, and no one suspected that the bull was loose. James walked first to the door of the cattle shed, William came next, and afterwards Henry. James did not find it easy to move the bar, so he called William to help him. The reason why it was hard to move was that the head of the bull was against the door, and he was pressing on the bar. The moment the bar was removed, the bull's head forced open the door, and there stood the sullen, frowning creature in the very face of poor Henry, with nothing between them but a few yards of the court. The other two boys were, by the sudden opening of the door, forced behind it, so that the bull saw only Henry, but Henry did not stay to look at his fiery eyes, or to observe the temper in which he lowered his terrible head to the ground and came forward. "'Run! Run for your life!' cried William and James from behind the door, and Henry did run, and the bull after him, bellowing and tearing up the ground before him, and he came on fast, but Henry had got the start of a few yards, and that start saved his life. Still he ran, the bull following after. Henry had not waited to consider which way he ran. He had taken his way in the direction of a lane which ran out of the yard. The gate was open. He flew through. The terrible beast was after him. He could hear his steps and his deep snortings and puffings. In another minute he would have reached Henry and would probably have gored him to death, when all at once every dog about the farm, first called and then urged on by William and James, came barking and yelping in full cry on the heels of the bull. The leader of these was a bulldog of the true breed, and, though young, had all his teeth in their full strength. Behind him came the dogs of every kind which is common in this country, and if they could do little else they could bay and yelp, and thus puzzle and perplex the bull. James and William, each with a stick in their hands, were behind them, urging them on, calling for help, and putting themselves to great danger for the sake of Henry. Tom was not there to see the mischief he had wrought. Another moment and the bull would have been up with Henry when he found himself bitten in the flank by the sharp fangs of fury meeting in his flesh. The animal instantly turned upon the dog, most horribly did he bellow, and poor Henry then indeed felt that his last moment was to come. The noises were becoming more dreadful every instant, the men came running from the fields, pouring into the lane from all sides, the women and girls from the house were shrieking over the low wall from the bottom of the court, so that the noise might be heard a mile distant. Henry Fairchild never looked back, but ran on as fast as he possibly could, till, after a little while, seeing a stile in his left hand, he sprang up to it, tumbled over in his haste, fell headlong on the new shorn grass, and would have gotten no hurt whatever, had not his nose and his upper lip made too free with a good-sized stone. Henry's nose and lip being softer than the stone, they of course had the worst of it in the encounter. A very few minutes afterwards, but before the labourers had got the bull back into its place, which was no easy matter, one of the men, running from a distant field towards the noise, found poor Henry, took him out far more easily than he would have taken up a bag of meal, and carried him, all bloody as he was, to the mistress, by a short cut through the garden. Henry's nose had bled, and was still bleeding, when the man brought him to the house, but no one ever thought of him till the fierce bull was safe within four walls. But it had been a dangerous affair, as the men said, to get that job done, nor was it done till both Fury and the bull were covered with foam and blood. When everything was quiet in and about the yard, Mrs. Burke began to look up, not only her own children, but all the careless young people about. "'Where is Tom?' was the mother's first cry. Dick and Jane had made her know that they were not far off by the noise they were both making. "'Tom is quite safe,' replied someone. "'And Master Fairchild?' said Mrs. Burke. Everybody, then, ran different ways to look for Henry, and when he was found all covered with blood in the kitchen, Mrs. Burke was, as she said, ready to faint away. 
Everybody, however, was glad when they found no harm was done to the child beyond a bloody nose and a lip swelled to a monstrous size. Kind Mrs. Burke herself took him up to her boy's room, where she washed him and made him dress himself in a complete suit of Tom's, engaging to get his own things washed and cleaned for him in a few hours. She then brought him down into the parlour, set him on the sofa, gave him a piece of bread and honey, and begged him not to stir from thence till his father returned, nor had Henry any wish to disobey her. Henry was hardly seated on the couch with his bread and honey in his hand, when first one and then another of the children came in, the last who was James lugging in Tom. Now it is very certain that Tom stood in even more need of a scouring and clean clothes than Henry had done, for he had not used water nor changed his clothes since he had been rolled by his brothers in the mud of the yard. The mud had dried upon him, and no one who did not expect to see him could possibly have known him. He was lugged by main force into the parlour, though he kicked and struggled, and held on upon everything within his reach. He came in as he had gone out, but when he was fairly in he became quite still, and stood sulking. "'I'll tell you what, mother,' said James, "'you may thank Tom for all the mischief, and he knows it.' "'Knows what?' "'That it was through him the bull got loose, and that poor fury is nearly killed.' "'I'm sure it was not,' answered Tom. "'I say it was,' replied James, and then all the brothers and sisters began to speak at once. "'Judy, just like you, Tom. Mary, and see what a condition he's in. William, you know Hodge saw you, Tom, on top of the shed. Tom, I'm sure he did not. Elizabeth, what a dirty creature you are, Tom, and how you smell of the stable. Jane, mother, mother, I want some bread and honey like Master Fairchild. Dick, I want a sop in the pan, mother, mayn't I have a sop? In the midst of all this noise and confusion, in walked Mr. Fairchild and Mr. Burke. The men in the yard had told them of what had happened, and it had been made plain to Mr. Burke that Tom had been at the bottom of the mischief. Mr. Fairchild hastened in all anxiety to his poor boy, and was full of thankfulness to God for having saved him from the dreadful danger which had threatened him, and Mr. Burke began to speak to his son Tom with more severity than he often used. He even called for a cane, and said he would give it to him soundly. At that minute, too, but Mrs. Burke stepped in and begged him off, and as she stood between him and his father he slunk away, and kept out of his sight as long as Henry and Mr. Fairchild stayed. If Tom never came in within sight of his father all the rest of that day— Henry never once went out of the reach of his father's eye. After dinner and tea, Henry was again dressed in his own clothes, which Mrs. Burke had got washed and cleaned for him, and in the cool of the evening he walked quietly home with his father. "'Oh, Papa,' said Henry, when they came again under the shade of Blackwood, "'I do not now wish to have my own way, as I did this morning. I am now quite sure that it does not make people happy to have it.' "'Then, my boy,' replied Mr. Fairchild, you have learned a very good lesson today, and I trust that you will never forget it. End of section 26the Fairchild Family by Mary Martha Sherwood The Story in Emily's Book Part 1 The little books brought by Lucy were not even looked at until the evening came, which was to be given up to reading the first of them. Henry had begged that his book might be read last, because, he said, that he should be sure to like it best. So Emily's was to afford the amusement for the first evening. Mr. Fairchild gave notice in the morning of his being able to give up that evening to this pleasure, not that he wished to hear the story, but that he meant to be of the party, and the root house in the wood was the place chosen. Lucy and Emily had now each a doll to take, and there was some bustle to get them ready after lessons. Henry took his knife and some little bits of wood to cut and carve, whilst the reading was going on. Mrs. Fairchild took her needlework, and there was a basket containing nice white cakes of bread made for the purpose, a little fruit, a bottle of milk, and a cup. The little ones by turns were to carry this basket between them. Mr. Fairchild took a book to please himself, and at four o'clock they set out. When 
they got to the hut they were soon all settled there were seats in the hut henry took the lowest of them mrs fairchild took out her work mr fairchild stretched himself on the grass within sight of his family emily and lucy were to read by turns and lucy was to begin she laid her pretty doll across her lap and thus she began the story in emily's book on the borders of switzerland towards the north in a range of hills of various heights called the hartsfells or in english the hills of the deer these hills are not very high for that country though in england they would be called mountains in winter they were indeed covered with snow but in summer all this snow disappeared being gradually melted and coming down in beautiful cascades from the heights into the valleys and so passing away to one or other of the many lakes which were in the neighbourhood the tops of some of the hearts fells were crowned with ragged rocks which looked at a distance like old towers and walls of battlements and the sides of these more rocky hills were steep and stony and difficult others of these hills sloped gently towards the plain below and were covered with a fine green sward in the summer so fine and soft indeed that the little children from the villages in the valleys used to climb up to them in order to have the pleasure of rolling down them these greener hills were also adorned with large and beautiful trees under which the shepherds sat when they drove their flocks up on the mountain pastures called in that country the alps to fatten on the short fine grass and sweet herbs which grew there in the summer time then the flowers who can count the numbers and varieties of the flowers which grew on those hills and which budded and bloomed through all the lovely months of spring of summer and of autumn sometimes the shepherds as they sat in the shade watching their sheep would play sweet tunes on their pipes and flutes for a shepherd who could not use a flute was thought little of in those hills it was sweet to hear those pipes and flutes from a little distance when all was quiet among the hills excepting the ever restless and ever dancing waters there were many villages among the hills each village having a valley to itself but there is only one of these of which this story speaks it was called hartsburg or the town of the deer and was situated in one of the fairest valleys of the hartsfells the valley was accounted to be the fairest because there was the finest cascade belonging to those hills rushing and roaring at the very farthest point of the valley and the grooves too on each side of the valley were very grand and old the village itself was built in the swiss fashion chiefly of wood with roofs of wooden tiles called shingles and many of them had covered galleries round the first floor the only house much better than the others was the protestant pastors though this was not much more than a large cottage but it stood in a very neat garden there were a few but a very few houses separate from this village itself built on the sides of the hills and those belonged to peasants or small farmers in the summer time strangers sometimes came from a distance to look at the famous waterfall and to gather such scarce flowers as they could find on the hills it was a good thing for heister camp the widow who kept the little inn in the village when these strangers came for it not only put money into her pocket but gave her something to talk of she was the greatest gossip in the valley and like all gossips the most curious person also for nothing could pass but she must meddle and make with it and it was very seldom that things were the better for her meddling most of the inhabitants of the village were protestants but there were a few roman catholics and these had a priest an elderly man who was a great friend of heister camp and might often be seen in her kitchen talking over with her the affairs of the village he was called father saint gore and he had a small chapel 
and a little bit of a house attached to it his chapel was less than the protestant church but it looked far more grand within for there was an altar dressed with artificial flowers and burnished brass candlesticks and over it waxen figures of the virgin mary and her child in very gaudy though tarnished dresses and now having described the place and some of the people there is nothing to hinder the story from going on to something more amusing on the right hand of the great waterfall and perched high on the hill was an old house standing in a very lovely and fruitful garden the garden faced the south and was sheltered from the north and east winds by a grove of ancient trees the garden abounded with fruit and flowers and vegetables and there were also many beehives behind the house were several sheds and other buildings and a pen for sheep this house was the property of a family which had resided there longer than the history of the village could tell the name was stolberg and the family though they had never been rich had never sought help from others and were highly respected by all who knew them at the time of this history the household consisted of the venerable mother monique stolberg and her son martin a widower and the three children of martin ella jacques and margot ella was not yet fourteen she was a tall girl over age who had been brought up with the greatest care by her grandmother though made to put her hand to everything required in her station ella was spoken of as the best behaved most modern and altogether the finest and fairest of all the girls in the valley heister camp said that she was as proud and lofty as the eagle of the hills but ella was not proud she was only modest and retiring and said little to strangers jacques was some years younger than ella he loved his parents and sisters and would do anything for them in his power but he was hot and hasty especially to those he did not love margaret was still a little plump smiling chattering child almost a baby in her ways but every one loved her for she was a pet lamb under the eye of the shepherd monique had received her before she could walk from her dying mother and she had reared her with the tenderest care as to martin more need not be said of him but that the wish to please god was ever present with him he had been the best of sons and when his wife died he was rewarded for his filial piety by the care which his mother took of his children and his house monique had had one other child beside martin a daughter who had married and gone over the hills with her husband into france but her marriage had proved unfortunate she had resided at vienne in the south of france and there she had left one child nita a girl of about the age of ella when martin heard of the death of his sister and the forlorn state of the orphan he set himself to go to vienne it was winter time and he rode to the place on a little mountain pony which he had but he walked back nearly the whole way having set meeta with her bundle on the horse every one at home was pleased with meeta when she arrived though monique secretly wondered how she could be so merry when her parents were hardly cold in their graves meeta was not however cold-hearted but she was thoughtless and she enjoyed the change of scene and was pleased with her newly known relations and their manner of life little plump baby-like margaret was scarcely less formed in her mind than meeta though meeta was as old as ella and of the two margaret as will be seen by and by was more to be depended on than meeta margaret when duly admonished on any point could be prudent but meeta could not yet meeta was so merry so obliging and so good-humoured that every one in the cottage soon learned to love her though some of them and especially monique saw very clearly that there was much to be done to improve her and render her a steady character 
She was quick, active, and ready to put her hand to assist in anything. But she had no perseverance. She got tired of every job before it was half done, and she could do nothing without talking about it. As to religious principles and religious feelings, her grandmother could not find out that she had any. She was so giddy that she could give no account of what she had been taught, though Monique gathered from her that her poor mother had said much to her upon religious subjects during her last short illness. The snow was still thick upon the hills when Martin Stolberg brought Meeta to Hartsburg, so that the young people were quite well acquainted with each other before the gentle breezes of spring began to loosen the bands of the frost and dissolve the icicles which hung from the rocks on the sides of the waterfall. During that time, poor Martin Stolberg was much tried by several heavy losses amongst his livestock. A fine cow and several sheep died, and when the poor man had replaced these, he said, with a sigh to his mother, that he must deny himself and his children everything which possibly could be spared till better days came round again. So be it, my son, and I doubt not but that all is right, for if everything went smooth in this world, we should be apt to forget that we are strangers and pilgrims here, and that this is not our home. When Monique told Ella what her father had said, the young girl got leave to go down to the village, and when there she went to Madame Eversill, the pastor's lady, and having told her of her father's difficulties, she asked her if she could point out any means by which she might get a little money to help in these difficulties. Monsieur Eversil, though a very simple man, was not so poor as many Swiss pastors are. He had no children, and his lady had had money. Madame wished to assist Ella, whom she much loved, but she rather hesitated before she said to her, I have been accustomed to have my linen taken up to the wash, to be washed and bleached upon the mountains every summer. The woman who did this for me is just gone out of the country. If you will do it, you will gain enough during the summer to make up for the loss of the cow. But are you not above such work as this, Ella? They say of you that you are proud. Is this true? The bright dark eyes of Ella filled with tears, and she looked down upon the polished floor of the parlour in which she was talking with Madame Eversil. I know not, Madame, she answered, whether I am proud or not, but I earnestly desire not to be so, and I thank you for your kind proposal, and as I am sure that I know my grandmother's mind, I accept it most joyfully. It was then settled that Madame Eversil should send all the linen which had been used during the winter to be washed and whitened and scented with sweet herbs up to the hill as soon as the snow was cleared from the lower alps and ella went gaily back to tell her grandmother and meeta what she had done they were both pleased meeta loved the thoughts of any new employment and monique promised her advice and assistance even jacques when he came in said he thought he might help also in drawing water and spreading the linen on the grass and i said little margaret can gather the flowers to lay upon the things can't i ella so this matter was settled and every one in the family was pleased the winter at length passed away the cascades flowed freely from the melting snow the wind blew softly from the south, the grass looked of the brightest, freshest green, and every brake was gay with flowers, amongst which none were more beautiful or abundant than the rose-coloured primrose or the blue gentian. The sheep, which had been penned up during the winter, were drawn out on the fresh pastures, and strangers began to come to the valley to see the waterfall, near to which they climbed up by the sheep path which ran just under the hedge of Martin Stolberg's garden. Even before May was over, Jacques, who was all day abroad on the hills watching his sheep, counted eight or nine parties, which came in carriages to the inn and climbed the mountain on foot. 
Heisterkamp was quite set up by the honour of receiving so many noble persons in her house, and still more pleased in pocketing the silver she got from them. There was great benefit also to Father St. Gore from the coming of these strangers, for he never failed to drop in just about the time that the guests had finished their dinner, and was always invited to taste of any savoury dish which remained, to which Heister generally added a bottle of the ordinary wine of the country things were being carried on in this sort of way when one morning in the beginning of june margaret and meeta and jacques went higher up the hill towards the waterfall to gather sweet herbs and flowers to strew upon the linen that was spread on the sward before the cottage door margaret could not reach the roses which grew above her head so she busied herself in plucking the wild thyme and other lowly flowers which grew on either side of the path putting them into her little basket and calling out from one moment to another see jacques see see meeta see how pretty but meeta and jacques were too busy to attend to her for meeta had climbed on a huge piece which had fallen from the rock and was throwing wreaths of roses to jacques who was gathering them up but at length it was impossible for them not to give some attention to the little one she was calling them with such impatience come jacques come meeta she cried i found such a pretty little green fishing net all spotted with moons and it has got rings pretty gold rings and there are yellow fish in it and she quite stamped with eagerness what does she say cried meeta little magpie what is it a pretty little net replied margaret and fish in it and moons and rings oh come come she has found something strange said jacques i hope nothing that will hurt her and down he came tumbling in his own active way straight to his little sister being quickly followed by meeta margaret was holding up what she had found crying pretty 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 for it was quite bright and sparkling in the sun it is a purse said jack a green silk purse added meeta with gold spangles and tassels and gold rings and it is full of louis d'ors give it to me margaret no 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 cried the little girl no it is for grandmother i shall take it to her it is a valuable purse said jack somebody has lost it now grandmother will be rich let me see it margaret let me see what is in it no 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 cried the little one clasping it in both her dimpled hands you shall not have it it is for grandmother only let me carry it to the door said jack for fear you should drop anything out of it and when you come to the door i will put it into your own hands jack never said what was not true to margaret and margaret knew it she therefore was content to give the purse to him and the three then set off to run home as fast as they could they supposed that no one had seen them when they were talking about the purse but they were mistaken father st gore was not far off though hidden from them by a part of the rock which projected between them he heard margaret cry and talk of having found a net and golden fish in it but when meeta and jack came near to the child he could hear no more because they spoke lower than before he had heard enough however and when he went back to the village he told heister camp what he had seen and made her more curious than himself to find out what it could be though she felt pretty sure that it must be a purse of gold how astonished was monique when little margaret put the purse in her lap for she was sitting at work just within the door meeta could not let margaret tell her own story but raised her voice so high that martin himself from one side and ella from another came to see what could have happened they came in just in time to see monique empty the purse and count the golden pieces there were as many as fifteen on the side of the purse and on the other was a ring with a precious stone in it and four pieces of paper curiously stamped 
martin stolberg saw at once that these pieces of paper were worth many times the value of the gold for he or any man might have changed them for ten pounds each son said monique margaret found this near the waterfall it must have been lost by some of the visitors it is a wonder that we have heard of no one coming to look after it what can we do with it buy a cow father said jack martin stolberg shook his head it is not ours jack he said though we have found it we must keep it honestly for the owner should he ever come to claim it father said jack i was not thinking or i hope i should not have said those words i know you spoke hastily jack replied martin and then having given margaret a few little pieces of copper money as reward for her giving up the little net to her grandmother he took his venerable parent by the hand and led her into an inner room where they settled what was to be done with the purse martin said that the children must all be seriously enjoined never to mention the subject because many dishonest persons might if they could get at the description of the purse and its contents come forward to claim it and thus it might be lost to the real owner but he added lest i should be tempted to use any of the money for myself i will take the purse down to-morrow to the pastor's and leave it in his care where it is however must not be known even to the children lest we should bring inconvenience upon them in the meantime dear mother do you stow the treasure safely away and charge the young ones not to mention what we have found to any one martin then left the house and monique going up to the room where she slept and where the great family chest was kept called all her grandchildren and letting them see where she put the purse she charged them one and all not to speak one word to any person out of the house about the treasure which had been found why must not we grandmother said margaret because replied monique if any thieves were to hear what that we had got so much money in the house they might come some time when your father was out and break open the chest and steal it and perhaps they might kill us replied margaret trembling all over we must not speak of it then said ella to any one our best way remarked jack will not be to mention it to each other we will never speak of it how can we help it said meeta i can never help talking of what i am thinking about that is a mistake of yours meeta said monique you never talk of some things which happened at the end which you think would be no credit to you you mean about our being so very poor and being forced to sell our clothes grandmother i don't think that i should go to talk of that to strangers then you can keep some things to yourself meeta said monique and we shall not excuse you if you are so imprudent as to let out this affair of the treasure we have found to any one don't fear me grandmother returned meeta nobody shall hear from me but we must watch little margaret the same evening martin stolberg carried the purse and all the contents down to the house of the good pastor he gave as his reason for so doing that being himself somewhat pressed for money he did not dare to trust himself with this treasure end of the story in emily's book part 1section 28 of the fairchild family this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ruhi huck the fairchild family by mary martha sherwood the story in emily's book part 2a lucy had read first and when she had finished the half of the story mrs fairchild proposed that they should take what was in the basket before they went on to the second part mr fairchild was called in 
and mrs fairchild served each person from the store i am quite sure said emily that monique stolberg never made nicer cakes than these papa said lucy i cannot help thinking that your book is not half so pretty as ours you don't know what a pleasant story we have been reading and we have half of it left to read shall i tell it to you papa she added and springing up she placed herself close to him putting one arm round his neck and in a few minutes she made him as well acquainted with monique and martin and ella and mita and jacques and margaret and heister camp and father st gore as she was herself and now papa she said will any of the children do you think betray the secret yes said mr fairchild smiling one of them will and who will that be papa said emily not jack replied henry though he was not asked i am sure it will not be jack wherefore henry said mr fairchild because he is a boy replied henry and boys never tell secrets and are never impudent answered mr fairchild smiling that is something new to me but in this case i do not think it will be jacques who will tell the secret nor ella papa asked lucy i am sure it will not be ella added lucy it must be between mita and little margaret probably said mr fairchild and i have a notion which of the two it will be and i shall whisper my suspicions to henry as he being a boy will be sure to keep my secret till the truth comes out of itself of course he might be trusted with a thing much more important than this mr fairchild then whispered either the name of mita or margaret to henry at any rate he whispered a name beginning with an m and henry looked not a little set up in having been thus chosen as his father's confidant when every one of the children was satisfied they placed the cup and the fragments in the basket and then they all settled themselves in readiness for the rest of the story we must now turn a little while from the quiet happy family in martin stolberg's cottage to heister camp what father st gore had told her about stolberg's children having found something curious near the waterfall had worked in her mind for above a week for so long it was since margaret had found the purse and she had watched for some of the children passing by her door every day since on the sunday morning they did indeed pass by to go to church but their father and grandmother were with them and she knew well enough that she would have no chance of any of them when the older and wiser people were present the family came to church in the afternoon but heister was at chapel then in the evening however she made up her mind to climb the hill as far as the cascade hoping there to meet one or two of the children standing about the place it was hot work for heister to make her way up the hill so far but what will not curious people do to satisfy their curiosity and just then the village was particularly dull and quiet as no stranger had happened to come for the last 10 days and many of the poor women had left their houses and gone up with their flocks to their chalets on the mountains when heister got near stolberg's cottage she met chuck he was going down on an errand to the pastor's from his father he made a bow and would have passed when heister stopped him to ask after his grandmother's health when she had got an answer to this inquiry she asked him various other questions about the lambs the bees and other matters belonging to the farm and garden and then with great seeming innocence she said you were looking for some herbs the other day were you not by the waterfall and your sister found a very rare one did she not i ask you because i have many a chance of parting with scarce plants dried and put into paper to the strangers who come into the house i do not think answered jack that little margaret would know a scarce plant if she found one but did she find something very curious that day said heister what day asked jack it must
might be ten days since said heister ten days repeated jacques what makes you remember ten days ago so particularly well but was it not about ten days ago returned heister that she found something very curious in the grass and called on you to come and look at it there is scarce a day answered jacques in which she does not call me to come to her and see something she has met with more wonderful than ordinary what was it she said when she called me that day you speak of if you can tell me why then i shall better know how to answer you she spoke of having found a net with golden fish and moons replied heister what could she mean it is difficult to know what she does mean sometimes said jacques for the dear little lamb talks so fast that we do not attend to half she says but is she not a nice little creature madame camp and a merry one too yes to be sure replied heister but about the net and the fish what could the little one mean who heard her talk of them asked jacques ask those who heard her madame they ought to be able to tell you more about it but i must wish you good evening as i am in haste to go to the pastor's heister saw that she could make nothing of jacques so she let him go pretending that she was herself going no higher but about to turn another way as soon however as jacques was out of sight she came back into the path which ran at the bottom of the cottage garden and there she saw little margaret seated on the bank near the hedge with a nosegay in her hand the little one was dressed in her clean sunday clothes in a fashion of the country and she wore a full striped petticoat which monique had spun of lamb's wool a white jacket with short sleeves like the body of a frock and a flowered chintz apron her pretty hair was left to curl naturally and no child could have had a fairer softer purer complexion now thought heister i shall have it and she walked smilingly up to the child and spoke fondly to her asking her where she got that pretty new apron margaret rose and made a curtsey as she had been taught and said grandmother made it madame heister praised her pretty face her bright eyes her nice curling hair and then she asked her if she had any pretty flowers to give her margaret immediately offered her nosegay but she refused it saying she did not want such flowers as those but such curious ones as she sometimes found near the waterfall i have got none now answered margaret but you found a very curious one the other day did you not my pretty little damsel said heister yes madam said margaret brightening up yes madam i did i i have it now thought heister and she patted the little one as she said was it not bright and shining like gold and was there not something about it like moons oh no madam replied the child it was some pretty blue flowers that came every year yak said they are called gentians but i call them fairies eyes for they are just the very color i always fancy the fairy of the hartsfell's eyes must be they are so very blue well well exclaimed the heister hastily i dare say they were very very pretty but did you not find something more curious on the mountains than flowers what was it you found that monique praised you for finding and told you you were a good child for giving it up to her oh it was the wild strawberries cried margaret the pretty mountain strawberries grandmother thanked me for bringing her home the strawberries for she said she had not tasted them since she was a girl sure child said heister camp impatiently it's not that i want to know what was it you called a golden fish and moons moons repeated margaret coloring up to her very brow moons madam i moons child what do you mean by moons poor little margaret she would sadly put to for an answer for she remembered that her grandmother had told her about keeping the secret of the purse and not being old enough to evade a direct reply she burst into tears taking up her apron to her face so you will not tell me what you call moons said heister angrily then softening her tone she added here my pretty margaret is a so or penny for you if you will tell me what you mean by moons and golden fish 
but seeing the child irresolute she added if you do not choose to tell get out of my way you little sulky thing margaret waited no more but the next moment the prudent little girl was way up the bank and in the cottage where she found her grandmother alone to whom she told her troubles monique kissed her wiped away her tears and taking her on her knee she made the little one's eyes once more beam forth with smiles there said henry just as papa said he knew it would be meeta oh henry said mrs fairchild smiling how nicely you have kept papa's secret you see you would not have done so well as little margaret did with heister camp henry made no answer and emily went on jacques had made up his mind never to allude to the affair of the treasure by a single word so he kept his meeting with heister to himself and when you have read a little more you will see how unlucky it was that he did so or that meeta was not present when margaret had been with her grandmother but when you have read to the end you will say it was all right as it was in the evening of the next day ella with the help of monique and meeta finished the getting up of a portion of the fine linen of madame eversil it was therefore placed neatly in a basket covered with a white cloth and sprinkled over with the fairest and choicest of flowers which could be gathered and then ella being neatly dressed raised it on her head and set off with it to the village i wish we had a picture of ella just as she was that evening going gaily down the hill with the basket so nicely balanced on her head that she hardly ever put her hand to steady it though she went skipping down the hill like the hearts which in former times had given their name to the place she was dressed much as her little sister had been the evening before only that she wore a linen kerchief and a linen cap and her dark hair was simply braided she loved to go to the pastor's and she loved to be in motion so she was very happy her light basket travelled safely on her head and nothing happened to disarrange it excepting that one end of a long wreath of scarlet roses escaped from the inner part of the basket and hung down from thence by the side of the fair cheeks of the young girl when ella entered the little street she saw no one till she came opposite the lion d'or the golden lion the house of madame camp and there she saw heister seated in the porch knitting herself a petticoat of dyed wool in long stripes of various colours with needles longer than her arm hester liked knitting it is the most convenient work for one who loves talking the fingers may go whilst the tongue is most busy ella would have gone on without noticing madame camp but heister had no mind that she should good evening ella stolberg she cried whither away in such haste but i know to madame eversil's can't you stop a minute i have a word to say to you ella stopped though not willingly you look very bright and fair this evening ella said the cunning woman and that garland hanging from your basket would be an ornament to saint flora herself whose fancy was that my dear girl but it is a shame ella that such a girl as you should be employed in getting up other people's linen you above all when there is no manner of necessity for it i am much mistaken she added with a cunning look if there are not more goldfish in your father's net than ever found their way into mine ella was a little startled at this speech and felt herself getting redder than she wished she suddenly caught at her basket brought it down from her head and said what garland does it you mean neighbour and she busied herself in arranging the flowers again well but the fish ella the silver and golden fish in the net said heister what have you to say about them ella placed the basket on her head and she replied gaily if there are gold and silver fish in plenty in the hartsburg lakes neighbour it is but fair that they should sometimes be caught in nets fishes have no reason to guide them from danger they are easily in nets i must not then take example from them else i shall too some day perhaps be caught jacques lays many a snare on nets for the birds of the mountains she added as if to turn the conversation 
and once margaret found a young one caught but she cried so bitterly about it that we took it home and nursed it till it got well did you ever see our starling neighbour a pretty turn-off said heister but you know that i mean the gold and silver fish to be louis d'or and franks ella has not your father now girl got more of these than he ever had in his life before i know this replied ella calmly that i do firmly believe that my father never was so short of money as he is now and this reminds me i must not linger as i promised madame eversil a portion of her linen to-day so good evening madame heister looked after ella as she walked away and muttered the saucy cunning girl but i am not deceived i can trust father st gore better than any one of those stolbergs about an hour before ella had passed the lion door a wild dark woman had come to the house to sell horn and wooden spoons heister had taken a few and in return had given her a handful of broken victuals and a cup of wine she had not carried these things away to eat and drink them but had merely gone round the corner of the house and sat herself down there in the dust she was so near that she could hear all that had passed between ella and heister above all that ella had said her father was decidedly short of money ella had hardly turned into the gate of the pastor's house when meeta appeared going along after her monique had forgotten to send by ella a pot of honey which she meant as a present to the pastor and meeta had offered to carry it saying that she would have great pleasure in the errand and would soon return with ella monique gave permission and meeta appeared opposite to the golden lion not five minutes after ella was gone a very good evening to you meeta cried heister from the porch with away in such haste stop a bit i beseech you and give a few minutes of your company to a neighbour and how are all at home on the hill i have been telling ella your cousin ella that she looked like the saint of the may but you meet up why you might be pained for our lady herself so fresh and blooming with your bright eyes and ruddy cheeks but ella tells me that things go hard with poor martin stolberg that he is short of money and i am sorry for i had hoped that he had met with some good luck lately and i fear that what i heard is not true what luck asked meeta some one told me said heister that the little one had found a purse a purse repeated meeta what is a net answered heister with gold fish in it but a purse with gold pieces inside where where cried meeta could you have heard that for grandmother was so peculiar in making us promise not to mention it heard it repeated the cunning widow why is not everything known that is done in the valley but how asked meeta yet i can guess margaret has told you i said i thought margaret would tell all about it but do tell me how came you to hear it oh there are a thousand ways of getting at the truth replied heister for if anything does happen out of the very commonest way it is not talked of in my house by those who come and go but this thing is in everybody's mouth and people don't scruple to say that there were a vast number of golden pieces in the purse some say a hundred nay nay replied meeta that is overdoing it i really don't think there are more than fifteen well returned heister i don't want to know exactly how many there are i am not curious no one troubles herself less with other people's affairs than i do but i am glad this good luck has come to martin stolberg above all others in the valley that is very kind of you replied meeta but i do not see what luck it is to him for the money is not his and he could not think of spending it it is all put by in some safe place in the house very good very right answered heister no no martin could never have such a thought but where in the world can you find a place in the house safe enough for so many pieces i should doubt whether they could count as many together even at madame eversil's so you say there are fifteen pretty meeta 
and though no doubt they take the but little house-room yet i should be sorry to keep so many in my poor little cottage for i know not where i could stow them safely i suppose neighbour monique keeps them in her blue cupboard near the kitchen stove a very good and a very safe place no doubt for them oh no cried meeta she has them in her chest above stairs and my uncle keeps the key himself and carries it about with him but what am i doing here lingering ella will have left the pastors before i reach there if i stay with you neighbour any longer so good even she added and pray don't say a word about where my uncle stolberg keeps the money or else grandmother will think i have told you and she will perhaps be angry with me and who else did tell me but yourself giddy one cried heister camp laughing it was all guess with me i promise you till you had it all out ella and jacques and even little margaret would not tell me a word about it and i really began to think that father st gore had mistaken what the little one had said till you let the cat out of the bag but you ought to make haste after ella so don't let me hinder you and she arose and went laughing into the house while meeta hastened after her cousin we cannot suppose that meeta's reflections were very pleasant for as soon as she was left to herself she felt how very imprudent she had been she tried however to comfort herself with thinking that she had done no harm for what can it signify she said to herself if heister does know the truth but she would take care not to mention at home what she had said to madame camp and in this meeta found to her cost that she could keep a secret end of section 28